officers take careful notes on the contours of the landscape over which they will be attacking on the morrow. The main thing to see is that the Turks are not there. Clearly, they have taken the view that rather than sacrifice troops by putting them in preliminary defences that will inevitably be overwhelmed, it is better to strengthen the town and bring whatever force they can to bear from on high to all those who approach on the low ground. All seems in place for a successful attack, and General Dubell estimates that, based on their best intelligence, Gaza is defended by no more than seven battalions of infantry, comprising 3,000 soldiers, supported by two Austrian howitzer batteries, a German artillery battery, and a squadron of cavalry, the whole citadel under the command of a German officer, Major Ernst Tiller. Will he be up to mustering sufficient resources to mount a strong defence of Gaza? Not on Yanelli, or mine. It is believed, General Chetwood sends out in his final communique to his senior officers of Desert Column, that Gaza is not strongly held, and it is therefore intended to push the attack with great vigour. As darkness finally falls after this restless day, the last of the troopers of Desert Column move forward to Deir el Bala, where they can get what rest they can. And hark, what is that? Music, coming this way. And men, marching. Far and near and low and louder on the roads of earth go by, dear to friends and food for powder, soldiers marching, all to die. Idris can scarcely believe his eyes or his ears, but in those minutes after the sun has set and the dusk retains that golden glow, a tune floats towards them, mixed with the ceaseless tramp of feet. This is no ancient chant, no market flute, no nothing that belongs anywhere near this part of the world. For Christ Almighty, it is, yes, a bloody brass band. Yay! It is verily written that Joshua felled the walls of Jericho with trumpets, but he certainly didn't march there in Umpa 4-4 time. Of course, there is only one race that imports the incongruous with such complete indifference to sense or custom, let alone the idea that when moving forward for a surprise attack, it might be a good idea not to play marching tunes while doing so. Yes, it is the British, the men of the 53rd and 54th Infantry Divisions, also on the move, some 30,000 soldiers in all. As one stunned by the spectacle, the desert column scrambled to the small crescent hills to view the spectacle of these brave men marching to death or glory. Bands, masses of horsemen, then infantry, brigade upon brigade, battalion upon battalion, column upon column, growing rapidly, spreading rapidly all over the plain. To the eyes of Idris and his mates, themselves blackened by the sun, wearing little more than khaki rags after months of this campaign, these fresh arrivals looked clean, shining, and altogether splendid, as if they stepped out of a painting instead of out of the desert. Their horses looked smarter than any whalers, with even their harnesses shining, glinting in the golden glow. And now come the guns, and guns, and guns, and ever more guns, Idris has seen guns before, but as opposed to their own precious little guns, well, these, why, these were guns. Such a display of power pure in such numbers makes the Australians feel like they have been fighting with bows and arrows as still more brave battalions march before their eyes. The desert column yelled down, hellos and g'days to the marching men who look like fresh-faced boys for the very good reason that they are fresh-faced boys. They talk like them too. Are there any Johnny Turks out this way? Yes, and the beggars are waiting for you too. A thick British accent answers, They won't have long to wait, chum. Good lad, yells the Australian trooper. We'll wipe them right off the map. But, truth be told, or rather whispered to yourself, as bringing up the rear of the Brits is their white canvas-topped ambulance carts, catching the very last of the sun before they too disappear and all falls quiet. It is the desert column that feels as if it is wiped off the map at the moment. Idris speaks what he knows the others are thinking. What of the desert column? Are we to lose our individuality in this bigger army? Just a day ago... 
They were formidable. Now they feel an asterisk forming above their names. There is grim regret in the thought, for we are the Desert Column. They are, and they will be underway themselves shortly. Idris writes rapidly in his diary, packing up his impressions as soon as they are recorded. And as he closes it, he thinks, will I ever write in the old diary again? Who knows? If he does not, the past is recorded. Somebody may read it someday. For now, the Desert Column troopers snatch what little sleep they can as they lie secreted in wadis, palm groves and orchards around Deir el Bala, before being roused at 2.30am with a nudge and a grunt. In short order, the men are eating cold grub for breakfast. Today, they will be travelling light, carrying supplies for just 24 hours, moving fast and attacking mercilessly to conquer Gaza in that time and help themselves to the town's water and supplies. If they cannot crack the town's defences by then, there will be no alternative but to retreat all the way back here to Deir el Bala, which will be their nearest source of water. The horses whinny lightly in the moonlight. Troopers mount their horses and form up by squadron. Soldiers form up companies and broadly together they all begin to move. They head off silently in the night, at least in the sense that no one is talking. It is a little harder to order a squeaking mass of artillery to keep it down as an entire army crosses the sands. Major General Hodgson's Imperial Mounted Division will depart 30 minutes behind the Australian and New Zealand Mounted Division, all of them heading for the Umjara crossing of the Wadi Gaza just over four miles away. In the silence, so many small sounds grow great, as Ion Idris notes, the murmuring of thousands of hooves, the snort as a horse blew dust from its nostrils, the jangle as a packhorse shook itself, the straining of an ambulance team, the rumble of guns, the whisper of thousands of feet. As it happens, the desert column, together with all the British divisions, find themselves in a fog so dense that progress can be at best stop-start but mostly stop. This fog of war is no metaphor. It is real, and it would do justice to a December morning in London. With just one step forward, your horse's muzzle hits the rump of the horse in front and stops. Meanwhile, the muzzle of the horse behind you hits the rump of your horse. Rinse and repeat. There is no talking, which is fine, and no smoking, which is hell. Dare you risk a puff or two and trust in the fog to hide your light? No, you don't, for it is so strangely quiet now, the hooves muffled, the men quiet as the graves they dread filling, that striking a match would sound like a shell bursting. The silence is no ordinary absence of noise. It is the expectancy of a volley, the feeling of unseen life all dense around us everywhere. Where the hell are they? Somewhere. The horses step into the night, and all the riders can do is lean back in the saddle as they pitch downwards in the dark, daring ravines so precipitous that they never could have faced them in daylight. The night acts as a giant blinker for the horses. The riders are the ones who tremble with fear. The men hold their breath. The horses snort and stop. At the head of the column, the two lead horses refuse to budge a step further. Now what do they know that we don't? Their riders leap off and tread carefully, mind, just ahead, and find their feet stepping on the edge of a bloody precipice, dropping sheer into the Wadi Gaza. Right, so not that way then. Apart from this, those divining directions do a divine job. They seem to split the passage between Gaza and Beersheba perfectly the fog acting as their cover, even as the compass is their guide. The fog defeats the sunrise. They sense white light, then see it, but the morning cannot make its way through the atmosphere to their eyes. The fog is still so thick that you only have to lean back and you can't see your horse's ears twitching. Mercifully, the scouts out the front have been issued with luminescent prismatic compasses, which help keep them on track regardless. Off in the distance to the southwest, they can at least hear that the British artillery barrage on Gaza has begun, 
as some 80 field guns rained down shells, hopefully on the enemy's trench system on the southeast side, together with Ali Munta. Though there will be no way of knowing, as the fog will be preventing the artillery observers from assessing accuracy and damage. The troopers of the 2nd Australian Light Horse Brigade keep moving, carefully, until finally at 6am the fog lifts and here they are. The light brings location and history rushing at once to the desert column, for this ancient desert now has many features. Naked hills, plunging valleys and the shining green of the plain of the Philistines an aptly named stomping ground for perhaps some of the Australians who view learning with suspicion unless it involves women, horses or liquor. To the left of them, they can see the dark hills of Gaza, trees hidden between roofs, a city waiting, as it has for so many centuries, to defy brazen intruders. The town itself is beaten in beauty by the villages that surround it, themselves encircled by lemon and olive groves, almond groves, fig plantations and beautiful trees that keep trying to trick you into thinking you are back in Australia. Alas, now that they can see, they can also be seen, and the stutter of Turkish guns begins, with even the odd shell landing within Kui. With more reason than ever to press on, Brigadier Granville Ryrie and the 2nd Light Horse Brigade, with the rest of the Anzac Mounted Division coming behind, are now in open country, so they sweep across the land in a wide front, quickly quelling every Turkish outpost they come across with their overwhelming numbers. The Turks, taken completely by surprise and only just awoken, are no chance against these wild colonial boys from the other side of the world, who no sooner see them than come charging straight at them. Yes, Chevelle must leave a few men behind to take in hand so many prisoners, but it is a small price to pay, crossing the broad, white, gaza Beersheba road soon after dawn. Granville Ryrie's men of the 2nd Brigade, in the vanguard, pause only to cut the telegraph wires with a satisfying snip and keep going. In Gaza, an alarmed Major Tiller has been in regular contact with General Kress von Kressenstein at the Turkish Desert Force HQ at Tel el-Sharia since the beginning of the barrage, as they try to determine how seriously the British are attacking and just what must be done. The answer to the former is soon obvious. This large a barrage can only precede a serious attack, and the fact that Australian troopers have been spotted moving fast east of Gaza confirms it. The key to the latter is calling in reinforcements quickly. The closest to hand is the Ottoman 53rd Division, marching to Mejdel. 13 miles northeast of Gaza, and they must immediately click. The line has gone dead. As the sun finally shines, it finds the Australian mounted forces moving fast, deep into enemy territory, and never happier. They are a long, slight, swiftly moving column, ignorant as yet whether the other mounted brigades and the infantry had succeeded in penetrating the fog, but in the excitement of the morning sport, as careless as they were ignorant. Inevitably, at the head of his troops, the old brig, Granville Ryrie, and his escort of troopers in the advance guard of the two mounted divisions, what he will describe as the post of honour, suddenly hear the roar of engines above, just as the last of the fog lifts. Taubers, two of them, and they are coming right for them. Scatter! With no ak-ak from anti-aircraft archies about, the Germans have relatively free reign to swoop low, meaning those below must flee. The key in such matters, as they have learnt, is not to present a massed target. They quickly disperse, rather in the manner of the fictional Lord Ronald, who famously flung himself from the room, flung himself upon his horse, and rode madly off in all directions. Within seconds... Ryrie's advanced guard are doing exactly that before dismounting and following his orders to fire, using their own horses for cover, are able now to bring such withering fusillades on the two swooping taubers that the planes must disengage. There is no damage done, at least not to Ryrie's advanced guard, and they press on to the next adventure. Up ahead, 
It proves to be another two German Taubers about to take off and already taxiing, while the ground crew scramble out of the way. Ryrie's men charge forth, but are too late, as the planes leave the ground just in time and quickly return to strafe the column. Mercifully, the planes take enough fire from the ground that they do not tarry. Onwards. And yet... And yet the thing that strikes all of the Australians of the mounted divisions as they continue to skirt Gaza to the east is, where are the British infantry? Surely they have not been lost in the fog. Surely by now we should hear the sound of the infantry battling their way towards us. But there is nothing beyond the distant, haunting sound of Turkish bugles carried in the mist, a sign that the enemy's defences at least are active and men are being moved into position. Whatever the British infantry is doing, it is neither sending fire nor drawing fire, meaning the Turkish snipers in the high citadel of Gaza above the fog can devote their attention to us of the desert column alone. For as we continue to flank, Gaza begins to be flanked by horsemen, each looking for the point the Turkish garrison will spill out from. But the enemy is not to be seen in number, The silence is eerie, only broken by the occasional crack, plip-plop, from one of the snipers, yet to be rounded up or dispatched by a bullet themselves. Well, time to break the silence then, with the guns they have, and add a bang to the whimpers. Idris records the strange symphony unfolding. Crack, 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 rat-tat-tat. Turkish troops, indeed, start running. But they are isolated men in an outpost. Seeing the galloping troops coming towards them, they have tried to make it back to base, only to become prisoners in a moment. Usually, capturing prisoners has a finality to it, but here and now it seems like a temporary gesture. The wave of battle could flow and free these men in minutes. Like a dog chasing an army truck, the desert column have caught a town and have no idea what to do with it. They gaze up at the odd square houses built into the hills, roofs jutting out in jumbles, and there, just above them, is a minaret. Beautiful, like something from a fairy tale, or rather the Arabian Nights. I bet the Turkish artillery observation officers will be up there jokes one Australian, only for the jest to suddenly turn deadly. For that's exactly where they are, and now is exactly what they have been waiting for. From a distance comes the familiar sound of rolling thunder, a boom that soon engulfs the men, followed by the wailing whine of an approaching shell, which now explodes, screaming into fragments as red earth springs up around them and red blood falls to the earth. Where will the next land? There, black smoke and earth right before the column. Ian Idris finds himself shivering in fear. You can act as brave as you like, and you will, but your body knows, the hairs on the back of your neck know, and the truth is that a cold sweat breaks out in the heat of the battle every time. Damn it, you'd think you'd get used to it, but you never do. Being under fire remains bloody disconcerting, They tend to leave that bit out when writing accounts of glory, the fact that fear still envelops you even as your training kicks in. Your primal instincts accompany the ones the army has taught you, and they won't go away. Of course, there are always the lucky buggers who seem to treat the whole thing as a walk in the park, and the old brig is one of them. Ryrie puffs on his pipe as the artillery flies before turning to the troops and taking a break from his smoko to call them on with the pipe itself. Follow the direction of the smoke, boys. Right now in formation. What the hell has happened to the infantry? And they ride across the plain towards the guns. Ryrie leads the pack and the whistling of a shell turns into a crash and the old brig vanishes into earth and smoke. Idris's mate, Mori, is the one who gives voice to it. By Christ, it's got the old brig. And this one doesn't look like it might have got him where the chicken got the axe, either, but has more likely completely blown him apart. Yet, stunningly, once the smoke clears, they can clearly see smoke still coming from Ryrie's pipe. 
That bugger has the luck of the gods as well as their nerve. Even Ryrie's horse, Plain Bill, is entirely unruffled and charges ahead once more. Talk about leading by example. Ryrie's example is a trotting miracle, but it is bloody inspiring. Come on, boys, into it, after it. This is, and no mistake, as Ryrie will write to his wife, a big affair. I mustn't say how many of our troops were employed, but about four or five times as many as there are sheep in Michelago. Let any German interceptors of this letter try and break that code. It will surely put them to sleep. For their part, the 6th Australian Light Horse Regiment heads off to block any Turkish reinforcements who might head down the Jaffa Gaza Road, while the 7th and the 5th ride with Idris and his section in the thick, turning in behind Gaza. On they go, hell for leather, at the sight of Turkish troops in the distance, but the closer they get, the more curious the sight. For it is a cavalcade, not a company of the enemy that awaits. Two curious carriages, not even that, two funny little coaches that might have come out of Queen Anne's reign. There was a bodyguard of Arab cavalry, all done up like wedding cakes. What on earth have we here? Lieutenant Colonel MacArthur Onslow, the commanding officer of the 7th Light Horse, wounded at Romani but now well settled back at his post, is stunned to discover the answer. It is a ceremonial arrival of a Turkish divisional commander with his senior officers, servants and bodyguards. But let's not stand on ceremony. The commander becomes prisoner before he even enters his city. His bodyguards fire no weapons at all, surrounded by snorting horses and serene Australians, trying not to giggle at the absurdity of this seeming fancy dress procession in the middle of the desert. The Australians are mightily amused, the Turks terrified. For, oh yes, the Germans have told them many stories of the wicked cruelty these strange beings from the other side of the world are notorious for visiting upon their prisoners. Perhaps some Turkish delight might allay their savagery. For it is surely with this in mind that, with some ceremony, the Turkish general theatrically produces a glistening gold cigarette case and noblesse oblige, offers elegant and tailor-made cigarettes to these mounted barbarians. Not to be outdone, and with similar theatricality, albeit of more rustic bent, a trooper from New South Wales takes the proffered fag before digging deep into his own dungarees and hauling up half a bedraggled fag from his own pocket, which he reverently offers to the fuming general as his mates fall about laughing. The Turkish general does not join in, appalled at their discourtesy, and the punctured popinjay glowers in his storybook carriage as his captors laugh all the harder. Oh, good, they'll never believe this at home. It is with that in mind that several brownie box cameras come out. The Kaiser Bill moustache of the captured general twitches in fury as, this will teach the Australians, he turns his head to spoil the snap. At least the general's bodyguards are more obliging and with amazing poise, pose with due solemnity. But the Turkish general is not done and is quick to make the first of what will be many forceful requests to Brigadier General Granville Ryrie. I demand at least some of them should be shot, he says. Unfortunately, Ryrie cannot keep a straight face. It was damned funny, though, wasn't it, he offers. No! Clearly, the Turkish general makes a mental note of the old brig's name to be added to the list of those to be put up against the wall when this war is won. The general and his entourage are taken back behind British lines, with the infuriated Turkish general being seen to stride on behind his carriage, twirling his walking stick, twisting his moustache furiously and frowning very hard while Brigadier Ryrie, Lieutenant Colonel MacArthur Onslow and their troopers keep moving as the vanguard of the Australian light horse, which is pressing behind them. Pausing only here and there to water their horses from the farm wells that abound all around Gaza, as do pools and puddles found in deep wadis, Chevelle's men of the Australian and New Zealand Mounted Division are soon in position northeast of the city. Cable, helio and wireless communications are speedily set up so Chevelle can command his forces. Meanwhile, Ryrie's 2nd Light Horse Brigade 
pushes further on and is soon positioned northwest of Gaza, with those on the extremes able to see the Mediterranean. The Imperial Mounted Division under General Hodgson, an efficient, steely British officer of great experience who finds a way to get things done, has likewise crossed the Wadi Gaza and is now positioned east of Gaza, with the Imperial Camel Corps Brigade blocking the road and railway line that runs southeast from Gaza to Beersheba. Gaza is surrounded and sealed off. It is now for the British infantry to penetrate the perimeter and overwhelm the defenders. Trouble? Yes, trouble. 16 miles northeast of Gaza, Colonel Kress von Kressenstein at Tel El Sharia, the mound of the drinking place, has just received an alarming report dropped from one of the reconnaissance pilots of the Deutsche Luftstreitkräfte. The clearing fog has revealed that two divisions of British infantry are closing in on Gaza from the south, while some three cavalry divisions had broken through the line between Gaza and Tel El Sharia. Kress von Kressenstein's eyes flash with anger, his monocle magnifying that spectacle to his watching staff as he lifts the telephone line to the highest-ranking German officer in Gaza, Major Ernst Tiller, only to remember the line is dead. Raising Tiller on the wireless, at least, the report is confirmed. There are now formidable forces arrayed against Gaza in the south, east and northeast. Kress von Kressenstein rises. Major Tiller is ordered to hold Gaza, whatever might happen, to the last man. The tension is thick and getting thicker. Just after 9am, General Chetwood receives a report that a large cloud of dust has been seen on the road from Beersheba to Tel al-Sharia, heading towards Gaza, prompting a message to be urgently dispatched to General Dallas. The General Officer Commanding wishes me to press on you the extreme importance of the capture of Gaza before reinforcements can reach it. Heavy clouds of dust on road from Sharia. Alas, there is no reply. Again, a message is sent, with Chetwood insisting that you, General Dallas, must push your attack vigorously. Alas, for some reason not understood, they cannot raise General Dallas, the only explanation being his HQ can have no staff officers in it. All around there is confusion, and it will take some time for an explanation to emerge that, after severe delays to their allotted schedule caused by the heavy fog, Dallas, with his senior staff, have gone forward to the HQs of one of the 53rd's brigades, leaving his divisional HQ abandoned. It is with some fury thus that at 11.30am, and with the 53rd Division still not moving, that Chetwood sends a new cable to Dallas. No message from you for two hours. When are you going to begin your attack? Time is of vital importance. No general staff officer at your headquarters for two hours. It is unconscionable. Already the 53rd Division is five hours behind schedule, meaning that the entire plan to take Gaza is badly thrown out. Who and what can save the day before the end of the day? It is obvious. Chevelle can take command of the forces positioned to the north and east of Gaza and look to launch a successful attack from there, even if the trenches to the south have not been quelled by the 53rd. Orders are issued at 12 o'clock by General Chetwood for the two mounted divisions, the Australian and New Zealand Mounted Division and the Imperial Mounted Division, to reconnoitre immediately with a view to closing in on the enemy at Gaza to assist the infantry if ordered. In the meantime, Dallas's men of the 53rd Division have at last launched their attack and are now going in hard and doing it tough. With little artillery cover, the Welshman must struggle in searing sunlight over soft sands against an entrenched enemy who are firing artillery, rifles and machine guns at them from on high, much of it direct from Ali Munta. Somehow, extraordinarily, they do not falter as they approach. The Australians and New Zealanders of the mounted regiments watch with a mixture of awe and horror as for the first time they see the approach of the British forces in an open action like this. 
On the one hand, it is inspiring to see the discipline they display, how they keep on in serried ranks, little toy men, plodding in waves towards the grim fortress, suffering under its machine guns, and keep going no matter how the fusillades of bullets and shells landing among them regularly knock out dozens at a time. If only they had moved sooner, the fog would have provided a wonderful blanket of cover. The little Tommies went at it bravely, one Australian trooper will recount, and for hours fought in perfectly open country. It looked and sounded very dinkum. But on the other hand, it seems like madness. Surely there is a better way than this military practice, with its roots in a time when massed cannon could not fire from miles away. What is wrong with their officers that they so insist? Still, the Brits keep coming for another two miles. By the time Dallas throws in the last of his reserves, it is obvious to both Debell and Chetwood, now installed in the advanced HQ of Desert Column and Eastern Force at Inserat on the Deir el Bala side of the Gaza, that the 52nd, 53rd and 54th Infantry have little chance of accomplishing the task set them. It leaves them with just one option left, to get Gaza before nightfall. It is 3 p.m., and General Chevelle must be raised on the cable phone and... And what now? Really? Must he be petitioned right now by a Turkish general as short in stature as he is of fuse, insisting, despite being a prisoner, that Chevelle personally escort him back to HQ as his Australian troopers, who are meant to be simply guarding him, keep wanting to take his photograph and have photos taken with him inside his fancy carriage? The Turkish general had declined, whereupon his captors simply replied, Oh, go on, be a sport, general. General Chevelle musters as much sympathy as he can, but insists that he is too busy to do as requested at the moment, what with the war and all, and this ongoing battle, but wishes him well. The only thing Chevelle can give him is a wan smile, which infuriates the Turkish general even more. Taking his hat, his medals, and his umbrage, while leaving only his carriage and his dignity, the Turk departs in a huff. Only a few minutes later, Chevelle is handed a second urgent message from the Commander-in-Chief of Desert Column, General Chetwood, now confirming what had only previously been raised as an option. The success of the operation at Gaza depends largely on the vigour of your attack. It is imperative that the position should be ours before dark. At their HQ at Inserat, just eight miles south from Gaza, the generals, de Bell and Chetwood, remain desperately worried. The day is ebbing. It seems obvious that with the five hours lost by 53rd Division, the whole attack has been thrown out of kilter, which means the likelihood of enemy reinforcements arriving to turn the whole tide of the battle is greater than ever. It has taken two hours, but General Chevelle now knows that all is in order and so can give a key order of his own. Advance. Astride their horses, the men of the 2nd Light Horse Brigade begin to close on Gaza, with MacArthur Onslow's 7th Regiment in the lead, while to their left, the New Zealand Mounted Rifles Brigade equally start to advance, approaching the city from the northeast and east. What both the Australians and the Kiwis see as they get closer to the ramparts of Gaza is curious. They are not just cactus hedges, which they know about, but gargantuan ones. Just how to get through them is not immediately obvious, and making matters worse, those few Turks still holding out atop Ali Monta are also firing down upon them, causing carnage. Suddenly, their world is one of shattering shells and scything bullets as the great plain before the cactus becomes soaked in blood, even as clouds of smoke drift across and survivors drive their horses forward. Screams of agony compete for dominance with the sounds of battle, barked orders and war cries. They must break through this natural barrier. I'd rather, one trooper will note, face barbed wire. Jumping off their horses, the troopers start slashing a way through, teaching those bloody cactuses a lesson they will never forget, all while the Turks take more potshots, as from tiny holes were squirting rifle puffs 
In other places, the pair was spitting at us as the Turks, standing behind, simply fired through the juicy leaves. Upon penetrating to the other side, Idris finds the Turks waiting for him, six Turks to be precise. They look at him, he looks at them, and then he springs and thrusts his bayonet through flesh instead of plant, and a howl yowls like a siren to begin this next stage of battle, close, mad, and brutal. The grunting breaths, the gritting teeth, and the staring eyes of the lunging Turk, the sobbing scream as a bayonet ripped home. The fight is a frenzy. The Turks shocked by the ferocity of their foe, the Australians just as surprised to see so many bodies fall. Idris cannot believe it. They are supposed to be the underdogs. Amateur soldiers we are supposed to be, but by heavens, I saw the finest soldiers of Turkey go down that day. Brigadier Granville Ryrie agrees and will write to his wife, I never saw anything like it. We had to attack through a perfect maze of narrow lanes and high cactus hedges. I saw our men and Turks firing at each other through the cactus not more than six feet apart, and some of our fellows were shooting off their horses, like shooting rabbits. They said they could see them better from up there. Then they charged the Turks with the bayonet and killed a great many. For those troopers who remain on their horses and are getting among the Turkish infantry, it is a revelation. Horses are better than foot soldiers because we galloped right into them and within a few short minutes the individual Turk was terrified, fighting for his life against our steel, and he went down paralysed with horror at the madness of our rushes. Even their biggest men were like schoolboys against us when we got amongst them. In all of the murderous mayhem, now that the Australians and New Zealanders are through, there is little mercy. Man after man tore through the cactus. It was just berserk slaughter. The Turkish battalion simply melted away. It was all over in minutes. Victory isn't here yet, but it looks like Gaza soon will be. It's just a question of time. The day is theirs. Will the town follow before evening falls? It will if the Canterbury Mounted Rifles Regiment can keep up their terrific pace, racing along the ridge from the northeast, attacking Ali Munta. The Turkish citadel has not yet fallen to those marvellous Kiwis, but at the very least the Turkish regiment atop it have their hands full just defending their own position and can no longer bring withering fire upon all and sundry attacking Gaza. And help is coming from above, not the Lord, but better. It is the men of the number one squadron Australian Flying Corps, and if one pilot is calling in artillery with particular intensity, it is because only he knows their agony. Flying officer, observer Ross Smith, who had served with the 3rd Light Horse Regiment at the Battle of Romani, calls in gun after gun on those doing so much to hurt his own, dropping smoke bombs on the Turks so the British artillery can know exactly where the brutes are. I got a 60-pounder battery onto a big lot of Turks, he will recount. It seemed very inhuman to be shelling men who must be half mad with thirst, but I soon got over those sentiments when I looked around and saw our own men laying dead up towards Gaza. Flight is a modern miracle, but to be able to see so many of your comrades dying at the same time with crystal clarity from the sky, that is a fresh horror. In full attack now, Chevelle's forces continue to outdo themselves, just being within Kui of Gaza, with its towers and minarets and white houses showing clear on the hill above the dark plantations, seemed, after the wilderness of Sinai and the hovels of the coastal villages from El Arish to Deir el-Bala, a civilised place greatly worth winning, energises them. And now... Even as the night comes falling from the sky with stunning rapidity, as it is wont to do in these latitudes, Chevelle's men are indeed able to penetrate the perimeter of Gaza en masse and are soon running down the cobbled streets searching for any still willing Turkish defenders to take on. Gaza proves to be still full of snipers, hiding in houses with rifles at the ready. No, make that machine guns at the ready. One house down the street blazes forth with fire so rapid the sound ricochets into itself as the bullets stream. Extraordinarily, that chattering cacophony 
is soon outdone by the sound of a big gun firing. A Turkish one. Of course, for the resourceful Kiwis have captured a Turkish gun, so why not use it? All you have to do is swing the big bug around and to the amazement of the Turkish snipers in their houses, they can see the gun that defended their city an hour ago now turned round for a close-up attack. But they won't be able to aim it precisely, surely. It's not set in position. The NZs have that worked out too. On the reckoning that there is no problem so great that enough elbow grease and fencing wire can't fix it in the short term, An obliging corporal swings open the breech lock, sticks his head in the massive barrel and looks down it. He'll yell for them to stop when he sees the sniper's house. So the gun is now pushed slowly round and stop, he sees it. Out pops his head, in pops a shell. The Kiwis muck about with the mechanism and bang, crash. The gun discharges its shell and leaps into the air. The men firing it are flung on the corpses of the Turkish soldiers who must have manned it when they were breathing. They are stunned, but look up and see with delight that the shell has gone straight through the sniper's house. And now out come the snipers. One, two, three, four, twenty-eight. Twenty-eight men were hiding in that one bloody house. Maybe it wasn't a machine gun. Maybe they were all firing rifles together. The Australians roar with laughter and relief. The battle continues. There is a trench just 200 yards away blazing at them. But they are in the town, and even as the sun is setting, a yell is heard and passed on with a shout. The Tommies have taken Ali Munta! Hurrah! Hurrah! It is not a rumour. It is a fact, even though there is more to it than that shout. The Canterbury Regiment has linked up with the British soldiers of the 53rd Infantry Division and finally have control of Ali Munta, even while those trenches to the south of Gaza have been fully taken over, also by the soldiers of the 53rd Division. In the town proper, the Kiwis of the Wellington Regiment of the New Zealand Mounted Rifles Brigade and the troopers of Australia's 2nd Light Horse Brigade have been able to link up and are now taking control of the northern section of the ancient city. Some of the New Zealanders are stunned to see some local markets have instantly sprung back to life, sensing new customers and new currency. From his HQ inside the most robust part of Gaza, the frantic German commander, Major Ernst Tiller, even while fearing a knock on the door from the enemy, gets a desperate message through to General Kress von Kressenstein, reporting that the British forces had entered Gaza by N and E, and situation very bad. Chevelle, meanwhile, is preparing to move his HQ into the town proper to begin preparing it for a likely Turkish counterattack, as they will surely try in short order. And yet... Now the stunning development as Chevelle is advised that General de Bell is at the other end of the hastily placed field phone line. Yes, General de Bell. Withdraw. Get your men out of Gaza. But we have Gaza, protests Chevelle. Yes, but the Turkish are all over you. De Bell replies, insisting that just before 5pm there had been reports of 3,000 Turkish infantry and two squadrons of cavalry moving southwest towards Gaza from Huj, while another 7,000 had been reported on the march coming from Herrera. So there are 10,000 Turks coming for you right now. No, they aren't. We can see these reinforcements, regiments hovering in the far distance, conspicuously not moving towards us. The only thing they reinforce is the impression that the British commanders do not know what the hell they are talking about. Why, a cloud of dust previously seen on the Tel El Sharia road, which had caused alarm, had proved to be a small convoy of wagons fleeing Gaza. Perhaps de Bell and Murray know something that Chevelle does not. But on the facts, as they are presented, the order is insane. Nevertheless, orders they are and must be followed, even when coming from an absurd distance away by a general who has no real idea of what the situation on the ground is. With disgust, 
Chevelle passes the order down the line to his own men. Owing to the lateness of the hour and the strength and position of the enemy forces pressing in from the north and east and the difficulty of continuing the attack in the dark in the town of Gaza, the GOC Desert Column has decided to withdraw the mounted troops. They must get out of Gaza and immediately head back to their starting point of that morning at Der El Bala. The news is not well received. For inside Gaza, at around 20 past six, as the shadows are rapidly lengthening and ever more Turks are being dispatched to the world of eternal darkness, a messenger arrives with the extraordinary order. As soon as it is dark, break off the action and retire. Both Brigadier General Granville Ryrie and his Kiwi counterpart, Major General Edward Chater, commanding the EDZ Mounted Rifles Brigade, are stunned. How could General de Bell possibly want them to give up what has been so hard won? Gaza is ours. We have taken just about no casualties, are about to strike a dagger into the heart of an enemy who is wilting before ours, and you want us to pull back? We have stormed his citadel. We have him at our mercy. Jacko is about to surrender, and General de Bell wants us to... What? Withdraw your brigade at once. Concentrate at present, DHQ. In the name of God, for what reason? Bar treason. How can such an order be given out of the blue, with no previous warnings of even that possibility being on the horizon? The only explanation can be that the order has come from those too far removed from the action to know what is going on. Well, it is not good enough. For the moment, Major General Edward Chater refuses to follow the order until it comes in writing. Brigadier General Granville Ryrie refuses to follow any order, even written, at least, until all of his wounded men have been gathered up and evacuated. Not a man, he orders grimly, is to be left behind. As it happens, it is while word of the withdrawal is spreading that the news of the greatest breakthrough of all gets through. It has been confirmed that Ali Munta has finally fallen to the joint attacks of the 53rd Division and the Kiwis of the New Zealand Mounted Rifles. Unbeknown to Dallas and Chetwood, the day has now been won at the end of the day. Chevelle's men of the 2nd Light Horse Brigade and the New Zealand Brigade are flooding into Gaza from the north and the east, even while the 53rd has subdued all of the trenches to the south and southwest. With the confirmed fall of Ali Munta, it can only be a matter of time before the remaining Turkish garrison in Gaza also falls, likely by dawn at the latest. The order is not changed. Withdraw, retire, get out of Gaza. For his part, Ion Idris is standing in the streets of Gaza with hundreds of other troops. Their state? It is utter amazement. Confirm the order yells officer after officer to the signallers, so stunned they are nearly sure it must be the work of spies. It can't be true, but the voice of each signaller rings out in turn. Retire, retire, retire. That order is soon repeated to all and sundry among those besieging Gaza, from brigade to regiment and on to the distant squadrons and troops. We are out. Withdraw and so withdraw they do, completely gutted that right within the jaws of victory, defeat had been imposed upon them. Bastards! The worst of it is, they are not remotely ready to retreat. The New Zealanders rustle up some spare horses, and the men ride back in scattered separation, searching for regiments that had already relaxed into victory, and now yell for each other as the evening falls, a quarter moon providing the light for a full retreat. Idris finds himself in the middle of an impromptu meeting of the NZs and the officers of MacArthur Onslow's 7th Regiment, whose horses are five miles away to the north. Everyone was mad. No, make that furious. An oath is sworn by the officers. If we can't find the horses, we shall collect together and march straight back into town with the bayonet. They could bloody do it too, but the horses are found and the mutinous oath disappears into discretion and other oaths surface about the bloody officers. 
We just could not understand what the big heads were doing. Making a big mistake, all are agreed on that. Brigadier General Granville Ryrie will dwell on the outrage for many moons to come. When we got the order to pull out, he will say, the town was undoubtedly ours. The New Zealanders held ground from which they dominate the whole position, and my men were actually in Gaza. The claim of 10,000 reinforcements being on their way is ridiculous. Where? The Turkish prisoners inside Gaza clearly do not think they are about to be liberated. Indeed, in a black irony, some attempt to escape from Gaza and are shot running across a graveyard, falling among the tombstones in what will prove to be convenient to grave diggers. Yes, late in the day, certain planes and patrols had indeed reported some enemy movement towards the town, including cavalry and columns of soldiers. But if they were going to abandon the town at the first sign of such movement, why attempt to take the town in the first place? The lions slink out, thanks to a command by donkeys. They have no choice. They are ropeable with fury as they make their ridiculous retreat. The march back of the mounted brigades from Gaza, Henry Gullett will chronicle, was one of the sorriest movements undertaken by Australians and New Zealanders during the war. And not just them. The British soldiers, too, are incandescent with rage, none more than those who must descend from Ali Munta, carefully wending their way through the bloody corpses of comrades who have given their lives to take it. Collectively, they have suffered almost 4,000 casualties, advancing into the teeth of the storm, and just as their forward elements had finally entered the Gaza Plaza proper, they had been pulled out. Among Chevelle's men, the mood collective is a curious cross between rage and sheer exhaustion. Most of them are in their third night without sleep, and so ludicrous do they still regard the order to withdraw that no precautions are taken against a Turkish counterattack. The troopers smoke pipes and cigarettes, talk lightly and swear even as many keep a gimlet eye on dead mates carefully carried on limbers, two-wheeled carts, now being pulled along by their riderless horses, a rough equivalent of knights being carried back on their shields. In the distance, they can hear the unearthly, blood-curdling screams coming from hyenas who have slunk in from the hills to feed on what is no doubt a rich feast of fresh cadavers. At least, it helps keep some of them awake. As we groped our way back, said one of the squadron leaders, All ranks were almost comatose from exhaustion. Not to mention disgust, for make no mistake, there was not a single private in the British infantry or a trooper in the mounted brigades who did not believe the failure was due to staff bungling and nothing else. In fact, there is at least some resentment from those being forced to retreat that the Welsh and English infantry had not been up to the mark. General opinion... One light horse trooper will write in his diary, if a division of Scotties had attacked with the Australians, Gaza would have fallen. Mostly, however, the rage is aimed at those who have given the order. After all, if they are withdrawing because of the imminent arrival of Turkish reinforcement, where are the brutes? The Imperial Mounted Division have been assigned the task of providing a rear guard to allow the others to get away, but barely fire a shot in anger. With Hellfire Jack Royston's 3rd Brigade acting as rear guard, the light horse moved back to Der El Bala, neath stars like chilled steel, where dozens of Turkish prisoners have been taken, most of them straggling bedraggled to their fate, but not all. Some, of course, take advantage of the darkness to slip away in the night. This is frustrating to Trooper James Tatum of the 7th Australian Light Horse Regiment, but as an Australian drover of the old school, he finds a solution. Given that he is responsible for 30 Turks and two of the brutes have scarpered, he knows there is only one way to make up his mob and prevent a court-martial. There, two passing Bedouins are obliged at gunpoint to join the Turkish prisoners. It can be sorted out later, but the main thing is he will be handing over a full tally. At Eastern Force HQ, late on the night, even General de Bell realises his error as two communications from the enemy are intercepted. 
One is from Chris von Kressenstein to his fellow German officer, Major Tiller, sent hours before and looking for a way of saving Gaza. Having regard to the disposition of Turkish troops and leaders, can a relieving counterattack be successful at early dawn? I beg you to do your utmost to hold out so long. Clearly, the German is aware that the Turks are completely on their last legs, and that much is confirmed shortly afterwards with the reply from Major Tiller. Your telegram received. Please attack at all costs at two o'clock tonight. Major Tiller had also reported the loss of Ali Muntar. Position lost at 7.45pm. These are not the communications of a force about to trap the forces of the British Empire. They are of a beaten force, desperately trying to find a way to survive the night, only for, extraordinarily, those attacking forces to leave of their own accord. Things had got so bad that the GHQs at Gaza and Sharia had actually exchanged farewell messages and arrangements were made to destroy all papers and blow up the headquarters. And so who is that man in the hours before dawn, firing off orders with a fervour only to be equalled by the glumness with which he is soon reading reports back from the front lines? It is, of course, General de Bell desperately trying to undo his egregious error by commanding General Dallas to send his infantry forward once more. But it is too late. Not only have the Turks fully taken back Gaza overnight and Ali Munta, but the British soldiers are exhausted with their munitions dangerously depleted. They can barely defend themselves if the Turks counterattack, let alone go again. And anyway, what is the point when even if they take Gaza at huge cost of life, there is just as likely to be an order coming to withdraw once more. The full failure and folly dawns with the dawn, when Major Tiller realises, shortly after he has burned all his papers and prepared to surrender, how the British have simply abandoned the field, even while victory was theirs, he positively roars with laughter. Chevelle's men are shattered with exhaustion. A trooper, fast asleep, will lose his position in the column, falling back or going forward as he sways uncertainly, only for one of his mates to reach out and jerk him awake before all is silent once more, bar the soft whinnying and occasional grunts of the horses. I think it is one of the longest nights I ever put in, Granville Ryrie records, and it was hard to keep awake, as it was the second night without sleep. I wish I could draw the funny things I used to keep seeing. The men looked to be riding huge buffaloes as big as elephants with enormous tails, Everywhere he looks as dawn breaks, there is equal exhaustion. Our eyes were like burnt holes in a blanket. Having suffered 220 casualties, with 70 good men killed for nothing, they arrive back at Deir el Bala at half past eight in the morning and tumble into their tents. Somewhere, somehow, there must be an explanation for this, and someone held accountable. De Bell and Chetwood write hasty reports which reach the same delusion. The outraged troops had been told to get out of Gaza because of the threat of impending reinforcements. But now, incredibly, the true culprit is revealed. It was the water. At 6.10pm, writes Chetwood, the majority of my mounted troops, having been unable to water their horses during the day, I, with the approval of the general officer commanding Eastern Force, instructed General Chevelle to break off the engagement and retire his divisions west of the Wadi Gaza. De Bell says very nearly the exact same thing. Very few of the horses had been watered during the day, and it was necessary to withdraw the mounted divisions for this reason. This is news indeed to General Chevelle, who declares a plentiful supply of water. Why, half of the horses in the 2nd Light Horse Brigade were watered during the day. One of his troopers, Jeff Holmes, had documented the same. We found several water holes and feed was in abundance. A debacle? Not a bit of it. This action, Jebel writes in his official report to General Murray, 
has had the result of bringing the enemy to battle, and he will now undoubtedly stand with all his available force in order to fight us when we are prepared to attack. It has also given our troops an opportunity of displaying the splendid fighting qualities they possess. So far as all ranks of the troops engaged were concerned, it was a brilliant victory. Murray adds his official voice, noting in his report to Whitehall that, apart from the defeat, it actually was a morale-boosting triumph. It was a most successful operation, the fog and the waterless nature of the country just saving the enemy from complete disaster. It has filled our troops with enthusiasm and proved conclusively that the enemy has no chance against our troops in the open. The whole thing is a masterpiece of minuting a mess into a respectable retro spectacle. As to what to do now, Murray essentially takes General de Bell at his word. They will attack again with a larger force and this time crack the nut. Chetwood and Chevelle are far from sure, realising that the Turks, no fools, will improve their defences, reinforce their lines and not allow themselves to be taken by surprise again. Chevelle, particularly, is a God-fearing man who begins and ends every day in prayer. With his plan of attack, it looks like they will need God on their side, less in the moral sense than giving themselves even a chance. Nevertheless, de Bell's assurance of the easy victory to come is gratefully accepted by Murray and effectively returned in kind. The troopers themselves do not feel that way. Captain Stanley Parks of the 3rd Light Horse Field Ambulance has talked to many men wounded and furious, and he writes a very different private report for his journal. A great opportunity has been lost, and the Turks are in great strength now. It is quite evident there has been a lot of bungling. Everybody is disgusted with the display. The troopers of the Light Horse have simply lost all faith in the high brass. I've just heard that General Murray directed operations on Gaza from Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo, one writes in his diary. Some general, I don't think. And they are equally dismissive of the crowing of the local press, starting with the Egyptian Gazette, running with the page one headline, Defeat of 20,000 Turks near Gaza. When we read such lies as this, Eon Idris notes, how can we believe the news of our victories in France? But in London, the War Cabinet under Prime Minister Lloyd George and the War Office under Sir William Robertson remain unaware of the colossal nature of Murray's error and believe his sunny account that the sunny uplands of Gaza will soon be theirs. So does the British press, which glories in this near victory, something that does not pass unnoticed by the Turks and Germans. For only days after the battle, it is recorded an enemy aeroplane flies as low as it dares over the most forward mass of British forces to drop a message. You beat us at communiques, but we beat you at Gaza. In fact, the War Office is so confident that Gaza will fall on the next attack that, as Murray will recount, in a telegraphic communication dated March the 30th, I was instructed, in view of the altered situation, to make my object the defeat of the Turks south of Jerusalem and the occupation of Jerusalem. Yes, well, Gaza first. But this time, as Murray advises Whitehall, he will organise more water closer to Gaza, enough for two divisions to be fully replenished at the Wadi Gaza. With that in mind, cisterns are built and arrangements made to pump the water forward and this time he will throw in three infantry divisions and two cavalry divisions, some 60,000 men in all. Both General de Bell and General Murray are very confident, sure that this second battle will result in an easy triumph. Murray writes de Bell to offer him encouragement that already sounds like congratulations. When your next move takes place, I have every confidence it will be most successful. De Bell shares his certitude, penning his own musings to his commander about whether it will even be necessary to use gas shells. Neither the enemy's numbers nor the strength of his positions are likely to force the necessity upon me, so far as I can judge. And even if it does, they still have their secret weapon in reserve. 
Late in March, an Australian Flying Corps mechanic manages to get a close-up look at them as they move up to the front on a train. They resemble a small war vessel inside with the engines, he records in his diary, the gun turrets, portholes, etc. But don't tell anyone anything. Great secrecy observed, another records, all under cover. Less secret is the heavy artillery, 18-pounders and the massive 60-pounders being moved forward on the recently rushed railway construction, pushing ever closer to Gaza, to be dragged into position from there by roaring, straining tractors, positioned so they can blow Ali Munta into the sea. One of the veteran Australians is less convinced. That hill, he comments, reminds me very much of Achi Baba at Gallipoli. I remember Archie Bubba was to be blown into the sea many times, but it always seemed to bob up again. Chapter 7. The Second Battle of Gaza Chevelle was no hard-riding gambler against odds. He fought to win, but not at any price. He sought victory on his own terms. He always retained, even in heated moments of battle when leaders are often careless of life, a very rare concern for the lives of his men and his horses. Official historian Henry Gullett, the Australian Imperial Force in Sinai and Palestine, 1914-1918. to 1918. Boer? The boss will see you now. On this misty morning in Witten, Huntingdonshire, Alaric Boer heads to the office of the Head of Flight Training, Royal Flying Corps, Knox, enters upon invitation, and salutes. You wanted to see me, sir? Yes, Boar. You're officially gazetted as a flying officer in the Royal Flying Corps as of today. It is wonderful news. And now his mind races to just how many hours he will have to log to become a flight lieutenant, how many weeks that will take if he pushes hard, though he knows no other way, and just when he will be able to fly his own missions. As a young man... St. Augustine used to pray, O oh, Master, make me chaste and celibate, but not yet. Alaric now prays for the war to end, but not before he gets one mission in. Work harder. Daha chok chadas. The words are Turkish, but the yelled meaning is understood universally. Hurry up, you lazy sods. The Arab workers toiling this day are being barked at by Turkish soldiers who are in turn sneered at by German officers. Formerly, they are all under the orders of Jamal Pasha, but practically and particularly, they jump to the desires of Colonel Kress von Kressenstein, and he wants them to strengthen the flanks here in Gaza so that it can no longer be so easily skirted as General Chevelle and his men had done in their most recent attack. For well over a year, the mounted forces of the British Empire have been revelling in fighting in the open country, so different from the Western Front, where men are still dying in their tens of thousands, charging across no man's land at heavily armed bunkers. Very well then. General Kress von Kressenstein will deny the British such open country and build a maze of defences that would do the Western Front itself proud a wall of redoubts, bunkers and trenches with barbed wire in front built atop formidable natural defences and backed by machine guns and artillery against which the British may manoeuvre all they like. They will still be coming up against a bristling wall of whistling death. Such moves do not escape Murray, as regular reconnaissance patrols report just what the Turks are doing. Not only were the Gaza defences being daily strengthened and wired, he will recount, but a system of enemy trenches and works was being constructed southeast from Gaza to the Atawine Ridge, some 12,000 yards distant from the town. This put any encircling movement by our cavalry out of the question, unless the enemy line in front of us could be pierced and a passage made through which the mounted divisions could be pushed. If there is to be no outflanking, Murray and his senior officers must come up with a new plan, a full-on frontal attack in two parts. Of course, to do the job, he requests more troops from Whitehall. Alas, as General Murray will recount, 
No additional troops were to be sent to me, since it was considered that in view of the military situation of the enemy, my present force would suffice. Look, why would they send more? Murray's current force had been enough to get into Gaza last time, so surely with better organisation they can do the same this time. As the troopers of the Australian Light Horse move en masse closer to Gaza as a prelude to the coming battle, they take occasional rest in the native villages that abound all around in the coastal areas, allowing them to observe close up the ancient way of life. Trooper Fred Tomlins of the 1st Light Horse Regiment is one who stops with his mates to ask for water for their horses. They offered us an earthenware jar full, but when we said we wanted enough for two horses, it was a case of mafish, there is none. One of the bints was busy crushing barley into flour with the aid of two stones. This was rather interesting, so we spent some time watching the process and yarning to the old man. We gave him bakshish. Such interactions can be fascinating. Even though the conditions under which we live are the worst ever, one trooper writes home, I love it. I love Egyptians and their ways and customs. Their country is absolutely full of interest and their history is nothing less than the history of the world. I always feel terribly selfish travelling about, seeing new and bonza places, and I'm thinking of you all the time and how you'd enjoy it. But there you are, buried in dirty little North Sydney, which is about as interesting as a dead Turk. Across the shimmering desert, the Australians can see the bristling Turkish fortifications all right, and note that every now and then a single shot rings out, followed by a plume of dust as the Turks register their guns, working out the precise elevation for the distance required to put shells down at specific points where they reckon the most attackers will be massed. If there is not an identifiable feature to aim the guns at, they build cans and the like in the night. Christ almighty. The only bit of good news for the troopers of the Australian Light Horse is their new guns, as each mounted squadron is issued four Hotchkiss light machine guns to replace the single Lewis machine gun they have been making do with. Those bloody Bedouin bastards. Yes, it is hard to get by in these parts without them being involved in some fashion, as locals who have prospered here for millennia they have learnt the virtues of claiming neutrality between warring powers. But in truth, they are only neutral the way a shark is neutral when you are watching from the beach or the extreme shallows. Go out into deeper water and you'll find out soon enough just how neutral they are. This morning, this too bloody early yawning dawning morning, Eon Idris is with 14 fellow troopers of the 5th Light Horse Regiment guarding stacks of grain at an outpost when suddenly 200 bloody Bedouin attack from all sides. You take the dozen on the far right, I'll take the next dozen, Eon the next dozen, and so on. Amazingly, the Australians actually beat them back and are so elated they even pursue them into the desert only to look behind and see... Yes, 50 more bloody Bedouin taking the bloody grain. It is the oldest trick in the book. A trick the Bedouin had no doubt imbibed with their mother's milk. Bait and switch. Bastards. The British coddle the bloody Bedouin and chastise any Australian who attacks them. But the troopers know them for what they are. These people cut the throats of our wounded, Idris records. They dig up our dead, they snipe us, they steal everything they can lay their hands on, and they are the Turks' best spies. In fact, German and Turkish officers dressed in filthy Bedouin's rags are often undetected as they wander freely throughout our big camps. To add insult to injury, when they check the stacks of grain, they find they are protecting an illusion. The bloody Bedouin have carefully slit the giant stacks from the bottom, and have been stealing grain for who knows how long, as long as they can and as long as we let them. One day the light horse may be short of grain, and what then? Well, we'll ask the Bedouin to lend us some, I suppose. On the 15th of April, 1917, Murray moves his own advanced general headquarters forward to Khan Yunus, five miles from Rafa and all is in readiness for the first stage of the attack to begin in two days' time. 
It will not be easy. General Murray's intelligence department has it that there are now 8,500 Turkish and German soldiers in Gaza, with another 4,500 immediately to the east, and another 8,000 spread along the fortified line on the gaza Beersheba axis. It is double the number of soldiers they had defending Gaza in the first assault. Over 18,000 Turks alone are now ready to repel what is coming, for they know what is coming. The British and the Australians riding into a new wall of defenders. In the lead-up to the second attack on Gaza, it will be reported that General Murray first details his plans to a group of very silent, depressed generals, while the troops themselves are becoming ever more aware that they are operating under wretched leadership. All that General de Bell can do is set out the plans with more detail to his senior officers. This will indeed be a different kind of battle. If the Turks want a Western Front battle, we shall give them one, including artillery barrages and, for the first time in this theatre, poison gas, as well as our secret weapon. After the first barrage of a day, the soldiers and artillery will move forward, consolidate their positions on the second day, and on the third day, after another barrage, storm the enemy trenches and take Gaza itself. The verdict? As before. The commander of Desert Column, General Philip Chetwood, and the commander of the Anzac Mounted Division, General Chevelle, are just two of the senior officers who are far from convinced that the Dobell plan will succeed, and they are not alone. It will be reported that on the eve of the attack, one British commander finishes his briefing to his senior officers by saying, that gentleman is the plan, and I might say, frankly, that I don't think much of it. The Australians think still less, after the first Battle of Gaza, Chevelle had written to Chetwood on the strength of his men. The harder the task I gave to the mounted troops of the Desert Column, the better they carry it out, and no man could wish to command finer troops. It seems exceedingly odd that, despite their daring do in the first attack on Gaza, outmanoeuvring the Turks with their speed and skill to storm the ramparts from an unexpected direction, for this attack, they are essentially being asked to attack a defensive wall where speed and manoeuvrability will count for little. And yet, orders are orders. Nearing midnight on this eve of battle, Lieutenant Guy Hayden and his comrades of the 12th Regiment move out as part of the newly formed 4th Light Horse Brigade, making their way through ranks of the lightly cheering British troops, who wished them well on their mission to attack the redoubts further out on the Turkish fortified line. Dawn, 17th of April, 1917. Gaza. Belated tanks for the occasion. All is in readiness. Before the ramparts of Gaza, no fewer than three infantry divisions, the 52nd, 53rd and 54th, crouch on the lee side of their sand dunes, knowing what is about to come. Sure enough, right on 5.30am, a staggering array of 16 heavy guns, 92 18-pounder field guns and 24 4.5-inch howitzers open fire on the Turkish trenches defending Gaza. At the same time, in the waters just off Gaza, two Royal Navy monitors and the French coastal defence ship Requin join the cacophony of catastrophe and fire. Their artillery batteries erupt, and now pour salvo after salvo upon the foremost trenches of Gaza, the artillery batteries of Ali Muntar and other batteries in the city itself, the key railway depot and junction just north of Gaza at Beit Hanun, and the most crucial bridges that cross the wadis around it. Observers with their field glasses, one of them in a basket beneath a massive balloon launched for the occasion, are satisfied to see vast plumes of dust pouring skywards from their designated targets, even as tiny ant-like figures, Turkish soldiers rush hither and thither. So here are some more shells for a chaser, which include firing 50 rounds directly on Ali Munta. Of course, all of the shells are flying hundreds of yards over the heads of the British infantry, but they duck down reflexively anyway. 
Johnny Turk is no doubt also ducking, with the difference being that it won't help, as the shells will hopefully be landing on him. And even some that don't might kill him, as for the first time in this theatre of war, gas shells are being used. What is clearly needed is an artillery barrage for the ages, which goes for ages. In fact, the first barrage goes for just a little over two hours. There will not be a second barrage of such might, as this far from Britain's supply line of shells, it has not been possible to amass a huge amount of munitions, and they will simply have to make do. Clearly, the Turks do not suffer the same lack of supply, for the counterfire from their own batteries is more than munificent as shells rain upon the British forces. Under the withering fire, at least for the moment, De Bell holds back the huge force he has assembled, which boasts 30,000 horses, thousands of camels, motor transports, and their secret weapon, which the Turks hopefully have no idea of. Tanks. Tanks? Yes, that new invention that has created such a stir in France is now in the desert with the light horse. Well, eight of them are anyway. Each named like a ship, with perhaps a touch more casualness, i.e. Nutty, named after the tank commander, Major Nutt, Tiger, War Baby, Pincher, Sir Archibald, Sir Reginald, Ola Luk Oi, and Kiora. These murderous machines have a fame all their own. Some of the tanks are males, with six-pounder guns jutting out each side, each capable of delivering six-pound shells a distance of 4,000 yards, as well as three Lewis guns. The others are females, with no cannon, but five Lewis guns protruding from every side. Both types weigh 29 tonnes, are powered by perpetually roaring and strained Daimler Foster engines, and are 26 foot long for 13 foot wide, with steel sides. If they can just get among the Turks and up close to the redoubts, it will be carnage. But can they? General de Bell holds them in reserve for now, hopeful that the infantry attack can make serious advances without them. Anxiously, those who can keep their eyes fixed on Turkish positions hope for some sign that the gas shells now exploding on them will have some effect. No movement is observed, but does that mean the gas has worked or failed? No one knows. The only certain thing is they will have to wait until the damned gas disperses before they go in. After one last burst of ten minutes from de Bell's 18-pounders, the soldiers of the 52nd, 53rd and 54th Divisions leave their sheltered positions and move forward, leaping, running forward, ducking and zigzagging, the most modern of attacks now followed by the most ancient, hoping the defenders of Gaza have been substantially wiped out. Alas, General de Bell's judgments on the weakness of the enemy line have been greatly exaggerated, based on the recent past and not the reinforced bristling present. For the Turks have wasted no time in previous weeks preparing every defence and digging trenches so deep they risked turning into tunnels. The barrage has affected them very little, and they now present in force, bringing withering fire on their attackers. The attacking infantry are mown down like wheat before whirling scythes, by carefully placed machine guns spewing death towards them. The only hope the attackers have is for their secret weapon to be unleashed, their own previously unseen ace of spades. And now here it comes. It is one tank, Sir Archibald, the first time a tank has been engaged in this theatre, accompanying a brigade of the 54th Division out on the far right, only for shells to start landing all around. Far from protecting the soldiers as was planned, the tank seems to be a shell magnet, and many soldiers are wounded and killed by association with the thing, which is soon enough left as a smouldering ruin after a direct hit. Still, the British soldiers are so numerous that 20 of the survivors do reach their goal, the Sheikh Abbas Ridge, and start to dig in with an intensity expected in the midst of falling shells. At least they have taken most of the Turkish outposts lying to the south of Ali Munta and have secured their start lines for the main assault due in two days' time.
Before Gaza, the British troops remain dug in, surviving the best they can as the day belongs mostly to the artillery batteries of both sides exchanging salutations. Positioned some miles out on the right flank with the 12th Australian Light Horse of the 4th Light Horse Brigade, Lieutenant Guy Hayden does his best to settle midnight down, just as all the other troopers are doing with their own mounts. This far into the war, all the horses know that the sound of artillery, rifle and machine gun fire signals they will likely be in action soon. And right now there is more of that sound in the near distance than ever before. 18th of April, 1917. Gaza. The readiness is all. Both opposing forces are aware that yesterday was merely the opening stanza of this bloody saga, the softening up part. And the most important thing today for the attackers is to first dig in while also sending out careful patrols to look for any weaknesses in the enemy line. For the Turks, the day is spent bringing men and munitions forward and getting ready for what they know is to come. Lieutenant Guy Hayden and the 12th Regiment are sent up along the Wadi Gaza in a fruitless search for water, returning in the heat of the day thirstier than ever. In the night, they carefully move out to bivouac at El Mendur, on the right flank of the Gaza line. Dawn of the 19th of April finds them threading their way through artillery being moved forward just as most of the Anzac Mounted Division is doing the same, ready with the rest of the Desert Mounted Column to attack the Gaza Line. Though the dismounted troopers of the Anzac Mounted Division assigned to attack the Atawine Redoubt, eight miles east of Gaza, have little hope of actually capturing it, they will have fulfilled their task if they can but pin down the Turks so Jacko can't reinforce the main attack on Gaza. 5.30 a.m., 19th of April, 1917. Gaza. De bell tolls for thee. It is time to do or die. Just as on the first two days of the battle, de Bell's artillery unleashes at dawn, raining shells, or at least sprinkling them liberally, on the Turks defending Gaza, this time the principal target is the achingly familiar Ali Muntar. This time the barrage includes gas shells. Across most of the gaza Beersheba axis, the troops of the desert column listen keenly to the sounds of the artillery and are mostly pessimistic. We know Gaza should have fallen on the second day of this our second attack, Eon Idris writes. It hasn't. We are rather quiet. Sleepless, of course, but we wonder about our grand army. It is very sad. Instinctively, we know that it has been smashed. There has been bitter fighting all the way to Gaza, but we don't know the actual result. We have ceased to wonder what has happened to the two great surprises we had for the Turks. Each must have been a dud, else our men would have taken Gaza days ago. One of those surprises is the gas shells, and it has, surprisingly, indeed been a dud, doing little damage either to the Turks in the trenches or on the heavily fortified peak of Ali Muntar. This is not the murky western front. The gas disperses quickly in the dry heat and the desert breeze. Perhaps if they had more shells it might have made a difference, but like everything else around here, they are in short supply. And so with a whimper, not a bang, the gas shells cease. But the second surprise, the tanks? The one tank used on the first day has made no impression and been destroyed. Hopefully, their day will come, and that day is today. In the meantime, under orders from General de Bell, from dawn the troops of Desert Column range against the fortified Turkish line that stretches out from Gaza, charging forward into the storm of bullets and shrapnel. Their job is to demonstrate against the Ottoman positions, making sure that they can't move troops from there back to defend Gaza itself. Positioned some way behind a low ridge for Lieutenant Guy Hayden and the rest of the 12th Australian Light Horse, it is time to launch their own attack. With just two hours sleep the night before, then having to trek to this position, much of it right by artillery batteries preparing to unleash with their horses' reins twisted around one foot as they lie in the sand, they are as exhausted as they are resolute. 
Suddenly, their world is just one shattering roar, even as the earth trembles and enormous geysers of sand and dust, and no doubt human limbs, are hurled skywards all around the Turkish redoubts. With that amount of shelling, it is unlikely that the Turks are going to be able to bring much fire on them, and with their fellow 4th Brigade troopers of the 11th Light Horse Regiment by their side, the troopers of the 12th Light Horse now leave the safety of the Wadis and, still on their horses, make their way a mile forward to, as one of Hayden's troopers will recount, a low ridge through open sloping country clothed with the most beautiful blood-red poppies which made a gorgeous natural carpet thrown into strong relief by the yellow and white daisies, dandelions and a profusion of delicately tinted flowers. It is from here, with their heads just above the ridgeline, that they can clearly see the most perfect panorama of the shocking challenge they face. For there before them in the distance to the left are two more high ridges intersecting, both lined with bristling and barking Turkish guns. On the left, a fortification that will be known as Tank Redoubt, and out to the right, on another ridge, is the equally formidable Atawine Redoubt. Both redoubts dominate the bare terrain of the Valley of Death that lies before them, upon which, out to their left even now, British soldiers of the 54th Division and two dismounted Australian battalions of the Imperial Camel Corps are doing their best to attack Tank Redoubt, only to be torn apart by Turkish artillery and bullets. And that fire is now coming their way. But wait! Out to the left, a sole British tank, Nutty, is shuddering forward, puffs of smoke bursting forth from its turret, which immediately draws Turkish fire away from the 12th. The Turkish batteries are in part guided by the Taubas overhead, which are not only dropping bombs, but helping to direct the artillery batteries. High explosive shells will literally rain down on the tank, Hayden documents, which concentrated fire accounted for hundreds of casualties amongst the British storming troops. Good God Almighty! It was like shooting at sitting ducks, one of Hayden's fellow troopers of the 12th, Chuck Fowler, records. Yes, it was just murder. Are they really to continue heading into this hell themselves? They are. Advance! Leaving Nutty to its fate, Guy Hayden and the soldiers of the 12th abandon the cover of the lee side of their ridge and after galloping a thousand yards until the fire becomes too fierce and their horses too easy as targets, they dismount and lest the trooper in each section assigned to take the horses advance on foot from there. I wondered, Fowler will chronicle, how anyone could walk through the machine gun bullets and shrapnel that seemed to fill the air all the time as we advanced towards the Turkish line. The strangest thing. Looking to his left and right, he sees that his mates don't look frightened, but he is not fooled, all but certain that they felt as scared as I was. They are but men, up against an industrial level killing capacity. As they start to march forward, they can see the 11th light horse by their side being torn apart by exploding shells and machine gun and rifle fire. Within minutes, Hayden and the 12th are to know exactly what that is like as the shells start to land among them and men sink to the ground, sometimes without a sound, already dead, sometimes screaming, sometimes with a whimper, sometimes with a bang. Forward! At least they have a little support from the Inverness and Ayrshire batteries from behind, bringing fire down upon the Turkish defenders. And yet, alas, that artillery fire seems to be having little effect on the devastating fire sweeping them, just as it is on their fellow troopers of the 3rd Brigade on their right. The enemy artillery fire was the heaviest we had experienced, one of the 3rd will note, with shrapnel and high explosive. It was reported that the Turks had more than 250 big guns in action. Our troop, by short, sharp rushes, got to within striking distance, but the heavy casualties made it impossible to go any further. The worst for the 12th Light Horse Regiment comes as they passed a strange mound of earth with a pole sticking out on top. What on earth is that? They are not long in finding out as shells explode all around and dozens of them are wounded or killed at once. 
As we came close, we soon knew it to be a key range for the Turkish guns, as immediately eight guns opened up with shrapnel. Down and dig in! The best they can, the men of the 12th use their bayonets and scrabble small pits in the hard clay soil they can lie in to gain some respite from the blizzard of bullets. This is going to be a long day for some, and an eternal night for no few. Across the fortified line, it is the same. The troops and troopers of the British Empire push forward. The Turks, bolstered by German and Austrian artillery, more than hold their own. And the closer the attackers get, the more vicious the fire upon them is, and the more appalling the conditions they are trying to fight in are. The fire was terrible. Rifle, machine gun and shrapnel swept the ground, and it was so dusty that at times one could only see about 20 yards, Hayden will write home. There we lay with our noses glued to the ground and the shrapnel ripping all amongst us. Then we got the order to move forward again. How the devil any of us got out alive, the Lord only knows. This was the hottest fight of the lot. It seems only by the grace of God, or Inshallah, that the men of the 12th Regiment are able to take some cover in a small wadi tributary, which gives them shelter from the worst of the fire. To their right, the 3rd Australian Light Horse Brigade makes three charges on Atawine Redoubt, only to suffer devastating losses each time and be pushed back. In desperation for a breakthrough, General de Bell now throws in the tanks. And all of Tiger, War Baby, Pincher, Sir Reginald, Kiora and Ole Lukoy are soon clanking their way across the sand ridges and towards the Turkish redoubts. They sound like nothing anybody has ever heard, because nobody ever has. It is an extraordinary sound of roaring engines mixed with the eternally circular flap, flap, flap of the tracks, previously described by one digger as being like the padding of gigantic webbed feet. As the tanks flap, flap their way over the sands, their noses and tails rise and dip with a sway that is positively unearthly, like they are some alien monsters come to devour them all, so repulsive, so inhuman, so full of menace. In the belly of their roaring beasts, their backs against the engine cover, the drivers of these spitting, grinding, roaring metal monsters do their best to guide them. Unlike on the Western Front, where they have had previous experience, the sand of this desert sticks and slides particle by particle in a way that a clod of dirt will not. From grease turned to grit to sandy sprockets that suddenly throw the tracks of the tanks out of alignment, it is clear from the first that the tanks are struggling just to get across the sand, let alone engage the enemy. Did someone say target practice? For the Turkish artillery, it is like lining up sick elephants waddling towards them, and through laying their artillery and firing over open sight, they are quickly able to blow the first two tanks apart. Out on the far left, however, closely watched by Guy Hayden and the men of the 2nd Brigade, against all odds, Nutty is still going. Or is it? It's hit. Suddenly the tank began to wobble in circles, Eon Idris chronicles, like an antediluvian monster shot through the stomach. But now look, against all odds, the tank righted itself and under a tornado of shells again clanked straight for the redoubt. The amazed troopers behind can see through gaps in the billowing clouds of smoke and dust that the tank is able to trample the barbed wire in its way and bring sustained fire on the enemy trenches just a quarter mile ahead as they rush forward. Alas, a high-explosive shell lands right under Nutty, the blast finally finishing the tank as the crew come out of it burning. Still, the surviving troopers don't stop, as the forward survivors of the 1st Anzac Battalion of the Camel Brigade fix bayonets and charge. Only 30 Australians reach the redoubt, and 20 British infantry, Eon Idris chronicles. They were madmen. The Turks lost their nerve at the blazing tank groaning upon them, at the glint of steel as maniacs burst from the smoke. They fled, 600 of them, under Germans and Austrians. For the next two hours, the Australian and British troopers managed to hold on to what has been so hard won, but the fire they take is overwhelming as a Turkish counterattack builds. 
Despite it all, Lieutenant Archie Campbell, one of the Cameleers, is able to direct his six machine gunners to make the most of it, mowing down Turks in masses. One of those gunners, Trooper William Barry, has his right arm shattered by shrapnel and is told by Lieutenant Campbell to save his life and retreat. Get out the best you can. What about my gun, sir? Leave it. I think I can carry it, Trooper Barry counters and heads off, the gun over his left shoulder, the stump of his right arm trailing blood. As for Lieutenant Campbell himself, the young Queenslander seems invincible on this day. He has been shot several times but still stands. Seeing the tide has not just turned but is becoming a tidal wave against them, he gathers the Turkish prisoners they have taken and orders them to run at once for the British line. They do exactly that, but Campbell remains, still firing for a few moments more, before placing his revolver back in his holster and running back from the redoubt to find a German officer standing straight in his path, stock still and covering him with a revolver. Both officers recognise the moment. It is man on man. The German has chivalry, even giving Campbell a chance to surrender. Should Campbell bow to such chivalry? or go for his gun. Deciding on the latter, he whips his right hand down and even manages to get his revolver out of his holster before he is blown backwards, completely knocked from his feet. A shell has exploded right in front of him. When the dust clears, the chivalrous German officer is no more than scattered human remains spread on the ground before him. Such is war. A stroke of good fortune for one combatant is devastating bad luck for another and Campbell will live to fight another day. Alas, he is in a tragic minority. Campbell had led 102 men into battle on this day, only 10 of whom make it back to where they began at dawn. It has been a disaster by any definition. Elsewhere along the line, the Turkish fire is unrelenting on any troop movement, and all the remaining tanks are quickly destroyed. Lieutenant John Davidson of the 3rd Australian Camel Battalion is in no doubt about the value of the metal beast. Curse the tanks! Thanks to them, we got it in the neck. It is the heaviest scrapping we have had, Guy Hayden will recount. Worse than the landing on Gallipoli, and even worse than in France. Out to the east, Ion Idris and the men of the 2nd Brigade have had a similarly grim experience, assigned the task of preventing the garrisons of Beersheba and Cherif from moving to the west to support Gaza. They too must demonstrate against the assembled Turkish forces and keep them busy. At least they are not alone. Here were congregated brigades of Australians, yeomanry, camelry, and by Jove, some of the engineers with a ton of gun cotton to blow up some railway bridges. There came the buzz, wheeze, crash, and down hurtled three bombs, killing six men and wounding 15 and killing 30 horses. If a bomb had dropped on that gun cotton, then the whole brigade would have gone too. We moved out across the plain towards the hills of Cherif. The sun grew blazing hot. Clouds of stifling dust arose. Again came the Taubas. They roared as they swerved viciously down. We dismounted and blazed hatefully while their machine guns spat down as they roared and rocked above. In the end, it becomes clear that further advance is impossible and they are ordered to stay in their wadi until they can withdraw. It is much the same situation along the line. When their artillery support stops completely, the fire upon them becomes devastating and as the desert column is torn apart, the heroic work of the stretcher bearers is counted on more than ever in a manner that would make both Simpson and his donkey weep with admiration. All through the battle, these stunningly brave men go back and forth into the front lines, carrying back the wounded. They never stop, and the official historian will later record that Captain W. Evans of the 3rd Light Horse Brigade Field Ambulance worked all day under the fire of the guns and, assisted only by four men, handled no less than 240 wounded. One of these is already well known and beloved throughout the entire AIF. Cotter, the international fast bowler, Gullet Chronicles, was prominent all day among the stretcher bearers. 
he behaved in action as a man without fear. Trooper Tibby Cotter and his comrades never stop. With bullets flying and shrapnel hissing by, with men dying all around, they simply go about their task gathering up the wounded and getting them back to relative safety where they can get treatment. As the battle goes on, inevitably, they are a dark hue below the waist. As the fresh blood all over them dries and even starts to flake off their pants, Cotter, who has been attached to the 12th Light Horse Regiment since February 1916, simply keeps going. As shocking as it is to take a bayonet to the guts, it is at least something to meet Tibby Cotter. Tibby. One method of evacuation tried on the day is to put the wounded on sleds and pull them back behind horses at full gallop, which works well, bar for the fact that all too frequently, the sleds wipe out the field telephone wires between the front lines and brigade headquarters, which... Hello? Hello? Despite such communication problems, by the time the sun is high in the sky on this day, General de Bell is under no illusion. The net gain for his forces both at Gaza and along the fortified line is not much. The Turkish artillery, machine guns and rifles have stopped them at nearly every point and the enemy's fortified positions remain practically untouched. For their trouble, the attackers have been completely decimated and the battlefield is strewn with their blood, their limbs and their corpses. They have been annihilated. At one point, when Kiwi and Yeomanry reinforcements arrive, Hellfire Jack Royston puts them with some of the survivors of his 3rd Light Horse Brigade to mount a bayonet charge, only to call it off at the last minute. The 10th Light Horse Regiment, which had been nearly wiped out at the neck, is more relieved than most, with just 35 men left standing this time from over 200 who had gone forward. Back from the front lines, frustrated beyond measure at being kept in reserve for the entire day and without a chance to prove themselves, are the men of the 4th Light Horse Regiment. Adding insult to injuries too bloody and devastating to bear, by mid-afternoon, a message from Gaza to the German HQ at Tel El Sharia is intercepted, telling Kress von Kressenstein not to worry, as they were in no need of reinforcements. Yes, there had been a spot of bother here and there, but the British would need to throw more than 40,000 soldiers at them to properly bother them. At the end of this brutal day, in his HQ at Deir El Bala, General de Bell looks over the devastating reports coming back from all his separate units and starts tabulating. So far, in the course of his battle, they have had nearly 5,000 casualties, of whom 1,500 have been killed. It is, not to put too fine a point on it, a disaster, heading towards catastrophe. Should they continue by bringing in the major reserve force, the 74th Yeomanry Division, and suffer more casualties for an uncertain result? Or bow to the obvious, they have lost this battle. As night falls, the Australians fall back. Guy Hayden and the 12th Light Horse Regiment had started the day 220 strong. They are now missing no fewer than 70 of their number to the casualty list. The Turkish guns are still blazing at 9pm, angry and red on distant hills. They are still blazing at 11pm too, but there are few soldiers left awake to watch them. The men fall to rest where they can, any dirt will do. The tension of battle is stolen by slumber, all care gone. As Ion Idris notes, for a few hours of the most blessed sleep we have ever had, which is saying a damn lot, in fact, words fail. One trooper at least tries, however. Dear mother and father, our endeavours were unsuccessful and we retired, leaving a large number of dead on the field. It was the worst cutting up since Gallipoli this brigade has had. Stephen. For the second time in a month, the Australians of the Light Horse find themselves retreating from Gaza, carrying their dead and wounded, while cursing the generals who have brought them to this insanity. The only upside right now is some rest at last. Our horses didn't have their saddles off for seven days and nights, Guy Hayden will report to Bon. They had a rough time, but we didn't lose one, and the old black mare is still going strong. 
Appalled by the results of the battle, the good men who have been lost, Ionidris is one of many who feels he knows that the root cause of this whole devastating debacle has been all because some English general wanted the honour of taking Gaza by infantry. Infantry cannot fight any faster than they can march. Seriously? In the first battle, the generals had let the light horse have their head and by rapid movement they had actually stormed the high citadel. This time they had sent the infantry up against the fortress to beat them all, Gaza, while the light horse had gone up against a solid wall of guns, where the ability to manoeuvre was a little beside the point. Idris has, consequently, no respect at all for these generals, whose idea of a good battle is to set up a camp completely remote from the action and risk, and every day or so report on the progress you have made as more men die for the next scrap of land. It is insane, and he and another 12,000 men of the Australian Light Horse have a better idea if anyone would care to listen. We can't understand why they don't let us gallop in as mounted troops and get the thing over. It will have to be done at the finish, after the Turks have fortified all Palestine. The worst of it is the first of it. They have been here before. They were there. Gaza should have fallen on the first day at a cost to us of only a few hundred lives. Thousands of lives have twice now been thrown away in two attacks. Bloody hell. That is what they have seen these past few days, and that's what the future will hold unless something changes. A general or two might be a good place to start. The whole exercise has been a catastrophe, and on hearing the news... Lawrence of Arabia is another figure who is furious, convinced that Murray's ineptitude has placed the entire Arab revolt at risk. For his part, General Murray is in no doubt where the fault lies and is quick to sack Lieutenant General de Bell, the commander of Eastern Force, even if he publicly spreads a little seasoning on his reasoning. It became apparent to me, he will recount, that General de Bell, who had suffered some weeks previously from a severe touch of the sun, was no longer in a fit state of health to bear the strain of further operations in the coming heat of summer. To my great regret, therefore, I felt it my duty to relieve him of his command and to place the command of Eastern Force in the hands of Lieutenant General Sir Philip Chetwood. Now, who can replace Chetwood's position in his previous command of the Desert Column? Well, there can only be one choice, General Harry Chevelle, who has done so well with his Anzac Mounted Division. In a solemn ceremony, Sir Philip hands over the lance and standard of the Desert Column to Chevelle. The engraved band around records the name of each battle fought. Many still are to come. And it is done. Chevelle is in charge, promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General to boot. The first time an Australian has reached that rank, the capable New Zealander, Major General Edward Chater, will take over Chevelle's previous command of the Anzac Mounted Division. The two failed attacks on Gaza have left a bitter taste in the mouths of the Desert Column survivors. Generals with clever words can claim what they like, but the truth is all too bloody obvious to every man left. We have lost 18,000 men and gained nothing. What makes it worse is the lack of understanding from so many, including much of the Australian public. A small example that comes at this very time is when one of Eon Idris's mates in the 5th Light Horse Regiment receives a care parcel from Australia addressed to a lonely soldier, which is charming. Less so is the note inside from an anonymous Australian woman, as recounted by Idris expressing the pious wish that a brave soldier in France should get the parcel and not a cold-footed squib in Egypt. Outraged, the trooper gets some photos of the graves of mates who'd been killed at Gaza and sends them to the woman, with compliments from a cold-footed squib in Egypt. There is an old Turkish saying, Dum laya dum lay gul olur, drop by drop becomes a lake. It is a warning as well as an instruction. One hour can turn a battle. One battle can turn a war. What have they and their German colleagues learnt in the last two attacks on Gaza? 
Firstly, that they can take on the perfidious British and their allies in a head-to-head battle and win. With this in mind, Kress von Kressenstein and his commanding officer, Jamal Pasha, are more determined than ever to hold the fort and not only reinforce Gaza, but also stop the British ever breaching the Gaza to Beersheba line. The elated Kress von Kressenstein thus gives the orders. That 30-mile line stretching out into the desert across the only precious wells in the area must be further fortified. As ever, his purpose is as singular as his monocle, and he will see that order become reality immediately or know the reason why. The Turks and Arabs must, for the moment, give preference to their shovels over their rifles to dig trenches, build redoubts, construct defences, and anticipate the inevitable attack, defeating it with preparation before it has even begun. There are to be no more British patrols roving north of this line. More than a line in the sand across which no one can cross, it is to be an armed, fortified, connected series of entrenchments. And from here, the Turks can launch their own patrols to the south to attack the British. And what can the British and their allies do in response? It is precisely as it had been in France when the Germans had dug in. There is only one thing you can do. To prevent a Turkish counterattack and defend your own line, you must dig in yourself. So it is that in the high summer of 1917, two roughly parallel trenches snake across the desert, anywhere from a few miles to many miles apart. In terms of offensive actions against the Turks at the moment, there is only one bit of good news for the British. That strange chap, T.E. Lawrence, with his strange ideas about activating the Arab tribes against the Ottoman Empire, is actually achieving wonders. Time and again, he and his Arab warriors are launching ambushes on Turkish trains in the Hejaz, that desert region, boasting Damascus itself, that lies by the Red Sea. Negotiating with different Arab tribes as he goes, Lawrence is gathering strength and from being merely a thorn in the side of the Turks, he is turning into an open wound, as they must bleed resources to try to thwart those ambushes and pursue Lawrence and his raiders all to no avail. Time and again, Lawrence of Arabia manages to disappear into the sand dunes whence he came with his men, only to appear a week or two later at a seemingly impossible distance to strike again from a completely unexpected angle, whereupon he and his men disappear once more. Worse still, for the Turks, Lawrence's forces are growing, the initial raiders spawning new bands. June 1917, Cairo, past the port. Riots again. This time the troops are gathering outside of a particular establishment, and for very good reason. Generals out of a job to the number of 90 or so Banjo Patterson himself would recount, had accumulated in Shepherd's Hotel, where they either just existed beautifully or they made themselves busy about such jobs as reporting upon the waste of jam tins. Others became town commandants or examiners of an army diet. So many were they that there was little room for junior officers in the hotel and no room at all for non-coms or the rank and file. These latter riffraff were forbidden to enter the hotel, even to buy a drink or to meet a friend, lest they should come between the wind and the nobility of the staff officers. This created a very unpleasant feeling, and the troops rioted outside Shepherds by way of voicing their protest. Hundreds of them, hurling abuse, throwing beer bottles, and even burning a car. It will take several hours for the military police to restore order, but the message of the soldiers remains long after they have been dispersed. They have lost confidence in their military leadership, who send them out to battle while they stay here, swanning about and doing fuck all. As it happens, Whitehall is starting to feel much the same, at least when it comes to General Archibald Murray. His explanations for the failure to take Gaza in this latest battle have never been satisfactory. Broadly, as he will later explain, his forces had been outgunned. The enemy force in front of me was then five divisions, General Murray will recount, with considerably increased numbers of Austrian and German gunners and machine gunners, 
and it was abundantly clear that owing to the relaxation of pressure further east, the Turks had been able to reinforce their units heavily from depots in the north of Palestine. When questioned as to just what he needed to get the job done, Murray would request a further two complete divisions and enough field artillery to complete all divisions to a normal scale. With the troops which I had at the time, I could hope for no more than a local success. For Whitehall, such excuses and demands are underwhelming, and history itself, or at least the official historian, Henry Gullett, will take a dim view. Sir Archibald, he will write, failed mainly because de Bell, who was leading his Palestine army, was equipped neither by experience nor by temperament for an important command against a European force. There is something fine about de Bell's boundless confidence in his capacity to crush his foe at all hours and on any ground, but battles against Europeans are not won by the mere exercise of boundless confidence. De Bell was not the only British leader who, having achieved success against native troops in petty wars, had made such mistakes. The bottom line for Whitehall is that the failure of Murray's troops to take Gaza at the second go all while suffering over 6,000 casualties, of whom over 500 had been killed outright, is simply not good enough. And all this while he had barely left Cairo. Murray himself is not good enough. But who can replace him? Prime Minister Lloyd George is so eager to move on, he has already offered the job to the legendary South African General Jan Smuts, Famed for his brilliant mounted commando campaigns against the British in the Boer War, and for his shrewd grace in concluding that war in personal negotiation with the steely Lord Kitchener. But the great man has declined on the grounds that, sniff, Palestine is no more than a sideshow. Who else then? There is one, currently on duty at the Western Front, in charge of the Third Army, holding the line around the Arras sector. A vastly experienced professional soldier and officer, he had been one of the first into France as commander of the cavalry division, and even though there had been only very limited opportunities for cavalry in that deadly arena, his charges had still fought brilliantly on foot, most particularly at Messine during the First Battle of Ypres. Let us sound Allenby out. Another night at Third Army HQ, some miles back from the Western Front. With the darkness comes the endless gloomy flashes to the east, reflected off the low cloud bank, followed a few seconds later by booms of dirty thunder, even as the very ground itself shakes. The whole eastern horizon is a pulsating menace, despite the distance. General Sir Edmund Allenby wonders at just how appalling it must be for those soldiers on both sides who are under such a barrage day and night. As ever, his thoughts go to one English soldier in particular. As he does every evening, the general heads down the corridor of his HQ in this old chalet and pushes the door open to the office where the casualty reports come in heads off to the window which faces the pulsating light to the east and asks with his back to the officer in charge, have you any news of my little boy today? As ever, the officer in charge, knowing General Allenby is referring to his and Lady Allenby's only child, Lieutenant Michael Allenby, who at the age of 19 is on the front lines with the Royal Horse Artillery, replies, no news, sir. As a father... He seeks no privileges for his son, no special care be taken. He asks only the indulgence that he know that his son is safe so far, so he can sleep that night. Far from being sheltered, Michael is constantly in the thick of the action and only a few months earlier had been awarded the military cross for his bravery, rescuing a wounded man under heavy fire, something that is the pride of Sir Edmund and Lady Allenby's life. Ah, but there is other news for you tonight, General Allenby. A cable from London. It is requested you journey to the capital immediately to discuss a possible transfer of command. Really? Despite his recent run-ins with his commander-in-chief, Sir Douglas Haig, on the subject of the Battle of Arras, which had finished just weeks before, Allenby is reluctant to change posts, for the job is not done. 
Following his brilliant plan, his Third Army had cracked the German line wide open near the French city of Arras on the Western Front and had advanced further in less time, four miles in just one day, than any army since the beginning of trench warfare in October 1914. And yes, the Germans had then regrouped and managed to stop them, which had seen both Allenby's Third Army and General Sir Henry Horne's First Army suffer over 160,000 casualties. But after regrouping, receiving reinforcements from Britain, Allenby is confident that they could see it through. And this is General Allenby all over. The only thing about him that has ever retreated is his hair. He stands at six foot four inches, sturdy and perhaps a touch burly, English oak, and the idea of leaving France is anathema to him. As would later be documented by the historian and fellow iconic officer, Field Marshal Sir Archibald Percival Wavell, he believed he was being removed from France and relegated to an unimportant command because of the limited success of the Arras battles. His biographer will later come to the view that Allenby was removed because he had jettisoned his philosophy of cheerful obedience to Haig, making the latter want to see the last of him. Prime Minister Lloyd George, the Welsh wizard, is both beguiling and frank in their meeting at 10 Downing Street. The East needs him. He is the only man for the job. He will have carte blanche. You can ask us for such reinforcements and supplies as you find necessary, and we will do our best to provide them. If you do not ask, it will be your fault. If you do ask and do not get what you need, it will be ours. But make no mistake. I want Jerusalem as a Christmas present for the British nation. Jerusalem? Back in Western Christian hands for the first time since the Crusades. It really would be a Christmas present to beat them all for the British Empire. For the Prime Minister's goal, as he had openly stated to the War Cabinet a short time earlier, is not just military, but political and moral. The British public is tiring quickly of the endless stalemate on the Western Front, the devastatingly long casualty lists being published in the papers every day. But an advance in the Middle East? A chance to take back the lands of Christ? Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Nazareth, Damascus, from the perfidious Turk who has ruled it for the last 400 years? It would lift the English-speaking peoples, starting with the people of the British Empire. Lloyd George had already directed his director of propaganda to begin a campaign with the slogan, The Turk Must Go, and Allenby's delivery of Jerusalem would be an enormous part of that. Yes, difficult, but doable. And once Jerusalem is secured, the seat of Ottoman power in the Middle East, Damascus itself, could be next. The fall of an empire and a front of the war is a dream within reach if the right soldier reaches for the glittering prize. Why, if everything falls into place, the British cabinet is already discussing, almost as an afterthought, the possibility of declaring Palestine as a new Jewish homeland. Lord Balfour, the foreign secretary, is particularly keen on it. General Allenby agrees to go. When asked by the Prime Minister himself, What can a general do but cede to the request? As Allenby takes his leave of Downing Street, Lloyd George reaches into his bookcase and gives the general a copy of George Adam Smith's Historical Geography of the Holy Land, telling him it will be a better guide to a military leader whose task is to reach Jerusalem than any survey to be found in the pigeonholes of the war office. Attention! General Harry Chevelle, the newly appointed commanding officer of the Desert Column, has arrived to inspect some of his Australian troops. Trooper Morrie Evans surveys him with a gimlet eye, not sure what to expect. All of them have prepared as well as they can, polishing their buttons, shining their brass, and putting their slouch hats with emu feathers poking out from the khaki puggery on their left-hand side at just the right rakish angle. Now they are in parade formation in lines, each trooper standing beside his mount with all his saddlery laid out on a blanket before him. And here comes General Chevelle, trailed by his aides and the 1st Light Horse Field Ambulance Regiment's own officers. Evans himself is pointed out to Chevelle as one of the regiment's veterans who had come over with the first contingent. 
Chevelle stops before him and looks him up and down. Oh, uh, you came over with the first contingent? Yes. Pause. Sir Harry has not quite mastered the art of a quick word on full parade just yet. Did you get on the peninsula? Yes. Another pause. Were you there with Colonel Sutherland? Yes, sir. And uh, did your health stick with you all right? I was off sick from dysentery on the peninsula. There is a much longer awkward pause. Oh, well, uh, you got a bit of a spell that way. It is on the tip of Evan's tongue to offer a smart remark along the lines of he can think of better ways of getting a spell, but he thinks better of it. Chevelle moves on, and good luck to the next man he tries to chat with. Chevelle is not one for small talk, but he is one for big battles, and he is one of ours. To be an Australian commanded by an Australian is a novelty that the diggers and troopers of the East delight in. An amused Evans records his conversation with Chevelle in his journal, and as the shocking heat of the desert dies away, he records beauty, too, with the glory of sundown. In the twinkling of an eye, the glow fades, the stars rush out, he notes in his diary, and the darkness of an eastern night descends on land, sky and sea. Hopefully the tide will turn on this war, and they can all go home. Inshallah. Chapter 8. Enter Allenby. Such then was the state of things prior to the advent of Allenby. Troops rioting, officers disregarding orders, and generals wearing wrongly coloured socks. Then came Allenby, and everything was altered in the twinkling of an eye. Banjo Patterson, Happy Dispatches. 28th of June, 1917. Cairo. Cometh the hour, cometh the man. Formerly, General Allenby is only to take command of the Egyptian expeditionary force as the twelfth bell of midnight tolls on this day. But he does not bother waiting that long, and his polished boots of black leather are barely on the platform of Cairo Railway Station before he is on his way to the Egyptian expeditionary force GHQ. Situated at the great colonial chateau of the Grand Continental Hotel on Opera Square, Overlooking from its sweeping balconies the trees, lawn and lake of Esbekia Gardens, while on the far horizon are the pyramids, the newly arrived general goes briskly and unannounced from room to room to introduce himself to each officer, work out precisely what it is they do and where they fit into what they are pleased to call the scheme of things. If only an actual scheme existed. As near as Allenby can work out for the moment, there appears to be very little in train to, how should one put this, win the war? The most senior officers are monitoring the situation the best they can from this far back, but there is no urgency, no straining forth, no whip to even crack. It all puts him in an ill humour when a rather nervous Major General arrives with a folder several inches thick under his arm, dealing with details of dress, discipline, the administration of martial law and such matters. Allenby looks through the first three pages with rising colour, each document more petty than the last. He cannot contain himself. Is the rest of this of a similar nature? An affirmative nod is all he needs. Without another word, the newly arrived general takes the whole folder and throws it across the room, which sees a hundred pages loosely flutter to the floor. The cavalry is not only in General Allenby's background, it is in his very blood, and he knows that battles are not won by bureaucracy. Never again waste my time, he thunders, on minor details that could be answered by a junior officer. Let the word go forth. They don't call this six-foot-four-inch behemoth Bull Allenby for nothing. He is descended from the Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell himself, whose most famous blast of thunder was, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. And communicating with a certain vigour is something of a family tradition. At least for Allenby, there is one familiar face who can give him orthodox counsel on the whole situation. After the debacle of the attacks on Gaza, 
Chetwood has replaced de Bell as commander of the Eastern Force. Edmund Allenby and Philip Chetwood are old friends and brothers in arms, with Chetwood having a year earlier been a brigade commander in Allenby's Third Army on the Western Front. And in fact, they go back as far as the siege of Ladysmith in the Boer War. As soon as Sir Edmund had set foot on the docks at Alexandria, General Chetwood had been there to greet him and handed him his proposal on how the Turkish nut could be cracked. The answer is Beersheba. Chetwood's chief of staff, Brigadier General Guy Dorney, has come up with a novel plan to take it, and it is well worth looking at, General. The starting point is that it's now obvious that the Turks are digging in and are intent on holding the gaza Beersheba line, a formidable obstacle given that they have built trenches and redoubts on high ground lying right on wadis, with the approaches from the south being vast, waterless plains without cover. And just to be extra sure, they have endless rolls of barbed wire to further slow down any forces that dare to try to overcome all the other defences. With all that in mind, it would be fatal, in my opinion, General Chetwood ventures, to make a half-bite at the cherry and to attempt an offensive with forces which might permit us to attack and occupy the enemy's present line, but which would be insufficient to inflict on him a really severe blow, and to follow up that blow with fresh troops pressing closely on his heels. What General Allenby must understand is that the Gaza line goes from the sea for some 30 miles along the gaza Beersheba road and is defended, as near as our intelligence can work it out, by at least 50 battalions, over 33,000 men with another 1,400 cavalry and 260 guns manned by 5,500 artillery crew. The only weakness comes where the fortifications are much thinner, between Herrera and Beersheba itself, that part of the line where the reckoning of the Turks is that there is not enough water out there to support a big attack. The key to attacking this line will be both speed of movement and making the enemy think the attack will be coming from elsewhere right up until the moment they strike. We have been hitting Gaza. The Turks expect us to keep hitting Gaza. So... What if we pretend we are going to do just that, with traditional British bulldog stubbornness when it comes to changing tactics or targets? If we make the Turks think we are going to hit Gaza, the bulk of their forces will be congregated there, just as we hit the thinner defences in between Herrera and Beersheba instead, and drive through. Beersheba? Allenby is struck by the counterintuitive notion, the very improbability of the target. Why, Gaza is bad enough. The only approaches are over a bare plain with no cover. But a surprise attack further inland still, over such difficult territory, the Turks will never be expecting it. Chetwood, too, is a cavalryman and is speaking a language that Allenby appreciates, focusing on the virtues of men on horseback moving fast and attacking from an unexpected angle. Go on, General Chetwood. If we can move fast enough and attack with overwhelming force, ideally creating havoc behind the enemy lines, our cavalry forces will be concentrated on our right flank with a sure water supply and be able to roll up the fortified line from there, attacking from three sides, in front, behind and on the flank. It can be done in a day. Allenby studies the plan closely. The sheer madness of it is genius. Yes, the difficulties of moving a mass of men and material that far into the desert while escaping detection would be many, but equally, an outrageous victory could be possible. How many men will we need? Two big infantry corps and one smaller mounted corps, about 100,000 men in all. One British infantry corps will attack the enemy's left flank around Beersheba, while another infantry corps will pin the enemy down at Gaza. 100,000 men are under his command, but General Allenby is not quite sure what to make of this one, the Australian chap in charge of the desert column. There is no doubt that the military record of General Harry Chevelle is outstanding, and it had been Chevelle's men, after all, who had actually got inside Gaza and established temporary dominion before being pulled back for what, 
in Allenby's view, was an absurdity. If possession is nine points of the law in civil life, it is close to ten points in military situations. Allenby was never a man to voluntarily give up hard-won positions in difficult terrain, and for the life of him can't understand why Murray did. But standing here now in front of Allenby, there is about the rather exhausted, if still neat-looking Australian, a certain, what is it, diffidence? A certain standoffishness? Allenby is Chevelle's commanding officer, and there is no doubt that the Australian is properly respectful of that. But there is certainly no more than that coming from him. It is almost as if Chevelle is assessing Allenby, waiting, listening, keeping his own counsel, and working out just what the new chap might be bringing, what his intentions are. One reason for Chevelle's slight remoteness is that he wants it exactly that way. Time and again in this war to date, he has had to push back against the British assumption that the Australians must automatically do exactly what the British government asks of them. He does not. Australia is no longer a colony. So it is that when Allenby moves to have Chevelle and his men come under Allenby's administrative control, Chevelle declines. As has been agreed between the Australian and the Imperial Government, he is answerable first to General Birdwood, the Englishman who the Australian Government has appointed as Commander-in-Chief of the Australian Forces, and secondly to Australia itself. And so when Allenby now insists he wishes to make a direct approach to Australia's Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, to ask for more men to be sent from Australia, General Chevelle is clear. No, General Allenby. Chevelle will take the precaution of writing to both Birdwood and Hughes, reporting Allenby's intent. The Australian's projection of a sense of independence is further emphasised when the English general expresses his dissatisfaction with the fact that, instead of being born and bred to the cavalry, Chevelle's chief of staff has a background as a field gunner, while his quartermaster is a Royal Marine. Thank you, General Allenby, but General Chevelle is quite happy with both officers. The towering Allenby tries insistence. Chevelle is persistence itself and is not for changing. He is his own man with a very strong record of success. Yes, General Allenby can remove him with a stroke of a pen, but it would be at his peril. Infantry are useful in this war, but far more important are the fast-moving mounted troops and Chevelle's demonstrated capacity to command them with deadly efficiency is a key asset. And so Allenby leaves it for the moment, but in Allenby's first letter to Sir William Robertson, Chief of the Imperial General Staff, however, the Australian General is the first item on the agenda. Chevelle is not a trained cavalry leader, he writes, and though he has capacity for command and fighting instincts, he would be improved by having a trained and experienced cavalryman as his Chief of Staff. Such a one I have not available. Fitzgerald, who commands the 5th Mounted Brigade, could do it, but the Australians, including Chevelle, cannot bear the sight of him. The word spreads. The arrival of Allenby has already seen many senior officers dismissed, and the question is, who might be next? By now, Major Banjo Patterson's remount depot has moved from within sight of the pyramids to much closer to the front, up at Moascar. And the poet is suddenly privy to many hushed conversations concerning the imminent issue of a tin hat to some general whose headgear had been mostly brass. Oh yes, this expression, tin hat, arose from the tin extinguisher that was used in the old days to put out a candle. When Allenby issued a tin hat to a man, that man was forthwith extinguished. One contender whose name frequently arises is General Chevelle. Yes, he is currently in charge of the Desert Column, clearly the most important command of the entire campaign, as it is always the spearhead of the attack. But will General Allenby leave him there? Banjo has heard a whisper that Chevelle might be due some new brass, charge of a whole corps. They'll never give it to Chevelle, one brass-bound brigadier says to Patterson. Fancy giving the command of the biggest mounted force in the world's history to an Australian. Chevelle's sound, but he's such a sticky old frog. And that officer is not the only that thinks so. There's an extra big tin hat being got ready, 
Banjo is told of Cheville's likely fate. It feels well informed enough that the poet fears for the fate of his old friend. One who is particularly impressed with the whole Allenby approach is Major Richard Meinertshagen of the intelligence section based at Der El Bala, who, after meeting the general in his first days there, records in his diary, My word, he is a different man to Murray. His face is strong and almost boyish. His manner is brusque, almost to the point of rudeness, but I prefer it to the oil and butter of the society soldier. Allenby breathes success, and the greatest pessimist cannot fail to have confidence in him. The Egyptian expeditionary force is already awakening from its lethargic sleep under Murray, and I'm happy to say that GHQ will shortly move into Palestine and be near troops, instead of wallowing in the flesh pots of Cairo. Good God! Comfortable paper warriors hear chilling reports that Allenby is wandering the corridors of Cairo's Savoy Hotel, collaring every lurking officer he can find, and barking, Get ready to go to the front! and it is hardly as if Allenby is hiding his intent. We're a bit far from our work up here, he observes acidly to his officers. I'd like to get up closer where I can have a look at the enemy occasionally. Meinertshagen heartily approves the idea of moving GHQ to the front. This move will stamp out the so-called East Force with its iniquitous independent attitude and the Chetwood policy of much bluster and no action. Chetwood is an excellent soldier, but must be driven. If he acts by himself, his every action is bluff, and he is a very nervous officer, attributing to the Turks all sorts of wondrous strategy and tactics. Apart from this, he is a soldier with sound ideas. When he lacks the initiative and courage to carry them out as planned, that is just where Allenby will find a very useful and talented servant. Indeed. Open parenthesis. There is an obvious connection between Allenby and Meinertshagen in that both are passionate ornithologists and both have a classic education resulting in a great facility to translate ancient Greek. Where they differ is that Allenby plays by the rules and Meinertshagen plays by his own. There is an unworldly ruthlessness to the intelligence operative and in the colonial wars in Africa at the turn of the century there was no doubt as to his proclivities. Richard Meinertshagen was a killer, it has been noted by Elspeth Huxley. Animals he killed for sport, and tribesmen he killed for duty. Even the concept of murder is hardly shocking to him, as he will himself write. I have no belief in the sanctity of human life or in the dignity of the human race. Close parenthesis. They will say many things about Lawrence of Arabia. They will never say he lacks audacity, and today is a case in point. On this day, Captain T. E. Lawrence, dressed in Arab robes and indistinguishable in dress from his companions, while his skin is now deeply tanned, is riding at the head of his posse of camel-born Arab guerrillas towards the Ottoman stronghold port of Aqaba on the southern extremes of the Hejaz Desert and the northern tip of the Red Sea. Yes, the port is heavily fortified and defended with many guns, but those guns are pointed towards the sea on the reckoning that no one would be mad enough to attack from across the 600 miles of all but waterless desert to its north. They had not reckoned on Lawrence. Over the last two months, he and his men have paused only to replenish water supplies at the highly scattered wells that only some of the Arabs know, to blow up Turkish railroad tracks and to use much of the 22,000 gold sovereigns that Lawrence carries, courtesy of the largesse of the British government, to recruit more Arab fighters from tribes they pass along the way. He and his band are now 500 strong, closing in on their quarry. And there they are. Just to the north of Aqaba is a small Turkish outpost. Mounting their camels once more to use their humps and heads for shields, the Arab guerrillas charge down the sand hills with nearly as much speed as their English leader. They go straight at the Turks and quickly overwhelm them, showing no mercy for the fact that, just the day before, an exhausted horseman had ridden into their camp with news of a Turkish slaughter of Arab women and children. They are, consequently, now without mercy. Aqaba itself falls just four days later. 
It is a major blow to Ottoman prestige and a demonstration that Lawrence's ideas work. The only problem is that Aqaba is so isolated that the British, as yet, have no way of knowing about what is less a mere victory against the Turks in their most isolated stronghold and more a triumph of all Lawrence's ideas. Well, Lawrence will tell them and soon sets off on his camel in the company of eight tribesmen to ride for 150 miles across the Sinai Desert to tell his superiors. His only guides are the stars and a map from the Royal Geographical Society archives. That stately figure bumping along the roads that lead from Cairo to Kantara to parts east, why, it is none other than General Allenby himself, as his biographer will recall, getting around in a particularly disreputable Ford truck. He sat perched up on the front seat alongside the driver, an Australian, who was clad only in a sleeveless vest and very attenuated shorts. The picture of these two, with one of the personal staff bumping painfully in the body of the truck behind, remained long in the memory of those who witnessed it. Just a bare five days after arriving in Egypt, and now eager to gain familiarity with the terrain that his forces will be fighting in, he insists on visiting these front lines some 300 miles to the northeast. One of the first things that takes his interest as he arrives among the foremost troops is the rare sight of a man at least his age and likely more. Who on earth is that ancient officer standing in a trench, and what is he doing fighting in this century? A quick conversation reveals him to be one Captain Hubert Barclay, who, while really too old to be upright in a trench, is a man of no little proven ability. Would he like to be in charge of desert transport? He would. Allenby promotes him on the spot and moves on, issuing a similar blizzard of promotions, demotions, commotions, all done with no emotion, just tightly clipped orders. Allenby went through the hot, dusty camps of his army like a strong, fresh, reviving wind, the Australian official history will recount. He would dash up in his car to a light horse regiment, shake hands with a few officers, inspect hurriedly, but with a sure eye to good and bad points, the horses of perhaps a single squadron, and be gone in a few minutes, leaving a great trail of dust behind him. And no wonder the trail is so great. Allenby is a towering figure in more ways than one. His tall and massive but restlessly active figure, his keen eyes and prominent hook nose, his terse and forcible speech, and his imperious bearing radiated an impression of tremendous resolution, quick decision, and steely discipline. Here is a leader at last, and he is actually here with the likes of us. At last, they had a commander who would live among them and lead them. Within a week of his arrival, Allenby had stamped his personality on the mind of every trooper of the horse and every infantryman of the line. And the Arabs too are impressed, not least because, as Allenby writes to his wife, Many of the Egyptians look at my name and believe it will bring good luck. I am called Allah Nabi, that is Allah and Nabi. Allah means God and Nabi the prophet. And it certainly helps that local Arabs have been raised on the legend that one day just such a prophet would arise to lead them victorious through the gates of Jerusalem. Beyond meeting and assessing the troops, Allenby is surveying the local ground and avenues of attack with particular care. Just inland from the Mediterranean coast, the country is mostly like an ocean of sand with a heavy swell, represented by the unending series of sand dunes. Once away from the main track, getting carts with supplies and the guns on limbers over those dunes would be nothing less than a nightmare, if it was possible at all. Twenty miles inland, the terrain proves to be harder and drier, but still so sandy the wheels would inevitably require endless digging out. And on the early approaches to Beersheba, when Allenby consults the book given to him by Prime Minister Lloyd George, Historical Geography of the Holy Land, he reads, Of all names in Palestine, there are hardly any better known than Beersheba. Nothing could more aptly illustrate the defencelessness of these southern slopes of Judah than that this site, which marked the frontier of the land, was neither a fortress nor a gateway, 
but a cluster of wells on the open desert. His eyes remained peeled for enemy movements, fortifications and planes, but being a very keen ornithologist, his eyes are drawn inevitably to something in the sky other than Tauber's, and he is also delighted to send his dear wife, Adelaide, a report of just how wondrous the desert is on that front, most particularly around the coastal strip. Of birds, there are larks, wheat ears, shrikes, bee-eaters, hawks, vultures. Flamingos frequent the mouths of the wadis. In the oases and near the villages are date palms and great quantities of fig trees, apricots and almond trees. Inland, in the area still closer to Beersheba, the growth is of course so much more sparse, but my dear, here is the extraordinary thing. The people all look like biblical characters, face, dress and everything like pictures from the Bible. Keen, handsome faces, picturesque Arab dress, ornaments of beads, coins and enamel, much as one sees in the Egyptian museums. Most importantly, he comes to the conclusion that Chetwood's plan really might work. Gaza, from the look of it, is practically impregnable. But the far end of their line, around Beersheba, here, with mounted troops and armoured cars providing close protection, he ventures as close as he dares to find it really looks promising. Most of the heavy Turkish fortifications and the troubling ridge finish at the tiny settlement of Herrera, which is four miles to the west of Beersheba. The most important thing is that to the east of Beersheba, at the far end of the line, there seems to be nothing at all in the way of Turkish presence, providing an open flank which his forces can close with a push and a shove. Beersheba itself, baking on the banks of the Wadi Saba, hardly looks imposing at his first gaze through his powerful looking glass and seems to be little more than a scattering of old and mostly mud brick buildings and new barracks, some gnarled trees, a desultory railway station and a white mosque shimmering in the sun, all with a lugubrious air common to all people and things who are just hanging on, but have been mostly forgotten. In the words of one close observer, Trooper Richard Dunk of the Third Light Horse, Beersheba lies in a shallow saucer at the foot of the Judean hills, which rise abruptly from its outskirts to the north. It promised no prize in comfortable quarters of foodstuffs, but it contained that which was still more essential and coveted, for the village was rich in springs of good water. Perhaps never since the far-off days of Abraham had the water in the old wells been needed by parched men riding in from the desert. It is equally no mini-Gaza in terms of defensive infrastructure. Rather, it is well out in the open, and rather than being on high ground, it has in various spots around it several bits of high ground that tower over it. Inevitably thus, to defend it, the Turks, likely on the advice of German engineers, have built the principal defensive fortifications on that high ground, allowing the defenders to instantly see whatever attacks might be coming at them and to fire on any that come within range with all of their artillery, machine guns and rifles. They are the kings of the castle and any dirty rascals who try to scale the cliffs will be propelled fatally back to the sand. On the eastern side, the most formidable fortified defence point that must be overcome is Tel El Saba, situated at three miles from the outskirts of the town. Between Tel El Saba and Beersheba, the natural defence is the Wadi Saba, which is traversed by a bridge. The summit of Tel El Saba, a thousand feet above the plain around it, is a plateau measuring the equivalent of about a dozen football fields, defended by steep sides all around as it stands at the meeting of the Wadi Saba and the Wadi Khalil. Most importantly for the purposes of the defenders, Tel El Saba still has many of the original structures built upon it over the centuries, some even by the Crusaders. These have now been dragged into the 20th century with trenches and stone huts bristling with machine guns and artillery batteries, and no proper attack on Beersheba's east side could be made until the battalion of Turkish soldiers atop Tel El Saba, with its artillery crews, is quelled. 
It would still take some doing to destroy the heavily fortified stone huts together with the men inside, but Allenby is convinced it can be done. Meanwhile, the defences to the south and west of Beersheba are equally problematic. Around the southwestern approaches to the town are a series of well-constructed semicircular trenches protected by wire. Heavy earthworks have been constructed to bolster the defences of those trenches, and the only way the infantry will be able to storm them will be over open ground, vulnerable to all defenders' machine gun positions. It will be difficult, but with enough men supported by heavy artillery, it can be done. Bathsheba it will be. Writing to his wife on paper headed by the script for the Egyptian state railways and telegraphs, Allenby reports on the 9th of July. My Mabel, I have gazed upon Gaza at a few miles' distance, and I have been within eight miles of Beersheba, but we have got neither place yet. Yes, here he is, in the land of the Philistines, replete with the kind of life form that is his great passion. Of birds, there are larks, shrikes, hawks, vultures and flamingos. Meanwhile... All the men and animals are looking well and in good spirits. The men are burnt as black as Arabs. One sees them sitting in the blazing sun, often with practically nothing on and with the appearance of enjoying it. The Australians especially enjoy being grilled. Returning to Cairo on the 12th of July, Allenby cables to London the genesis of the emerging plan and asks for additional troops to not only replace the 10,000 casualties lost to the first two attacks on Gaza, but even more, to give added heft to the coming attack. Shall we say another two infantry divisions? It is also agreed that each division will be provided with three 18-pounder batteries and four 60-pounder batteries. The latter are enormous. At five tons, it takes 12 horses to haul the guns forward, and the 60-pound shells need at least two men to manhandle them into the breach, dear friends, once more. And he will need more planes, Bristol's, Martinsides and RE-8s, to keep the skies clear of the Taubers that are harassing and observing the dispositions of his own troops, and planes to observe exactly what the Turks are doing. The War Cabinet smiles upon the request. Lloyd George fulfils his promise. Allenby asks, and he shall receive. Allenby's force will be boosted from six to ten divisions, while field artillery will also be boosted significantly, and three additional squadrons of aircraft will be sent. Who the hell does this blighter think he is? On this train bound from the Suez Canal to Cairo, it is not just that there is a stranger sitting in a private compartment reserved for officers. It is that he is an Arab. Have a look at him. Reading his book, completely unconcerned by their glares, he is all white silk robes, a curved dagger at his side, a rope of gold around his head, and the pièce de résistance of his ignominy? Bare feet. The only thing that gives the British officers pause is his blonde hair. It has to be said that very few Arabs boast that. And the fact he appears to be reading Homer in the original Greek makes him a rarer Arab still. Still, Arab or not, is this cove an officer? A British sergeant is commissioned to ask the question, Excuse me, sir, what army? The Meccan army. Never heard of it says the sergeant. Well, drawls the man in perfect Oxbridge English, would you recognise the uniform of a Montenegrin dragoon? Not actually, no. The sergeant retreats in confusion. The Arab grins in delight. It will take some sorting out, and that only after the badly outgunned sergeant withdraws and the train slows. In short order, the carriage empties of British officers in uniforms conventional and Montenegrin as they must change trains to catch the Port Said Cairo Express, and they are all on the platform when it happens. Admiral Rosalind Weymouth, the naval commander-in-chief, happens to be among those on the platform with his entourage when one of his officers recognises, why, none other than Lawrence of Arabia. The sun has burnt his skin so dark, and what little shows of him through his Arab dress, 
no, really, is so sandblown and weathered that he really does look like a native of these parts. But Lawrence brings extraordinary news to his fellow British officers. He and his Arabs have successfully attacked the Turks at Aqaba from the desert side, and it has fallen. And they, in turn, have news for him. While he has been away, a new force has hit the British forces. General Sir Edmund Allenby is here. Allenby? What's he doing here? Oh, he's in command now. And Murray? Gone home. Lawrence is perturbed. Murray had had his flaws, but had, after tutoring, understood what Lawrence was doing with the Arab revolt. Will Allenby be the same? I climbed back onto the train, he will recount, and fell to wondering if this heavy, rubicund man was like ordinary generals, and if we should have trouble for six months teaching him, as I had Murray. Lawrence does not have to wonder long. A meeting is arranged in Allenby's suite at the Savoy Hotel, even though it has been substantially packed up in readiness for the move to the front. It does not begin well. Allenby, gazing down from a height of six foot four inches, to lecture the slight five feet five inches figure staring up at him curiously. He was full of Western ideas of gunpowder and weight, the worst training for our war, but as a cavalryman was already half persuaded to throw up the new school in this different world of Asia, and accompanied Dorney and Chetwood along the worn road of manoeuvre and movement. Lawrence avidly puts his case that he and the Arabs can tie up as much as a third of the Ottoman army in the greatest game of cat and mouse the world has seen, leaving the way clearer for Allenby's own forces to push along the Mediterranean coast through Palestine and Syria. Lawrence keeps talking and is at least gratified that Allenby is listening. He was hardly prepared for anything so odd as myself, a little barefooted, silk-skirted man offering to hobble the enemy by his preaching if given stores and arms and a fund of 200,000 sovereigns to convince and control his converts. Allenby could not make out how much was genuine performer and how much charlatan. Lawrence does not help him out. The main thing is that by the end of their meeting, Allenby is clearly not against what the intelligence officer is doing. To Lawrence's proposal that he and his rising band of Arabs be given enough gold to bribe more Arab leaders and enough guns to really attack the Turkish army along the Hejaz railway, General Allenby even says, Well, I will do for you what I can. The two take their leave, with Lawrence broadly satisfied. Allenby will continue to support him, which is what counts but the general will also go on with his own manoeuvres and the plans of Chetwood and Dorney. One thing Lawrence can hope that Allenby has gleaned from the success at Aqaba is that attacking the Turk from the unexpected direction really can work wonders. Allenby continues to move with typical speed. One of his first orders is that the settlement of Kantara on the Suez Canal be transformed into a massive inland port with more ships looking from a distance like so many squatting ducks starting to congregate there as they disgorge ever more supplies ready for the coming big push. With that comes this. In this huge mushroom settlement, Henry Gullett will note, 30 miles of metalled roads were laid down on the heavy sand. Various bases, which had hitherto been scattered over northern Egypt, were concentrated there, and a marked improvement made in the handling and dispatch of supplies to the advanced army. Simultaneously, swarms of happy, singing, hard-working Egyptian labourers, spurred on by enthusiastic engineers in the heat of the summer months, duplicated the desert railway from Kantara as far as Mardin, 80 miles from the canal a work which had an immediate and substantial effect in the speeding up of supplies. On this particular day, Major Richard Meinertshagen is with General Allenby and explaining the latest intelligence from spies, Lawrence's Arabs and deserters from the Turkish army, when they are interrupted by Allenby's military secretary, Lord Dalmany, looking very grave. He hands the general a telegram bearing the news. It is my painful duty to inform you, Lieutenant Horace Allenby, Royal Horse Artillery, is officially reported killed in action 
the 29th of July 1917, the Army Council expressed their sympathy. General Allenby finishes reading it, brings his hand to cover his eyes for a moment and whispers, My son, before composing himself and turning back to Major Meinertzhagen. Go on, he says. Meinertzhagen is impressed. I thought it a great example of self-discipline. Meinertzhagen finishes the briefing as quickly as he decently can before leaving Allenby to weep in private and then complete a letter he had been engaged in writing to his wife about bird life. I have just got your wire. My darling sweetheart, I wish I could be with you, but I know how brave you are, and you will be strong and bear this awful blow. You and Michael fill up my thoughts, and I feel very near to you both. He was always the same, keen in his work, thoughtful beyond his years, cheerful and brave. He always kissed me when we met and when we parted, just as he did when a child. August 1917, Moaskar, Egypt, a horse for a kingdom. Mercifully, given the numbers of whalers killed, there has been a surge in their supply, but still demand exceeds it. Hardly had we got our first shipment of Australian horses, Major Patterson will recount, very wild characters, some of them, than brigadier generals began to drop in. Every one of them wanted horses, and each general wanted the best horse. Any other general could go and eat coke so far as he was concerned, for every man has to fight for his own hand in the army. Highly placed staff officers looked in to pass their latest remarks on the war and incidentally to grab a good horse or two for themselves, their friends, or their subordinates. But now everything has changed with the arrival of General Allenby. Just as he has done with everything else, Allenby is insisting on a complete change in priorities. Allenby's orders were very strict. No officer, not even a staff popinjay or a brigadier, should be allowed to select a horse for himself. We had to issue the horses. The best had to go to the fighting men, the next best to the staff, and the culls and rejects to the men on lines of communication, camp commandants, doctors, water supply officers and such like cattle. A possible exception to the orders not to favour senior officers in preference to fighting men is when the most senior officer is also a fighting man, and there is no better example than Hellfire Jack Royston. These days, the commanding officer of the 12th Light Horse Regiment is still in temporary command of the 3rd Brigade, which has come to resemble him, constantly on the move, looking for action. Hellfire Jack is very fond of horses, far fonder than they are of him when he is in his rhythm. They reckon Hellfire goes through nags like other blokes go through cigarettes, and he had even set the light horse record by going through 20 in a day. Banjo Patterson thus is understandably cautious when this G-Bung Polo Club level rider approaches him in much the same manner as Chinese junks make for port at the first smell of a typhoon. For on this day, Royston rides up unannounced and casually tells Patterson he just happened to be passing. I just dropped in to pick out a few horses for my brigade, he says. That is forbidden, Banjo replies. Well, at any rate, I'll pick out a horse for myself. You must do the best you can to keep him for me. Looking around the compound, Royston points to one magnificent black horse. My horses get a lot of work the Brigadier General allows carefully. And that fellow will just suit me. All right, sir. Just this one. Just this once. But just like Mr Toad in The Wind in the Willows, one new black beauty is never enough, and even as he trots away, Banjo all but sets his watch for what he knows will happen next. Sure enough, cometh the dawn, cometh the Royston, his eyes flickering back and forth at the fresh mob of horses that has arrived in the night. Yes, General? There's no harm in my looking at him, he tells Banjo. I'm always up early, so I thought I'd ride round to have a look at him. Of course, sir. Quite normal and expected to come on successive days. But this time, you'll be leaving without a new one. For once, Royston is not too upset. After they both gaze for a few moments upon the vision splendid, on the sunlit plain extended, 
Royston gallops off on his old horse. More bloody training. Does the bloke know we've already been at war for some time out here? The bloke does. But at Allenby's behest, a new training regime is instituted, designed so that his troops and their horses will be at peak condition for what he intends is to come. Now many squadron, regiment and brigade exercises are undertaken, together with dozens of tighter reconnaissance patrols, with a hidden aim, to get the Turks used to seeing the troops of the British Empire moving around in front of them. Sometimes reconnaissances in force, with large bodies of mounted troopers, without automatically assuming that there is a major attack coming their way. For both mounted and unmounted forces, the principal terrain they cover is in the ten-mile-wide swathe of land that lies before the Turkish line, so that the attackers can be thoroughly familiar with the landscape and its challenges, while the defenders won't panic when they see forces moving about there. All good? Right. Now, Allenby orders them to do all of the above at night. You must be so familiar with the territory you will be moving through that you can do it blindfolded, which will be essentially the case when we actually get to the nights before Z-Day, as the day of attack is known in military parlance. As time goes by, and both the troopers and the whalers get tougher and more resilient, the test becomes to see if they can do it all with progressively less water. Yesterday, you had the normal allotment of two gallons to survive. Today, we are cutting that by 75% and you can do it on four pints. Similarly, a horse needs 10 gallons. Can they still operate on just three gallons? Both the troopers and their steeds must be toughened to continue operating, even when half mad with thirst. It is hard and no mistake. The sun, one of Guy Hayden's sergeants, records in his diary, took its toll, burning its way like white-hot iron into every pore of the skin, seemingly scorching the backbone until that member felt as if it was being charred by a slow fire. There seems to be only one living thing not bothered by the searing heat. The flies, which in the east are never reckoned in less than billions, fought viciously for a landing place on man and beast. The one redeeming point of these patrols was the skirmishes with enemy cavalry, the surprise attacks against their outposts, and the more extensive reconnaissances into enemy territory to ascertain their strength and to secure topographical surveys for the coming decisive assault. Inevitably, there are skirmishes with patrols of Turkish cavalry, and sometimes prisoners are taken. Some of the enemy's steeds are impressive, but not all. In a party of 20 Turkish cavalry captured by a light horse patrol, one officer will note, their horses were so miserably thin, one of our men hung his hat on one's rump, thereby greatly annoying the owner. Meanwhile, General Allenby works to ensure that the troops are getting all possible support from the air. For he is equally insistent that the Royal Air Force must have more planes, more pilots, and begin to establish air supremacy against the Deutsche Luftstreitkräfte, German Flying Corps, with their albatrosses and rumplers continually spying on, dropping bombs on, and harassing the troops of the British Empire. Urgent cables are sent to Whitehall, and promises extracted. Our own pilots, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Preston, the commander, Royal Artillery of the Australian Mounted Division, would recount of the time before Allenby, starved alike of aeroplanes and of materials for repairs, gingerly manoeuvring their antiquated and rickety machines, fought gallantly but hopelessly against the fast Taubers and Fokkers of the German airmen, and day by day the pitiful list of casualties that might have been so easily avoided grew longer. Those days must stop. Key appointments? Allenby moves quickly. While a little put out initially by Chevelle's diffidence and independent spirit, there is no way around the fact that this column, with its ability to get troopers en masse to attack the enemy from positions they never expected, is not only the most powerful force Allenby has, but the Australian general is far and away the best performed of his officers, with a record of success unmatched by anyone else. 
And so Allenby confirms Chevelle as General Officer commanding the newly named and restructured Desert Mounted Corps. And today, he becomes the first Australian in history to command a corps, which is, by the by, historically, the largest force of mounted men ever assembled. The 20th Corps will be commanded by General Chetwood, while the 21st Corps will be under General Sir Edward Bulfon. All three corps will be under the direct control of Allenby himself. For this battle, it will be Chetwood's 20th Corps and Chevelle's Desert Mounted Corps who will be tasked with attacking Beersheba, while it will be the job of the 21st Corps to make the enemy think that the real attack is coming on Gaza once more by positioning themselves just to the south and proceeding as if they are about to launch. Each corps will have a squadron of 15 or so RFC planes at their disposal, as will GHQ, and those squadrons are in the process of being established. Chetwood is gracious enough to drop Chevelle a formal note on his confirmation as commander of the Desert Mounted Corps. You and I have worked together in the greatest harmony. We have together helped to write a small page of history. I shall always be proud of having such a fine body of men under my command as your Anzac mounted troops, and grateful to you for the able way in which you have led them. I cannot say how much I envy you the command of the largest body of mounted men ever under one hand. It is my own trade, but fate has willed it otherwise. As for fate, Allenby is still dealing with its cruelty penning another mournful letter to his wife, both in private torment that is observed in public. My sweetheart, I had a message from the Sharif of Mecca, king of the Hejaz in Arabia, to express his sorrow and sympathy on the death of my son. The Sharif of Mecca is in revolt against the Turks and is our ally. His followers are harrying the Turks on the Aleppo-Medina railway and are causing them a whole lot of trouble. My dear love, Edward. Flying Officer Lieutenant Alaric Boer is as pleased as he has ever been in his life. It is not just that he now has his wings, but much more excitingly, he has been officially posted to his unit, the Royal Flying Corps Squadron No. 113, which had been formed on the 1st of August in Ismailia to counter the Turks in the Sinai. He is one of the first pilots to be posted to the squadron, whose primary role will be observation of the enemy. After journeying through France and Italy on trains, Flight Lieutenant Bohr, he still can't quite believe he has his pilot's wings, the badge he proudly wears on his left breast, is even now boarding the HMT Aragon in Taranto on the underside of Italy's boot, together with his commanding officer, Major Horace Haycock, and they will soon be on their way to Alexandria. A few days of shipboard life will give him the thing he most lacks, precious time to write to family and friends, and more particularly, his dear fiancée waiting for him in Perth, Ida Rawlings, who has been so shattered by the death of her brother Frank at the Battle of the Neck, and worries about Alaric incessantly. Please, dear God, let Alaric be spared. A part of Boer's excitement is the exotic nature of the land they are travelling to. As one who had won the Ancient History Prize at the University of Melbourne, he knows better than most just how extraordinary the contours of conflict are in this land. But none of the ancient conquerors could even have dreamed of the wonder of having the world flow beneath them in flight. What was once Greek myth is now Egyptian reality, as Alaric will soon be soaring beneath the sun, wary not of wax melting, but the flak flying from Turks, Arabs or Germans so far below. It is not as if there is not some time for a little fun, as various units of the light horse are rotated back from the front, just safely south of Gaza. The thing about this particular settlement is that it has enough water to sustain large numbers of both British and Australian troops at once. They are curious coves, these English, most of them with plums in their mouths and an unseemly obsession with keeping their uniforms clean and their salutes sharp. Some of them, however, are not bad bastards and they suggest an excellent way to pass the time. 
Why not a test match between us? The best cricket players of Imperial Yeomanry against the best players of the Australian Light Horse. Yes, why bloody not? What these colonials don't know is that the reason the English have a curious confidence about them is that they have a secret weapon in their ranks. None other than J.W.H.T. Douglas, who had, before the war, been the captain of the English cricket team that won the 1911-1912 Ashes series. Douglas is a notable batsman in his own right, with an amazing 26 first-class centuries to his credit, a fact completely ignored by the Australian crowds, who have always delighted in referring to him, in honour of his initials, as Johnny Won't Hit Today. In fact, the pugnacious, if proper and dapper, Johnny can hit, in at least two senses, having also won a gold in boxing in the 1908 Olympics. Douglas is now revealed to be playing, and as you might expect, the coming test match causes huge interest and excitement among both the English and Australian troopers. On the day of the big match, all those who are not on guard duty are in the crowd to cheer their teams on. The wicket, the account of a padre there on the day will go, was formed of sandy soil and tibbon, grainless chaff, and was as well watered as any Adelaide wicket and rolled with a full water drum. The Australian team enters the field dressed in their khaki breeches with their regulation sky-blue shirts, singlets and canvas shoes, while those born and raised beneath the Southern Cross gasp to see the English side emerge in perfect whites with creases on the bloody seams. In the bloody desert? What are they going to produce next? Ice cream? The explanation is that by pure happenstance, all the best players of the selected English side also proved to be among the echelon of the most senior officers, meaning they all have orderlies to help procure the said clothing and put creases in them. And so let us play. After winning the toss, Australia bats first. Is it their fault they are all bowled out for just 57 runs? It is not. They have given it their all. It is like that poem from your famous poet, Banjo Patterson, Saltbush Bill, about the stoush between the English new chum and the Australian drover. So the new chum rode to the homestead straight and told them a story grand of the desperate fight that he fought that day with the king of the overland, and the tale went home to the public schools of the pluck of the English swell, how the drover fought for his very life, but blood in the end must tell. I mean... Just 57 runs? It surely must be very embarrassing to you Australians. Why, with J.W.H.T. Douglas in our ranks, we should be able to knock that out in a few overs. Yes, you're probably right, but you might as well pad up anyway, yes? And in short order, the man himself strides out to the crease in the manner of one who has seen a few pitches in his time, single-handedly beaten many teams from all over the world, and will be happy to do the honours again today. And yes, of course the diggers from the cheap seats are crying out, Johnny won't hit today! But Johnny himself is clearly convinced he certainly will hit today. Well, we'll see about that. Douglas is accompanied to the crease by George Kekowich, an old Etonian, like they don't make them any more, a now noted batsman for the famed City of London Yeomanry Unit, known as the Rough Riders. Now, who is this rather athletic figure standing at the northern end of the field on this stinking hot day, waiting for the Australian captain to throw him the ball to begin the opening over? Whoever he is, he did not bat. But now, as J.W.H.T. Douglas takes strike for the opening ball of the innings, gazing confidently around the field settings to decide where he will hit his first boundary, the bowler runs in with a distinctive, long, loping run. His first ball makes a hissing sound as it strikes the pitch and careers past the Englishman's bat in a tenth of a flash. J.W.H.T. Douglas straightens up. There is only one man he has faced in his career able to put a ball down with that kind of speed. And he looks closer at the fast bowler who has just delivered it it is one and the same, Tibby Cotter. In fact, he is known as Terracotta to the English test side and English cricket fans, 
The Australians in the crowd roar the joke and the English jokingly boo. Now this will be something. And for the next ball, at least, Douglas knows what he is dealing with and this time takes strike with intent and fierce concentration. Again, Cotter unleashes. Again, there is a tss and a small puff of dust where the searing ball strikes the pitch. This time, there is the crack of ball on wood. Alas, for Johnny didn't hit today, it is his middle stump. Gone for a duck. Worse still for the yeomanry, the rest of the English team do little better, with Tibby steaming in from the pyramid end of the ground, and the entire English lineup is gone for four. Bloody Moses Almighty! Just four runs! One of them a bye! Tibby, who has finished with the figures of nine for two, is chaired from the field by the cheering Australians, and even the English players roar their regard. It will be something they can tell their grandchildren, a boast in bars for years to come. They were once skittled by that typhoon of terror, that gazelle of grace known as Tibby. For just a few precious hours, the war has stopped and the curious game of cricket has once again united the men of one empire, safe on a foreign field, before they collectively fight another empire altogether. General Allenby as is his wont, is everywhere at once, so omnipresent and so rumbling and grumbling, so long and strong and damaging to those who displease him that a shorthand develops between the senior officers of the units under his command, BBA, short for Bloody Bulls About. He is coming your way like a cyclone of change, so batten down the hatches and save what you can. From camps to HQs to hospitals, from workshops to depots to rest camps and back again, his first action upon his return from his reconnaissance is to confirm and organise the move of General HQ to the front at Palestine, a little north of Rafa, at a camp set up at Umm el Kelab. Early August 1917, Hellfire Jack, not Flash. It is Hellfire Jack all over and all up, and none are surprised. Not for him a plebeian finish by bullet or shrapnel. Of course, for him, it has to be something unheard of, something you can barely believe. For, you see, the general has heard a lot of talk about poison gas, consisting of chlorine and phosgene, and what a threat it might be to his men. What can he do to protect them? Well, he reasons, surely the most important thing is to be able to recognise the smell of it by having just a little sniff himself. Alarmed, his senior staff officers try to talk him out of it, but Royston insists. It seems like a good idea at the time. Alas, while the aphorism might still hold that it is an ill wind that blows no one any good, this particularly ill wind, bearing chlorine and phosgene gas, makes hellfire wheeze, cough, nearly suffocate and suddenly blue. The result, Banjo Patterson will recount, was that I found him in a hospital, a badly shaken man, passing green urine, and ordered away for long leave. Thus one of the most picturesque personalities in the British Army dropped out of active service. Still, at least the enlisted men now know not to sniff poison gas on purpose. To fill the vacancy as commanding officer of 3rd Brigade, General Chevelle offers the position to Colonel William Grant, the 47-year-old Queenslander, warmly known to his men as Old Bill, who had been commanding the 11th Light Horse Regiment with great effect. Often impulsive, Grant is one of those officers who is always spoiling for a battle, who wants to fight, wants to get into them. Just quietly, he's like a sane version of Hellfire Jack. Chevelle regards him as a thruster, just the kind of officer you need at the front, and Grant is also regarded as a notable bushman, particularly for his capacity to steer by the stars on long night marches. Grant accepts the offer to be the permanent brigadier general of the 4th Light Horse Brigade. Allenby receives countless missives, but rarely with such glorious term of address as this one. Heroic leader and dispenser of victory, General Allenby, may God keep him. Ah, it must be from Prince Faisal never one for beginning with Dear Sir, Allenby reads on. 
I have received your honoured letter dated the 14th of October with great respect. God has made victory the ally of the armies of right. Faisal tactfully does not clarify to which God he refers. We were much gratified by your statement that you were using every endeavour to supply the deficiencies of our army. I have informed Major Lawrence of some of our necessities, the lack of which is still the cause of the arrest of our movement. General of the Northern Armies. There is no signature, simply the seal of Faisal. Well, the heroic leader Allenby can ensure necessities will be delivered to you. Victories, however, you will have to supply on your own. While direct reconnaissance of Beersheba is difficult, it is at least possible. Bit by bit, based on such recces, mixed with aerial observation, intelligence from the prisoners they occasionally capture, together with some careful bribes to Bedouins who have encampments nearby, a clear portrait of Beersheba emerges with, brush by brush, stroke by stroke, each piece of information lending colour, light and shade to give a good picture of what awaits. Lying at the foot of the Judean hills to the east, the town bakes on the northern bank of Wadi Sabah, which, when the rain comes, flows into Wadi Gaza. The town boasts an army barracks, several warehouses, a small hospital, water tower, railway station, with a road leading to Gaza on the Turkish side of their defensive span, a square of houses, and even a German beer garden for the handful of German officers and soldiers based there. The buildings are sturdy, made of stone with red-tiled roofs, and would be able to withstand bullets if it came down to a last stand. The local population beyond the troops are mostly Arabs, with a sprinkling of Christian and Jewish colonists. The most beautiful, ancient-looking building in Beersheba is one of the newest, the Great Mosque, built in 1900 and placed deliberately between Gaza and Hebron, a holy way station between the two important towns. As with a hospital, houses of worship are off-limits to either attack or tactics, but they are noted nonetheless. All up, intelligence reports conclude that Beersheba is defended by about 4,000 soldiers manning two concentric fortified rings, an outer series of well-constructed trenches six feet deep and four feet wide, and barbed wire which traces, as one report will describe it, a semicircle along the high ground northwest, west and southwest of the town, at an average distance of 7,000 yards from the town. On the northeast, east and southeast, the outer defences are not continuous, but consisted of a series of strong posts. The inner defensive line runs around the actual perimeter of the town, with the only real break in the north, which the Turks control in any case but the rest consists mostly of redoubts with intersecting zones of fire from commanding positions, glorified, fortified rubble and low stacks of sandbags. Should the outer ring be breached, this line will be the Turks' fallback position. As near as can be determined, the line to the east of the town does not have rolls of barbed wire, on the grounds that no one would be crazy enough to attack from that direction. There is no cover, and Tel El Saba stands as a scything sentinel, ready to cut down all who approach. The Turks have half a dozen machine guns and no artillery actually on the hill. Very well then. Chetwood's 20th Corps will start the attack from the west after the artillery barrage has softened the most outer of the Turks' defensive lines. Once the infantry has secured that outer line, the artillery can be brought forward. It is further decided that the 20th Corps needn't sacrifice lives unnecessarily by forcing the inner perimeter too. No, simply by getting close enough to direct fire on that line and threatening to break it, they will be able to pin the bulk of the Beersheba garrison down, allowing Chevelle's Desert Mounted Corps to attack from the east and northeast against what will hopefully be a much thinner line of defenders and this will help to keep the 20th Corps fresh for the fighting that will take place in ensuing days after Beersheba is taken. Tel El Saba shall be subdued by the New Zealanders and the 1st Australian Light Horse Brigade. Thereafter, 
The Desert Mounted Corps will complete the defeat of the enemy's left flank and threaten his left rear and the line of retreat of his army. In the meantime, water remains the problem. This is a key part of the reconnaissance, for unless the attackers can find sufficient wells in the area for the men and their horses, it will be impossible to move them into position and sustain them for the length of time necessary to pull the action off. Allenby himself personally questions local Arabs on this point, favouring the older ones. What wells, known by the locals as the Tears of Allah, were once used when you were young? Where were they? For through British engineering, dry wells can be made fluid again. Old memories are tapped and new markings made on old maps. Preliminary reconnaissance shows the only sure supply found so far is at Bir el Siani, otherwise known as Asani, some miles, too many miles, southwest of Beersheba, and which therefore is too far away to use as a launching point for the major attack though it may still serve as a staging post. Allenby pours over the maps, together with information provided by Adam Smith's historical geography of the Holy Land, ignoring the footnotes about who begat who and which smiting took place where. Instead, he focuses on finding the remnants of ancient towns to the south and southwest of Beersheba, many of them with beer in their name, the Arabic word for well which means the people of biblical times must have lived off wells, which should still have water today. General Allenby is eager that the timing of the attack be made as soon as September. That should give them the time to resolve remaining problems, and if they can just crack the line by then, that will still give them several weeks before the rains of November come. Cloudbursts, which will make the suddenly flooding wadis and low-lying flats impassable, Thus, this likely dry progress might be just enough to follow up on the breakthrough and fight the 65 miles to get all the way to Jerusalem. As it happens, Allenby has an even more ancient book which already tells him something of the winter rains in the biblical lands, starting with Deuteronomy 11.14. Then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, your new wine, and your oil. The danger in delay is that with every week that passes, the Turks will be continuing to strengthen their line. Right now, it has been estimated that the two armies the Ottomans have in the Gaza-Beersheba line, the 7th and 8th armies, have around 40,000 rifles, 260 artillery pieces, and 200 machine guns at their disposal. What will it be if the attackers wait another six weeks or so? And yet, as some of his staff point out to General Allenby, making such an advance so long before the rains would inevitably mean the logistics of supplying water to their army in the badlands, the dry lands north of Gaza, would be more than problematic. They might well be insuperable. Well, so be it. Risks must be run if they are to be in the running to win. The most important thing of all is to make sure that Beersheba does fall before they roll up the line to Gaza, and then they can worry about the dash to Jerusalem. So, what date will we make Z-Day? There is much toing and froing, but soon enough a circle is placed around the last week of October, with the exact date to be decided once they know more on movement of men and munitions. No matter the date, however, Zedar will be the crack of dawn. Chapter 9. Positions, everyone. But Chevelle could have no misgivings about the capacity of his troops. In the sheer quality of their grand young manhood, in their brigade and regimental leadership, in their experience gained over 18 months hard fighting in all sorts of rough conditions, the men of the 1st and 2nd Light Horse Brigades and the New Zealand Brigade were then without peer among mounted troops engaged anywhere in the war. Official historian Henry Gullett, the Australian Imperial Force in Sinai and Palestine, 1914 to 1918. 10th of September, 1917. Hejaz. Passing strange. Another day, another attack. 
And this one is a big one for Lawrence of Arabia and his growing band of Arabs, some 80 of them for this attack, plus two ring-ins who have recently joined, two army instructors who had been sent Lawrence's way by the British Army to help train the Arabs in Lewis guns and the Stokes mortar. The Lewis gun instructor is Sergeant Charles Reginald Yells from Kapunda in South Australia. Described by Lawrence as an Australian long, thin and sinuous, his supple body lounging in unmilitary curves, his hard face, arched eyebrows and predatory nose set off the peculiarly Australian air of reckless willingness and capacity to do something very soon. After giving a month's instruction, Yells and the English instructor, Sergeant Walter Brook, had asked if they could stay on with Lawrence, who had readily agreed, only pointing out that life would be tough on camels, frequently without water, often under attack, and living cheek by jowl by towel with the Arabs, and that, as they did not speak the language, if anything goes wrong with me, you will be in a tender position. I'm looking for just this strangeness of life, Yells had replied and Sergeant Brooke had expressed a similar sentiment. Are you too sure? This life is not for everyone. For years, we lived anyhow with one another in the naked desert, Lawrence will write of their existence, under the indifferent heaven. By day, the hot sun fermented us, and we were dizzied by the beating wind. At night, we were stained by dew and shamed into pettiness by the innumerable silences of stars. And that is the good part. The hard part is taking on an empire determined to kill them. Yes, they are sure, which is why both men are beside him now, with Lewis guns and Stokes mortar in hand, as yonder train comes into view. Two locomotives hauling ten carriages packed with Turkish soldiers, their rifles bristling from the windows, their machine guns from sandbag nests on the roof, approaching the very bridge they have wired with explosive. Lawrence waits until the second engine is above the explosive and drops his arm as the signal to the Arab to press the plunger. There followed a terrific roar, and the line vanished from sight behind a spouting column of black dust and smoke a hundred feet high and wide. Out of the black smoke came shattering crashes and long, loud, metallic clangings of ripped steel with many lumps of iron and plate while one entire wheel of a locomotive whirled up suddenly, black, out of the cloud against the sky, and sailed musically over our heads to fall slowly and heavily into the desert behind. Except for the flight of these, there succeeded a deathly silence, with no cry of men or rifle shot, as the now grey mist of the explosion drifted from the line towards us and over our ridge until it was lost in the hills. But now the chattering of heavy rifle and machine gun fire comes, and as the smoke clears, it reveals that the locomotives have left the tracks and the carriages, and the Turks are being completely riddled with fire. Sergeant Yells is firing his Lewis with the best of them. They are, after all, his pupils, with devastating effect, while Sergeant Brooke is lobbing his mortar bombs right among the devastated Turks. As the survivors try to flee from the killing zone, Yells is without mercy. The sergeant grimly traversed with drum after drum till the open sand was littered with bodies. Mushagraf, the Shirari boy behind the second gun, saw the battle over, threw aside his weapon with a yell, and dashed down at speed with his rifle to join the others who were beginning, like wild beasts, to tear open the carriages and fall to plunder. It had taken nearly ten minutes. It is nothing less than a catastrophe for the Turks, as the wound in their side represented by Lawrence's activities in the Hejaz desert now sheds blood as never before. They will have to put ever more men there to try and bring the situation under control, which, alas, must inevitably leave them more exposed elsewhere. Lawrence's experience with the Australians, meanwhile, deepens, and whatever else he will say about them, it will never be that they lack confidence or aggression. In his celebrated book, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, Lawrence will fondly recall an episode a week after blowing up the bridge in the Hejaz Desert, having breakfast with the South Australian pilot, Lieutenant Ross Smith, and some of his comrades, when a German plane comes over. Smith looks up, looks back down at his plate of sausages, and reluctantly but carefully puts them aside. 
He jumps into his Bristol fighter in the company of his observer, and as Lawrence will describe it, climbed like a cat up into the sky, closely followed by another Australian pilot and his observer. It is at this point that a third Australian pilot, whose own observer is not handy, looks to Lawrence of Arabia in the manner of, well, are you going to come too? The Englishman leaves him in no doubt. No, I was not going to air fight, Lawrence will write. No matter what cast I lost with the pilot, he was an Australian of a race delighting in additional risks, not an Arab to whose gallery I must play. Never mind. Captain Ross Smith's Vickers gun begins to chatter, and he brings the German plane down in flames, whereupon he lands, walks back to his spot, and after taking up his sausages, happily reports to Lawrence that they are still hot. For Smith, it appears to be the only thing worth remarking on, and he finishes his breakfast with nary a word, washing it down with coffee. Until half an hour later, well, I'll be damned. Another enemy plane comes over, the German pilot likely looking for his lost companion. Off the two Australian pilots go again, with their observers, and this time it is the other pilot who does the honours, before they return once more. September 1917, east of Gaza. Water, water, here and there. Hush. Snatches of singing. Coming this way. Long way to go. The sweetest girl I know. Closer still, and it all comes clear. It is some men of the 12th Australian Light Horse Regiment in the early stages of a patrol singing together as out to the Far East purple shadows thrown by the Judean hills are slowly topped by needles of molten flame as the sun rises. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly, farewell, Leicester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. Quiet. All quiet now getting too close to Turkish lines. It's time to get to the business at hand. In the first instance, Lieutenant Guy Hayden and his patrol are looking for Turkish patrols and are hungry for action. Far more importantly, they are here to look for wells in the area between Asani and Kalasa that can be resuscitated. The places in the desert able to provide enough water to sustain an entire army as it moves through the desert to attack Beersheba. It is gruelling work going from ancient place to ancient place, but at least they are not starting from scratch. In fact, Hayden is working from a map first provided by the Palestine Exploration Fund, a quaint British society dating back to 1865, devoted to the study of the biblical lands. The foundation of this map had been drawn by three intrepid British officers, including one hard-rising lieutenant of the time, H. H. Kitchener, the former British Secretary of State for War. As if that is not enough pedigree, the map had been improved upon by one T. E. Lawrence back in the time before the war when he was making his way as an academic in the field of archaeology. It is comprehensive and includes everything from towns to stone buildings, forts, ruins, passable roads, rivers, large wadi beds and wells and the Palestine Exploration Fund insists that Kalasa once had wells enough to sustain a population of 60,000, so they must be substantial. The key is to locate those wells now and determine just how usable they are or might be. Hayden himself takes down highly detailed notes on each site they get to. Bir el Asani, fresh, 196,000 gallons per day, well waterhole and springs. El Auseji, dry, three cisterns, 44,000 capacity. Bir Asluj, 80,000 gallons daily, three wells, one blocked up, etc., etc. On sites particularly close to the Turkish lines, they leave their horses behind and move in the moonlight on foot, trying to get a better field for the lie of the land in the semi-darkness and just where the enemy might have sentries posted. Upon their return, if not for her white coronet, midnight at midnight would be practically invisible, but Guy Hayden sees her now, 
returning to his beloved horse and settling for the night. In the heat of the morning they go again, moving through this infernal country of sun-blasted and blistered desert, crisscrossed by wadis, peppered with rocks and rocky outcrops, and indeed a long, long way from Tipperary, or anywhere else for that matter. Hereabouts, temperatures would get to 115 degrees in the shade on a moderate day. As it is, the only shade provided comes from that which you bring with you in the form of your horses, and all the troopers can do to gain some respite is position their horses between them and the sun as they take their scanty daytime meals. Other patrols head out on similar water-finding excursions, and the New Zealand field troop is particularly successful, finding the old wells at both Kalasa and Asluj, both of them within Kui of Beersheba, no more than 15 miles right away. Yes, the Turks have blown the wells up, but in a strange kind of way, wells are a little like cockroaches. They can't really be definitively destroyed, only damaged. The most extraordinary thing? When they look at the 100-foot-deep wells closely, all the top stones have profound grooves in them, some of them inches deep, from nigh on 20 centuries of first the Romans and then the Bedouins, camel and goat hair ropes, rubbing into the stone as they lower their buckets. The army engineers estimate that those wells can be repaired, as it is mostly a matter of digging them out and securing their walls so they don't fall in. Intelligence also now reveals that Beersheba likely has about 5,000 soldiers of, get this, the Ottoman Empire's Third Corps, comprising the 27th Infantry Division and the 3rd Cavalry Division defending it. The same ones many of the light horse fought at Gallipoli. The ones who had gunned down the light horse at countless battles and filled the graveyards with 9,000 Australian dead? Yes, one and the same. It is something right there to summon the blood and stiffen the sinew of the Australian light horse. The chance to take on those Turks once more is not beyond their wildest dreams, but smack centre of them. The Third Corps at Beersheba is armed with rifles, together with about 60 machine guns and a couple of dozen field guns, most of which are dug in west, south and east of the town. Along the entire Turkish front, from there to Gaza, is another 40,000 rifles, and the key will be to ensure that the enemy cannot flood Beersheba with support for fear of a breakthrough elsewhere. The corps commander is Colonel Ismet, a seasoned officer whose fine aquiline nose, slight build and pleasant presence belies a powerful military mind. He served as chief of staff of Turkey's second army at Gallipoli. It had been on that blood-drenched peninsula he had first come to an appreciation of how hard and hardy are the Australians and New Zealanders, but he is confident that if it ever came to it, as reinforcements to Gaza most likely, he and his men shall beat them once more. Another day and another detailed deception is planned. The officers meeting today have subterfuge as second nature. Their schemes are occasionally indulged by orthodox command, but mostly rebuffed with a roll of the eyes. But this gathering, led by Major Richard Meinertzhagen of Intelligence, is particularly important. It is to refine ways in which they can make the Turks believe that they are intent on attacking anywhere bar Beersheba. Ideally, they must make the enemy believe they will be attacking Gaza for the third time, requiring the Ottoman Empire's strongest forces to be positioned there. But how? Colour and movement? Artillery and aggression? Ideas are put forth, rejected or grasped, and if the latter, then they are refined. Slowly, a comprehensive plan is formed, whereby the Turk will be made to think that Gaza will shortly be under siege, even beyond the fact that the 21st Corps will be in position just to the south of Gaza, as if they are about to launch, all while tens of thousands of troopers are to be whisked away to attack Beersheba. And yes, it will clearly not be possible to move that many men towards Beersheba without at least some of them being spotted from the air and by scouts on the ground. 
but the Turks must be convinced that those troops are the faint. The best thing? None of the artillery attacks on Gaza will be wasted, as they will simply weaken the ancient city for the time when, a few days after Beersheba hopefully falls, it will genuinely be under attack once more, but from all directions. In such meetings, General Chevelle is consulted on all matters concerning him, and Allenby's confidence in him grows when it comes to mastering detail, offering fresh ideas, and being clearly in command of the situation. Very quietly, though. Walking on pretty thin ice with all these people, Chevelle writes to his wife after one particularly high-powered meeting with other corps commanders and their chiefs of staff, when I look around the room and realise I'm absolutely the only one who is not in the British regular army and cannot put PSC after my name, that's past staff college, a qualification anyone who aspires to high command in the Brit army should have, I do get a bit of funk on, lest I should be caught out in a want of knowledge on some technical point. So far, so good. In the Levant, these biblical lands, one may be awoken by a wail of prayer, but today you can hear the moan of an Australian as the cursed sound of Ravalli rings out over the desert camp just outside the village of Abbasan el Kabir, some five miles southeast of Khan Yunus. As ever, the sound brings instant activity as the men of the Twelfth Light Horse rise, stretch, curse, scratch, smoke, feed their horses and get ready for a quick breakfast before heading out for training and, of course, the grooming of the horses. The fact that the horses are twice as well groomed as their Australian riders and probably have better table manners is a tribute to the care and priorities of their keepers. But this morning proves to be one of those mornings. The whistle blows and they gather around the regimental sergeant major, who again bellows the traditional greeting, Shun, standing at Shun in the sun, they are told that orders have come from divisional headquarters. We are moving out as soon as everyone is ready. And you better be ready before the RSM is, which will be in less than two shakes past 15 minutes from now. Scramble! And scramble they do. It is all part of the extra training that General Allenby is insisting on. Each unit must become ever more accomplished at reacting quickly to surprise orders, operations with no notice, and meeting up with other units at a specific rendezvous in the desert far away where inspections will take place. As the time has gone on, these distances have become ever further away as the ability of them and their steeds to travel far on little water is also tested and lifted. Go! Hayden and his comrades become a blur of movement, every pack whacked on the back of their steeds all but instantly. No instructions needed, no distraction permitted. Each piece of kit is hastily gathered and grasped, each man treating the drill as though it is battle joined, the rattle of each rifle checked, loaded and locked before a nod is given. One order, yelled, and they are soon on their way, as staff officers measure on their watches just how long it takes for them to turn out. The 12th Regiment is good but there is not a unit in the British forces as good as one of the horse artillery batteries, which turned out complete in full marching order with all its ammunition, rations and stores correct in 11 minutes from the receipt of the order. Why are they doing all this? That, of course, is not explained. But overall, the sense builds that they are working their way towards another big stunt, some way of cracking the Turkish nut, and Jacko's melon in the process. When they start doing all of the above at night, some clue is provided as to what is in store. General Allenby is relieved and pleased in equal measure. The War Cabinet has approved his scheme to pursue the Chetwood plan to attack the enemy around Beersheba. From London, Prime Minister Lloyd George sends a cable. Strike the Turk as hard as possible in the coming autumn or winter. Yes, Prime Minister. Allenby reads it at his new HQ at Umm il Kalab, a little to the north of Rafa and just 18 miles from Gaza. 
It is a flimsy HQ, made of quickly fabricated wooden huts and tents, ready to move forward at short notice as soon as an advance is made. Of course, the heat, dust storms and flies make things dashed uncomfortable, but Allenby doesn't care. The first principle of leadership is to understand the lie of the land you are fighting in and the condition of your men and the enemy, and make decisions accordingly. How on earth could that be done from Cairo? No, here is best. Not that Allenby himself spends too much time in the camp. The general can't stand still. He is everywhere, always, and the arrival of Allenby, just ahead of the large cloud of dust caused by his tin Lizzie rattling along the sandy tracks, inevitably lifts morale among the frontline troops and confirms there is a real change in the wind. I could not count the times I have shaken hands with Allenby, a light horse brigade major said a few months after the new leader's arrival. Between the canal and Gaza, I never set eyes on Murray. The troopers agree, with one of them noting of the banishment of the brass from the Savoy. It was impossible that they could apply to the campaign that intimate knowledge and fierce energy, which are as essential to victory as sagacity and valour in the field. The army applauded the move. The new C&C breakfasted with us today, one officer notes, on the 10th of July. He is a smart-looking man and looks as if he would stand no nonsense. General Chevelle continues the run of good impressions. He gets out among the troops, looks in at hospitals, has a cheery word for the wounded. Best of all, he does not have a fit if he's not saluted, which appeals to the Australians. For his part, Allenby himself is uplifted by what he sees. There is a lot about the Australian character, the lack of fuss, the desire to bloody well get on with it, that appeals to the English general. And just as he has been impressed by them on the Western Front, so is he impressed by what he sees here. Put simply, the Australian light horse are the best troopers he has, and he intends to throw them in the cauldron where they will be the most use. And for his part, Allenby makes a good impression on the Australians. Just for the fact that he is here, up front with them, and not sending orders from 200 miles away. This is not to say he is a good bastard, but at the very least, he seems to be that rarest of all things, a pommy bastard who is not a bad bastard. And Allenby's HQ? It is portable, humble, and has an excellent view of the sand. It is a far cry from Cairo and within Kui of all he commands. Allenby describes the detachable digs to his wife in a letter home on this day in August. My camp is on a ridge four miles from the sea. Between me and the sea are two to three miles of sand dunes. The site is clean and healthy, breezy and comparatively cool. I am in a big wooden hut with a bedroom, sitting room and bathroom. The windows are covered with netting. I am in sandy soil, 300 feet above sea level. There are very few flies, and I think no mosquitoes. Even the mosquitoes think twice before attacking Allenby. Remarkably, Allenby is increasingly open to fresh ideas, anything that can heighten the chances of success, especially when it comes to subterfuge, which is why he has summoned one brilliant officer on his general staff, Lieutenant Colonel John Belgrave. Belgrave is one of the hush-hush boys from that newly established unit of military intelligence, MI7. Allenby wishes this bright young fellow to expand on an interesting memorandum he has authored. Well, Belgrave, let's have it. Belgrave, an ascetic, no-nonsense kind of man who prefers facts to flourish, sets out this outrageous but tempting idea once more. It's all about confusing the enemy. We need to contrive a way whereby one of our officers will drop a haversack filled with false plans and proof that the real target is Gaza. Belgrave is reinforced in the notion by, who else, Major Richard Meinertshagen. As Belgrave and Meinertshagen both know, to win a war in this part of the world you need ruses, subterfuges and cunning, not just more men better manoeuvred. In this field, Meinertshagen is in his element, with no less than Lawrence of Arabia noting of him that the mercurial major 
took as blithe a pleasure in deceiving his enemy or friend by some unscrupulous jest. But can this haversack jest be pulled off convincingly? Allenby is not sure, but he is sure these two wily men can pull it off if anyone can. Permission granted. Tell no one. To support the ruse, a series of false radio messages will go out after the haversack is dropped on a network known to be monitored by the Turks, ordering troops to move towards Gaza. Small boats will be massed on the shore south of Gaza, just as if that amphibious assault is soon to take place. And to complete the facade, on the morning of the actual attack on Beersheba, the Royal Navy will open a massive fusillade on Gaza, just as if it was the prelude to an attack. It is unorthodox, it is unpredictable, but it is also bloody exciting. September 1917, Ismailia, Egypt. Boers have wings. For Alaric Boer, life is good. After completing his training in England, he arrived at his posting, number 113 Squadron, a unit based in Ismailia on the Egypt-Sinai border and formed only months before. The number 113 Squadron is devoted to reconnaissance, working out the enemy's trench placements, artillery battery positions and troop dispositions, as well as transport, cooperating with the army to provide their aerial needs and sometimes offensive action, otherwise known as dropping handheld bombs on the enemy. Occasionally, they use their 303 forward-firing Vickers gun and 303 Lewis gun from the rear cockpit if they are engaged in dogfights with German Taubers. Boer is flying the Royal Aircraft Factory RE-8, Reconnaissance Experimental 8, a British two-seat biplane with a 140-horsepower V-12 engine designed for reconnaissance and as a bomber. True, the RE-8 can be a bit on the tricky side of things, a rather lumbering bother to fly, notoriously giving no warning before they stall, not to mention having such a propensity to burn on crashing that some pilots insist on flying with an empty reserve tank. But... But Boer does not complain. He is simply thrilled to have my wings, as he explains to his parents, and is eager to do whatever is necessary to help the war effort, not least because the sooner they can win this war, the sooner he can get home to his Ida and marry her. September 1917. Um el-Kalab. Z marks the plot. Syria. Intelligence tells Allenby that the Ottoman Empire has a formidable five divisions placed there in a strategic reserve, which could relatively easily be deployed to Gaza if it comes under attack. How to keep them there? More subterfuge must be worth a try. Perhaps a phantom invasion. Can we not make it appear that an amphibious force is being prepared to launch? Camps and tents will be erected on Cyprus, and many bogus wireless messages sent to collectively give the enemy the impression that troops are to be landed in his rear north of Gaza. As with the Haversack proposal, it is Lieutenant Colonel John Belgrave of Intelligence who takes the lead, sending a memorandum to General Allenby to this effect. Allenby endorses Belgrave's plan and duly informs the senior naval officer, Egypt, Rear Admiral Thomas Jackson, that, in connection with my projected operations, I am making arrangements to induce the enemy to fear an operation in the Bay of Alexandretta on the Syrian coast west of Aleppo. Forenoon, 20th September, 1917. Remount Depot, Moaskar, Egypt. Snap 2. Here, at the remount service at Moaskar, near Ismailia, a vast complex of horse corrals and stables featuring 700 horses, 300 mules and six officers who also resemble mules in behaviour and disposition, the soldier handlers are not much given to standing to attention or snapping off salutes. The whole place is casual by nature and a man is judged by his ability to break in brumbies, not by shiny boots or strict observations of military protocol. But this is different. 
It is the commanding officer of the entire Egyptian expeditionary force, General Edmund Allenby himself, who has swung by on a quick visit. Major Banjo Patterson had come to know General Allenby a couple of decades back in the Boer War. In fact, he had been present one dark night when Allenby had arrived in the wee hours to break up a drinking session of officers and take command of a cavalry squadron of New South Wales lancers. Daylight revealed him as a sinewy, well-set-up man, Patterson's account recorded, at least six feet high and broad and strong as a London policeman. In facial contour, he bore a distinct resemblance to Kitchener, but he smiled often and his expression was free from the secret sorrow that always seemed to harry Kitchener's soul. He set about the reorganisation of the squadron with the enthusiasm of a scientist experimenting with a new sort of beetle. And ever and always, he had a particular style about him. He neither bounced nor bullied anybody, but explained things as carefully as a schoolteacher dealing with a lot of children. He got hold of the blacksmiths and told them that he would give them a certain time to get all the horses properly shod, and that then he would come round to see that they had done it. He stirred up the cooks, and if he found any dirty utensils on an inspection, the man responsible was for it. He made the young officers take a pride in their troops. If a man was slovenly dressed or a horse not properly cleaned, trouble always followed. In sum, soldiering is a trade, and Allenby had learnt it. The work was just a routine to him, and he betrayed no more worry or irritability than a mechanic repairing a motor car. Of course, the men growled at his strictness, but before long the new major began to get things into shape. The fact that Allenby had gone on to accomplish great things with those New South Wales lancers had seen him continue to rise in his soldiering trade. Patterson had roughly followed his fortune since and been pleased to hear he had taken over the Egyptian expeditionary force and thrilled that he has now, with typical attention to overseeing every moving part of the force he commands, come to visit them at the remount depot. But can that be him? It is not just that General Allenby is, of course, a lot older. It is that he is so much slimmer and grimmer. The loss of weight has come from the privations of the war in France, together with the Egyptian heat, which can melt the flesh of a big man in a matter of weeks, if not days. His grimness comes from the devastating actions he has been involved in on the Western Front and their consequences, the grief he has known. In one of his first actions there, when the Germans had attacked with all its forces at Mons in Belgium, Allenby had dismounted his cavalry and thrown them into the fighting line in a vain effort to stop the German rush. Many of his own men had been killed for no result, just as his own son, Banjo knows, had been recently killed. And so Patterson looks his old friend up and down. Where he had been granite before, he was steel now a great lonely figure of a man riding silently in front of an obviously terrified staff. He seemed quite glad to recognise a friend in me. The great soldier is delighted to see the great poet, and they talk of old times like the young men they once were. Banjo teases Allenby that he has all his staff properly terrified. Allenby is amused but remarks, I'm afraid I'm becoming very hard to get on with. I want to get this war over and if anything goes wrong, I lose my temper and cut loose on them. I haven't got down to finding fault with the remount service yet, but it seems to me that your Australian horses are a common hairy-legged lot compared to the horses that your lances brought to South Africa. These two Boer War survivors finish their conversation a little awkwardly with a salute, one of them now a commander-in-chief, the other a jumped-up horse handler, but two chums still. Carry on, General Allenby, as you were. General Allenby will do just that, pausing first to drop into the cookhouse to go to the most significant source of both good and bad morale in any army, the chief cook. Noting this particular cook, an old fellow, also bears the ribbons of the Boer War, General Allenby asks first about his service before inquiring about his family and now gets to it. What sort of food are you serving up? They get stew, sir, and plum pudding. 
the old fellow says, and any amount of tin fruit. The chow in this war, sir, is government house compared to what we got in South Africa. An amused Allenby nods approvingly. Very good, replies Allenby. Very good. I'm glad to hear it. Carry on. Again, a small pause. Now, the general says, hauling out his notebook, I want to go to the 10th Division. This proves to be something of a problem, as someone has misplaced the division, and it is not quite apparent to anyone where exactly it is right now, which sees a brave staff officer step forward and say, If you please, sir, only for Allenby to cut him short. I don't want to hear you talk, he says icily. I've enough men following me about to staff the whole British army, and you can't find me a division. Another even braver staff officer, steps forward. Just at present, sir, I don't want to hear you talk either. I want to get on with his inspection. Where's this division? Finally, they know it must be around here somewhere. The missing division is located, and Allenby indeed heads off, leaving Banjo behind, along with a very good impression, none more so than on the chief cook. That's the sort of general for me, he says. A bloke that knows his own mind. My word, he did roar up them staff officers a treat. Do them good. Take some of the flashness out of them. As Banjo chronicles it, the word spreads, powered by one question and one answer. What's this new bloke like? He's the sort of bloke that when he tells you to do a thing, you know you'd better get up and do it. He's the boss, this cove. And the boss is pleased with how things are shaping up. I was out yesterday to about six miles south of Bathsheba, Allenby will write to his wife after his next reconnaissance sortie. We were covered by a cavalry reconnaissance, but the Turks were very quiet. A few of them were to be seen in their entrenched line, but they were not shooting. No, they are waiting for Allenby's next move. Mid-September 1917, Cyprus, new boy in town. Having put in place the essence of his plan for the Haversack ruse, Lieutenant Colonel John Belgrave has been appointed by General Allenby as General Staff Officer in Cyprus, the highest-ranking British officer there, and intends to move quickly. Right, men, the first thing we need to do is make some dummies. What? 26th of September, 1917. Gaza Beersheba Line. A German thunderbolt. Jamel Pasha seethes. On this day, Enver Pasha orders the dissolution of the Ottoman Fourth Army, which Jamel has commanded in Syria and Palestine since the end of 1914. Broken into parts, the troops will be redistributed. Enver Pasha hands over military command of Syria and Iraq to the newly formed Yildirim Group, a Turkish name meaning Thunderbolt, under the command of a foreigner. Jamel Pasha will now be answering to the ex-chief of staff of the German army, General Falkenhayn. The Yildirim Group is a German-led initiative with an HQ staff consisting of 65 German officers and just nine Turkish officers. For Jamel Pasha, it is not just the dishonour of his military command being handed over to a German who has never laid a foot in the region. It is the disaster he foresees in General Falkenhayn's plan to switch the Ottoman forces on the gaza Beersheba line from a defensive to an offensive footing, to launch an attack that will supposedly push the British out of the desert and into the sea for good. Jamal Pasha had fought the proposition, penning strongly worded protests to Enver Pasha in Constantinople. I would like to clarify that I cannot consent to Falkenhayn who drove a nail into the Germans in Verdun, driving another nail into us in Sinai. I regard it as the strongest Vatasislik treason to tolerate an action that would be a disaster for the salvation of the fatherland. But for Enver Pasha, the promise of German military assistance to the depleted Ottoman forces is too strong, and Falkenhayn is given free reign. General Mustafa Kemal, whose 3rd Corps troops from his 7th Army are that day marching into their positions on the left flank of the Ottoman line, headquartered in the desert town of Beersheba, also protests. If a German commander is in a position to order Turks to die by the thousands, 
it is obvious that the interests of the state are not being watched. Himself underwhelmed at such presumption and subordination, Enver Pasha orders Mustafa Kemal to return to Constantinople forthwith for a stern word, leaving his men in Palestine. General Kress von Kressenstein, newly promoted and installed in the HQ of the Ottoman 8th Army in the Palestinian village of Huj, 10 miles northeast of Gaza, has no objections to the recent shake-up. In fact, the monocled one is decidedly pleased, not to mention that his own request to the Ottoman government for reinforcements has just been granted. To go with the three divisions he currently commands in the 8th Army, another two divisions will soon be sent his way. With their arrival, he will be able to hold the Gaza-Beersheba line with two corps, with another corps in reserve north of Gaza, some 40,000 men in all. And yet the ranking officers of the Yildirim group are worried. What are the British up to? Turkish intelligence tells them there has been an enormous amount of radio traffic from Cyprus lately, and a lot of it seems to be about the arrival of new forces. Could it be that they are about to launch an amphibious landing at Iskenderun on the Turkish coast, or on the Syrian coast? Several things point to it. Local informers are telling them that the Royal Navy has laid out many buoys in a Cypriot harbour, as if a large flotilla is about to arrive, even as large troop camps are being constructed in various locations on the island. Local contractors report that the British have put in orders for enormous amounts of provisions, and intercepted radio messages indicate that a large force will soon arrive. The Turks had even got a leaked cable from GHQ in Cairo to Cyprus to confirm that everything was underway to accommodate the large force about to arrive. Can it be? Are the British about to launch? To get more information, a Turkish plane is dispatched to fly over Cyprus, and it is true that there are no obvious signs either of a massive build-up of troops or the assembly of a fleet, but can the Turkish command be sure? It cannot. Whatever else, it is obvious that until things can be more certain, it would be unwise for the Turks to move any of their five divisions in Syria anywhere, let alone down to Gaza, as some have pushed for. After much discussion, the Turkish High Command sends just two divisions to base themselves north of Gaza, ready to move if it comes under attack, and one brigade to bolster Beersheba on the off chance that the British try to make an attack from the fundamentally waterless wasteland that abuts it. 10th of October 1917, Tel El Farah ruse-coloured spectacle. It is a strange thing to be preparing for battle in the shade of a structure built eight centuries before, but such is the case for the Australians, who are now conducting their patrols in the occasional blessed shade cast by Tel El Fara, referred to by the men as El Favo, which, as one trooper describes it, is a man-made mountain, a relic of crusader days, At the time that the English zealots were seeking to retake the Holy Land, the fort was constructed at one of the key crossing points of the Wadi Gaza on the southern side, and it still roughly stands as a monumental reminder to those seeking to do the same now. The locals have been through this before, and many times at that. The tents at this Australian camp are laid out on the desert floor in neat rows, with many areas set aside for where the horses can be tethered, watered and fed. Between the tents, troopers of the Australian light horse are making their way back and forth on business unknown, occasionally stepping aside for open-top armoured cars bearing officers, who they even occasionally, very occasionally, salute. On the edge of the encampment, Some squadrons are doing training drills in the heat. It is a singularly hot and dusty afternoon, but no one comments on it for a very simple reason. It would be like saying the Nullarbor looks dry or the Pacific looks wet. Every afternoon hereabouts is hot and dusty in some manner, so there is just no point. And now look. At one of the horse staging areas, a group of Australian light horse troopers are saddling their horses, clearly going out on patrol. First, over the horse's back, goes the blanket they will be using tonight when they bivouac out there. 
Now comes the military saddle, specially designed to give the horse maximum comfort for the great weight to be borne, as the saddle also has many hooks and scabbards from which will hang the rider's rations, ammunition, rifle, greatcoat, ground sheet, mess tin and canvas water bucket, plus a nose bag with the horse's grain ration for the day and all the rest, including spare horseshoes with nails and hammer. Once the saddle is on and the horse has an extra bandolier of ammunition hung around its neck and everyone is ready, now and only now do they all mount to head out from their tent camp at Khan Yunus to keep tabs on Jacko. Nominally, they are working out where he is and just what might be the best way to knock his block off. On this day, as it happens, a stranger has joined them, a tall and dapper sort of fellow, nudging forty, with eyes that look straight through you and lips that you'd reckon were born sealed. He is clearly not disposed to have a chat, and they are under strict orders not to ask. He's from intelligence, so in the meantime, do not ask questions. Allow him to accompany you until you get close to Turkish lines. He will do the rest. And sure enough, just as the first signs of the Turk become apparent, the lone rider gives them a dismissive wave and heads off on his own. A bit queer how the bloke rides, yes. He's a good rider, but he does it in the classic manner they have already noted of Englishmen who have been raised chasing foxes and playing polo, always leaning forward, never relaxed. But there you go. And there he goes. See ya, sport. In the searing sunlight, the sole rider, it is Major Richard Meinertshagen, keeps moving further out into no man's land, that narrow band of desert that lies between the two roughly positioned armies, to where Turkish patrols have been most recently sighted, up around the Turkish outpost of El Girher. Every nerve in Meinertshagen is a jangle, his eyes squinting through the shimmering haze for some sign of the Turks, his ears straining for the clink of horses' trappings against the light rustling of the desert wind. One attempt has already been made to do this a month before by Meinertshagen's colleague, Captain Arthur Neat, but it seems likely he simply hadn't got close enough to the Turks. This time, there can be no room for... room. He must get close. Occasionally, he pauses to have a swig from his canteen. At last, at last... He hears it. It is the distant crack of rifle shots, and sure enough, small spurts of sand arise around him. Exactly as he had hoped for, he is under fire. Wheeling his horse about in the direction whence he has come, he gallops away with the Turks in full pursuit. But even the Turks must be careful, for they have been caught this way before. The closer the horseman gets to his own British lines, the more likely the pursuers will be ambushed by a patrol. And yet, once they stop the pursuit after a mile or so, the strangest thing. For now the horseman stops also, removes his Lee Enfield rifle from his horse's saddle scabbard and fires off a shot at them from a distance of some 600 yards. Enraged, this is not meant to be the way these things go, the Turks wheel their horses back in his direction and fire back. Now is my chance, Meinertshagen will recount, and in my effort to mount, I loosened my haversack, field glasses, water bottle, dropped my rifle, previously stained with some fresh blood from my horse, and in fact did everything to make them believe I was hit and that my flight was disorderly. They had now approached close enough, and I made off, dropping the haversack. Slumped in his saddle, even while galloping away, the horseman still manages a quick look behind him and is satisfied to see the Turkish patrol has stopped and is retrieving what he has dropped. I now went like the wind for home and soon gave them the slip, well satisfied with what I had done and that my deception had been successful. Inshallah. Even once returned safely to GHQ, back in British lines, however, the ruse goes on, and a message is quickly dispatched to other HQs in the area. Urgent. While on reconnaissance patrol in no man's land this afternoon, about X-21 D-4-3, a staff officer lost a haversack. 
If found, the haversack is to be returned forthwith to General Headquarters without being opened or its contents examined in any way. Patrols are sent out with orders to attempt to retrieve the haversack and, effectively, the Turks are so advised when a wireless message is transmitted in a code which it is known the enemy has broken. Determined efforts are to be made tonight by troops in the sector involved to recover the lost haversack mentioned in GRO number 102. Oh, Lord! Captain Ferdinand Tui will chronicle his own remarks when Meinertshagen returns to Corps GHQ that evening at Rafa. Here's one of these GHQ wallers. Nice business this afternoon. Can't go out on patrol without giving the whole show away to the Turks. Found your blessed haversack yet? I should say not. Not likely to either. The old Turk's fairly gloating over it by now. Contained the whole plan of the push, I suppose. The fellow who dropped it ought to be strung up. Prancing about up to the Turk with operation orders in his pocket. The desert-mounted core brass apparently feels the same, and in a cipher they know the Turks have, are quick to cable General Allenby bitterly complaining about the staff officer's stupidity and negligence. Meinertshagen is delighted to be so stupid. The Australian troopers call them furfies, wild rumours that can usually be traced back to any two diggers at Furfies Farm water carts, originally manufactured at Shepparton, Victoria, and now in service at Gallipoli, where, between guzzling gulps, blokes would tell each other the most outrageous things and the tales would take on such a life of their own, they soon became gospel. But is this a furphy or dinkum? There's talk, mate, we're going to attack Beersheba, way out in the desert. Trooper Morrie Evans is one who documents the talk, most particularly after a large supply dump is moved to the east, out in the broad direction of the remote Turkish outpost. It is, I think, an attempt to take Beersheba. We shall probably go round the back somewhere while the infantry make a frontal attack. Further indication that something is stirring is the increased air support, with number 113 squadron newly arrived to join the other three Royal Flying Corps of the Palestine Brigade. 12th of October 1917, Huj, near Tel el-Sharia, fool me thrice. In his large tent at Ottoman 8th Army HQ at Huj, north of the Gaza-Beersheba line, General Kress von Kressenstein now closely examines the contents of the haversack which have made their way to him. At first glance, through his monocle, they appear to be an amazing treasure trove of important papers, some of which are stamped secret, and including one which maintains there will be no attack on Turkish lines for at least three months, and maybe longer, and even then it will be framed against Gaza. Kress von Kressenstein had been among those who suspected that perhaps Beersheba might have been the next target. However, according to this document, a landing will be made on the coast nearby, with a landing on the coast north of Gaza being launched at the same time as the French land on the Syrian coast to fight Ottoman forces there. Most wonderfully, there is the rudiments of a cipher code which will allow the Turks and Germans to decode more of the British communications they are intercepting. And there is still more. As recorded by a Turkish officer, Colonel Hösner, a pricey of the contents includes The attack on the Sinai front has been delayed and will commence during the season of the heaviest rains, the beginning of the year. The main attack will be made on the western part of the Gaza front. Points of debouchement will be prepared close to the right flank of the Gaza position before the attack. Night attacks and the employment of tanks are being considered. All very well, but is it genuine? Not all the senior Turkish officers are so convinced. As to the senior German officer, though Kress thought the papers may have been intentionally dropped, Colonel Hersner will record he was inclined to believe in their genuineness. For one thing, von Kressenstein always believed in an attack on Gaza, and this confirmed his opinion. In addition, he considered it probable that the British would not send us wrong information in this way. 
so they must prepare accordingly, with the bulk of their forces to be positioned to defend Gaza. Just quietly, though, despite Kress von Kressenstein's decision, there remains consternation in senior Turkish ranks. Hersner recording, Von Kress was suspicious and astonished. He was most anxious to believe that the papers were genuine and was continually asking other people's opinion. Are they perhaps falling into a trap? The German intelligence officers are having the same debate. An officer by the name of Schiller is particularly suspicious. With Teutonic thoroughness, he examines each item in the haversack meticulously. A map, an electric torch, a flask, a map, sandwiches and the key item, a wallet and a notebook combined. Schiller pours over the scribbled pages of scrawled pencil, stops and laughs. It is so elaborately casual, so temptingly real. It's a forgery, a clever one, an impudent one, but to him, a clear fake. It's a con. But just as they relax, a breathless signals officer appears. The English have just sent out a wireless message saying that every effort is to be made tonight to recover a haversack that was lost this afternoon in no man's land. What's that? says Schiller, wanting there to be no mistake. The message is repeated, and a copy of the message placed before him. Now, as far as anyone knows, the British have no clue that the Germans have broken their code. Schiller paces the room, trying to work out how things actually lie. It can't be. It can't be, he mutters. If these notes are genuine, all our reckoning has been wrong, that they're going to attack Gaza first, not at Beersheba. Sir, it seems that way. I'm certain they're faked, Schiller still declares, albeit this time with a hint of uncertainty. The information in the notebook goes directly contrary to both the movements and the intelligence gained from prisoners taken only yesterday, and also against wireless transmissions that have been intercepted. But perhaps those transmissions have been intended to be intercepted. Just which ones are bluffs and which ones are true? And what if the prisoners captured have been unwitting decoys? The notes captured today clearly state that Allenby will be in Cairo until the 4th of November, which means there could be no major attack before that time, as it is unthinkable that a leader like Allenby would not be present for the attack. Returning to the notebook, Schiller finds a letter wrapped around a photo. It is from the man's wife, dated from many months before, and has been unfolded, read, refolded, and tucked away so many times that the paper at the folds is fraying. To fake intelligence, to fake briefings, that is something any officer in this room can do. But to fake emotion, to show sentiment tipping over into sentimentality, well, that is the hardest thing of all. And as he reads the letter with its short, clipped British emotions giving way to joy as the woman writes of the tiny hands and feet of her little baby, he finds himself moved. It ends with that embarrassed mix of politeness and love that only the British possess. Goodbye, my darling. Nurse says I must not tire myself by writing too much, so no more now, but I will write again soon, and then it will be a longer letter than this. Take care of your precious self. All my love and many kisses. Your loving wife, Mary. Baby sends a kiss to Daddy. The last sentence is jammed against the side of the paper, a final thought crammed into the tiny space left. It seems very real. And if this letter is real, well, that haversack has just saved an empire for the Turks. Now the other documents found are reread including one that bears a complaint from a British commander noting the impossibility of maintaining a large force anywhere near Beersheba because of the water shortage. A map with arrows pointed at the intended artillery targets at Gaza and details of a minor operation by mounted troops on Beersheba intended to fool the Turks into thinking the major attack will go in there instead of Gaza. So, it is to be Gaza. Chapter 10. Well Met by Moonlight Nine-tenths of tactics are certain and taught in books, but the irrational tenth is like the kingfisher flashing across the pool 
and that is the test of generals. T. E. Lawrence, Seven Pillars of Wisdom The fierce individualism with which he fought Turks, Arabs and English staff officers lay close to the heart of the Australian light horseman. He lived under few restraints and was equally careless of man, God and nature. Yet he stood by his own standards firmly, remaining brave in battle, loyal to his mates, generous to the Turks and pledged to his king and country. Probably his kind will not be seen again, for the conditions of war and peace and romance that produced him have almost entirely disappeared. Bill Gamage, The Broken Years 15th of October 1917, Beersheba, ripe for the sack. It is not quite that Kress von Kressenstein is a man on a mission, but he has certainly come with great purpose. There has been talk of abandoning Beersheba, of shortening the defensive line. The German officer will not have it and needs the Turkish leadership in place to understand the importance of holding on to the town at all costs. His instructions to the newly appointed commander of the Third Corps on site, Colonel Ismet, are clear. Beersheba can be subjected to an attack of one or two infantry brigades and cavalry from the west and from the south of the Wadi Saba. It is impossible that large mounted forces will operate from east of Beersheba. But be ready to move at a moment's notice to wherever the attack does come. If Beersheba is not attacked and heavy fighting occurs on other points of the line, it is probable that the Beersheba group will receive orders to advance in the general direction of Abu Ghalion. Yes, General. For all that, Colonel Ismet does not quite share the Germans' confidence and will actually give orders that all the wells and key buildings in Beersheba be wired with dynamite, with one central switchboard, so that if the worst does come to the worst and the British overwhelm them, they can at least blow the whole town up and deny them water. Norris, here, sir. Nile, here, sir. O'Leary. O'Leary? Christ. Thomas O'Leary, again. Ever and always, for the officers of the 4th Australian Light Horse Regiment, there is a problem with this Queensland jackaroo. Yes, he is a superb horseman and fine soldier, and yes, when the heat is on, he never lets you down, but when the drink is on, he always gulps it down. There are wells in this land that currently contain far less liquid than O'Leary, and with a skinful, he's always a problem, usually resulting in charges like insubordination, being absent without leave, and more particularly, drunkenness. Even in these parts, O'Leary can sniff out alcohol at a distance of 20 miles in the middle of a campson. And so it proves on this day, for sure enough, when O'Leary is found by the military police, he is as drunk as three lords and promptly arrested. Look, under any other circumstance, O'Leary would assume the usual position, back in the stockade. On this occasion, however, it is decided to merely fine him ten shillings. The Queenslander remains a good trooper when he is sober, or at least not that drunk, and the way things feel right now, it seems likely that the army will need every good soldier they can get into their saddles. Fellow Australians, over the course of this war to date, Flight Lieutenant Alaric Bohr has occasionally come across his countrymen, but not often. And even then, when on the Western Front, there had been little time to talk, while at Salonika, the only other Australians had been nurses, and they were always too frantic to converse at length. But now, well, now he and his fellow pilots of the 113 Squadron, based at an aerodrome at Weli Sheikh Nuran, between Rafa and Shalal, and ten miles due south of Gaza, are flying side by side with the number one Australian squadron. And there is, at last, some time in the mess to compare notes. A particular joy, apart from catching up on the news from home, where the second conscription referendum put up by Prime Minister Billy Hughes will take place just before Christmas, is talking to men like Lieutenant Ross Smith, who, just like Alaric, has also spent a lot of time in the trenches, only to now find his true métier, flying. 
In the meantime, the orders for all of them and all units of the Royal Flying Corps and the Australian Flying Corps east of the Suez, known as the Palestine Brigade, are clear. The skies must be kept clear of German planes along the entire line from Gaza to Beersheba, or at least the Germans must be kept so high that they won't see much. Under no circumstances can they be allowed to fly over the spots where our troops are secreted in wadis and settlements and report back to their commanders that a huge movement of men and munitions is afoot. Equally, and this is more particularly a task for Boer and his RE8 and their key role as observers, they must themselves be on the lookout for enemy troop dispositions in one area in particular, Beersheba. The key is to try and look without being seen to do so, rather like getting an eyeful of a beautiful woman on a Melbourne tram. And speaking of women, inevitably in the officers' mess, stories emerge of romantic escapades back home and while training in England. Alaric listens with interest and a grin, but does not join in. He is serious about Ida Rawlings, which makes her his only romantic pursuit in years. She is not an escapade, so he has no stories to trade. 18th of October, 1917. Moaska near Ismailia. Horse and carriage. Certainly there is movement at the station, men and material being piled onto trains leaving Kantara and heading for the front that currently rests near Rafa, each carriage stuffed with core and cargo. But Major Banjo Patterson has a better idea. With nearly 200 horses due to be delivered to Rafa and 50 riders to take them, why not ride them there? Yes, that's it. It will help give the horses condition, and for Banjo Patterson personally, it will be a pleasure to get away from the depot, see some more of the country and get close to the front lines once more, see some old friends and get more meat for verse or some anecdotal artillery for articles. At the very least, the trip will provide fodder for his letters, for it is, Patterson writes to his wife, a godsend to get away as we have had two years real solid depot work, seeing nothing and hearing a lot of what other people were doing. And I think one gets very, very sick of it. We started for the first day to Kantara on the canal and thence, by very easy stages, up through the desert to Palestine, the same road that Napoleon and Moses went in the olden days. Little council maintenance seems to have been done on the road since that time, But the ride is enjoyable nonetheless, some feeling a strange kinship with soldiers dead for 3,500 years. The Australians travel as those ancients of days gone by once did, and the hold of history cannot but be felt. Day after day they push towards the front, with the traffic on rail and track getting ever thicker the nearer they get, and all of Kantara, Romani, Bir el Abd and Bir el Arish providing the water and feed they need before heading off at the crack of dawn each day as they get closer to Rafa and the Holy Land. So it's shift, boys, shift, for there isn't the slightest doubt that we've got to make a shift to the stations further out. With the pack horse running after, for he follows like a dog, we must strike across the country at the old jig-jog. Beyond everything else, it is a chance to see how the war is progressing, the way it is working, the nitty-gritty of the rough and tumble, and this includes seeing up close the famed Ismailia Flying Depot, where the Royal Flying Corps seems busy as never before with endless planes heavily laden with bombs taking off and heading towards the Turkish lines. Banjo and his troop happen to be passing when a squadron of eight planes take off in quick succession, only for one of them to return a short time later with mechanical difficulties. The pilot has only just brought his aircraft to a halt before he jumps out and rushes towards Major Patterson, the closest officer to his own rank of lieutenant. Come on, let us have a drink, he exhorts the Australian poet. I want a drink badly. It seems to me a bit early to have a drink, Patterson replies evenly. When a man has just landed a machine, he says, with a dozen perfectly good live bombs under it, believe me, he wants a drink. Fair point. While his men struggle to find the water they need for their 150 horses, 
Clancy of the Overflow would not be feeling at home in these dry and dusty parts, Patterson heads off to the base's wet canteen to have a drink with the shaken pilot. When he has settled a little, the poet even dares ask him, what might have happened if you had landed the machine roughly and started those bombs off? The answer is indescribable catastrophe, as of course all 12 bombs would have exploded and it wouldn't just have been him and his observer killed. These flying boys are being tested, Patterson will note, and they are coming through it in great shape. Yes, they might need a stiff drink to maintain that shape now and again, but none blames them. They only join the toast. 22nd of October, 1917. Tel El Fada. Where there's a well, there's a way. Something is up. No one in Eon Idris's 5th Light Horse Regiment is quite sure what it is, only that they have to ride through the night to the small settlement of Asani, about 16 miles southwest of Beersheba and 8 miles from their starting point of Tel El Farah, and then set to on an important task. They must both mount a guard on those fixing the wells previously blown in by German engineers and help them before moving on to Kalasa and Asluj, where they must do the same thing. How exactly are the sweating troopers to fix the blown-in wells? Well, mate, it starts with a pick and shovel, and I don't call them diggers for nothing. In short order, all of Idris's 5th Light Horse Regiment are split into working parties and set to in following the orders of the Australian and New Zealand field engineers who are directing the works. Under the hot sun, the Australians of the 2nd Light Horse Brigade are digging ever deeper, removing the sand and the ancient stones, endeavouring to restore the old walls as they go. It entails the filling of a lot of buckets attached to ropes, which are then hauled up and the engineers are to build a rough support to hold up those walls as they go. But at least there are many willing workers and they can do it in intense shifts. The reward, by which time they are no less than a hundred feet deep, is first moist soil, and as they dig deeper, water at last. With that accomplished, the engineers provide the finishing touches, installing engine-driven pumps, pipes, and rows of canvas horse troughs. Clearly, there needs to be enough water to sate an army, because that is what will be coming through. For now, word spreads, first as whispers, then as rumours and soon confirmed. We know the whole plan of fight. Chetwoods, we believe. The Turkish left flank must be turned by the Desert Mounted Corps and the Anzacs must take Beersheba on the first day. There can be only one day, for after that there will be no water. Oh, those boys of the Western Front can sit in a trench for yonks and play football at Christmas. But out in the East, you get a day. Dash and a flash and bash are the tactics. Understood? Oh, and after we smash through Beersheba, we'll continue right through to behind Gaza. In short, there will be merry hell to pay. Dion Idris is not alone in thinking, I wonder if my luck will pull me through. For it is luck, there's no doubt of that. It might be easier to fight this war as the Arabs do, not just believing in fate, but knowing it is unchangeable. Why worry about whether you die? It has already been decided. Back to digging the wells. Asani, of course, looks just as it did when they started, an ancient sea of dusty dwellings, part faded fortress, part reminder of the antiquity that will remain long after you are dust. It is still a cross between a place that looks as though it is about to be excavated or has just been blown up but at least it now has water. We are on duty day and night here, Idris faithfully reports to his diary. We do not mind. We realise this water digging is the most critical part of operations and... And wait. The word comes through. BBA. The bull is about. No, the bull is here. General Allenby is indeed still doing what he does remarkably well, storming about making sure that everyone is being as energetic as himself in the pursuit of victory. We thought quite a lot of him coming out all this distance and seeing with his own eyes what is being done, Idris records. Carry on. 
and they do before moving with Allenby himself to Asluj, a small settlement featuring a picturesque mosque which, with the other snow-white buildings, looked very striking in the brilliant full moonlight. The difference between the hell of the day and the beauty of the night in this desert continues to fascinate. It has been a long haul through dust and heat, but at last Major Banjo Patterson and his 50 rouseabouts are able to deliver their fresh horses to their intended destination, just back from the front at Rafa. The recording official at Rafa notes with astonishment that the distance and heavy nature of the route really did no harm whatsoever to them, rather the reverse as the animals actually improved. Extraordinary fellow, Patterson. I doubt he'd suit the office, but damn fine in the desert. As to Banjo and his men, with their mission accomplished, they find it hard not to suddenly feel like stagehands behind the scenes in a play of great moment. Everywhere they look, all is hustle and bustle, prep and priming, a hive of great activity, a sense of grand and momentous things afoot. An expedition is to begin, an Allenby expedition, that has been in the works for four months or so and is about to play out. One man who does make time for the great poet is Lieutenant Colonel George MacArthur Onslow, the commander of the 7th Light Horse Regiment, and he is almost giddy with enthusiasm as he speaks to Banjo. He can't be specific, you understand, but it is the general who has inspired him, Allenby. It's all or nothing with us, he tells Banjo. We have to smash right through the Turks and come out on the other side. I think Julius Caesar would have funked trying it. I came, I saw, I funked. What gamble is being taken here? A big one. If we get held up, says MacArthur Onslow, We'll be out of provisions and horse feed in a couple of days, and then you can write to me at Constantinople. But don't worry, we'll get through all right. MacArthur Onslow is clear about what, precisely, will get them through. We're more frightened of Allenby behind us than we are of the Turks in front, he laughs, full of infectious confidence. We'll go through Palestine, looking over our shoulders, and the first thing you'll know, we'll be in Damascus. Damascus? It is the first that Banjo has heard of such an ambition. And yet the fact that the Ottoman Empire will likely still have something to say about that comes just moments later, as from out of the clear blue sky comes a swooping German plane diving low to drop bombs and being greeted by roaring British anti-aircraft guns for his trouble, combining to send up a wall of flak to fly through if he dares. Banjo is more than a little concerned, did you know bombs are falling within 100 yards of us? While MacArthur Onslow barely blinks. Welcome to the front. It is a lot different from handing out horses in the back blocks. Either way, there is little time to tarry, and both men must away. 26th of October 1917. Gaza. Crafty Brits fleet afoot. What are the British up to now? for in his command headquarters at Gaza, German commander Major Ernst Tiller receives a singularly troubling report. A fleet of small boats has been spotted just off Deir el Bala, five miles southwest of Gaza. Taking his field glasses in hand, Major Tiller can now see them himself. The crafts are departing, and as they do so, the British naval guns begin from afar, attacking the mouth of the Hesse. In short order, a large column of British troops, surely just dropped by the small craft, are spotted marching on the beach in the general direction of Gaza. Something is afoot, apart from those troops. Another attack on Gaza? It seems more than likely, and Major Tiller is quick to place all of his troops on high alert. Back in the day, the biblical day, Manna from heaven was the food sent from God that rained on the starving Israelites as they made their exodus from Egypt and headed for the promised land. So having sustenance fall from the sky around here is not unprecedented, just unusual. So what is dropping today? Smokes? Yes, it is tobacco, now falling on the Turkish soldiers at Beersheba and indeed all along their fortified line to Gaza. 
It makes manna look like muck, fags falling from the father above. For those who have long ago run out of tobacco, it is a sign from God to renew the habit, smoke them if you got them, and wonder about where they came from as you puff. Some troops have seen precisely where. It had been the most extraordinary thing. No sooner had a British plane gone overhead in the early evening and they had all ducked for cover, fearing their bombs, pouches of tobacco had suddenly dropped from the skies to land all around their trenches and redoubts. Clearly a supply drop for British troops gone blessedly wrong and the booty is theirs. Cautiously at first, but now with some enthusiasm, the more nicotine starved of them are soon puffing away. The flavour, true, seems a bit different, maybe a lot different, but maybe this is just the way of English tobacco. The main thing is, it is tobacco and does offer some relief. Back at headquarters, not long afterwards, Major Meinertshagen receives his report. The mission has been accomplished, and the pouches of tobacco, lightly blended with opium, have been successfully dropped on the Turkish soldiers. Ideally, they will develop a taste for them and smoke them continually, becoming ever more befuddled. It is true that General Allenby had initially been against the plan, likening it to poisoning the enemy, which is simply not done. But Meinertshagen manages to circumvent the edict, firmly believing the ends would justify the means. If you look at it the right way, it's giving aid, comfort and a lovely sense of well-being to the enemy. If it saves just one British soldier, as a glassy-eyed Turk misses his mark, it will have been worth it. And there is every chance of that, as he will later observe, after sampling the opium-laden cigarettes, that they were indeed strong. The effect was sublime, complete abandonment, all energy gone, lovely dreams, and complete inability to act or think. 26th of October 1917. Tel El Farah. Hodgson's Choice. Something is up. The commanding officer of the Australian Mounted Division, Major General Henry Hodgson, has sent out an order to all troops. The divisional commander directs that steps be taken at once to have the points of all bayonets sharpened by the armourers. No one is quite sure what it bodes, but it seems fairly certain the general is not having them do it so they can better cut potatoes. And there is more. It is to be noticed that the country is built for mounted action, whereas any dismounted attack is handicapped for want of cover. The divisional commander hopes that all brigades will endeavour to profit by their knowledge of this fact. The whispers become louder and soon have an exultant ring. The stunt? It's Beersheba? Privately, despite his careful order, General Hodson clearly thinks there might be the opportunity to mount a charge, something he has long advocated. In fact, after a few small successful charges by the light horse in the Levant, Hodgson had recently requested his men be issued with swords, a request which had been denied, hence his push for them having at least sharpened bayonets. Now, his directive insists, when it comes to mounted men holding their bayonet in the air, It is important to bear in mind that it has the same moral effect as a sword, as it glitters in the sun, and the difference could not be detected by the enemy. 27th of October 1917. Gaza. Boom crash opera. As dawn breaks, it is so still you could light a match in the gentle fog, and it would not even flicker or flutter, let alone blow out which is handy, for this fog covers hollows that conceal the mass of artillery batteries that have been moved forward in the night. The Germans call such conditions windstill, and up from those hollows in the morning, butterflies are prancing, birds are singing, and the Bedouins in their camps are rising to tend their camels. Clearly, another demonic day in the searing sun beckons. But now it happens. Precisely as planned, at dawn, Some 218 guns of the 21st Corps, which have been moved forward in the night to do the honours, roar in thunderous unison. Gaza is under attack. The guns belch. The artillery crews move in a blur of highly choreographed catastrophe, and the shells land all over Gaza, 
Alimunta and surrounds, in what, with the 15,000 rounds of heavy shells alone to come over the next four days, the official history will record as the heaviest shelling carried out in the course of the war outside the European theatres. The observers of the British Army have the satisfaction of seeing plumes of dust arise from, first, the ramparts of Gaza, and soon artillery batteries in the town, followed by the railway siding just to the north, and then the ammunition dumps. This barrage, over the next four days, will surely confirm the Turkish view that they have been right to concentrate their troops at Gaza. In weary Gaza itself, which has been under siege from one empire or another for 3,000 years or so, all is dust, destruction and a little death, as residents get to their basements, soldiers to their bunkers and artillery crews to their guns, as counter-battery fire must quickly get underway. It is alarming but not surprising, just as Allenby had hoped. Colonel Kress von Kressenstein is quickly apprised of the news and can at last relax. The British have returned to Gaza for another beating. 2 p.m., 28th of October 1917, Tel El Farah, dogleg and doggerel. Men, bring it in tight. Colonel Murray Boucher wants a word. As one, the troopers of the 4th Light Horse Regiment, now including trooper Thomas O'Leary, who has recently returned to the regiment from his drunken escapades at the rest camp at Port Said, gather around this respected young officer from a distinguished farming family in Victoria as he gives his orders. Saddle up and pack light. Beyond your weaponry and ammunition, you may take with you no more than one blanket, one ground sheet and a greatcoat. We are travelling fast by the light of this full moon. We have a big ride ahead of us to Beersheba. We will be moving out at dusk and heading 30 miles to the southeast to get to Asani and doing another 30 miles tomorrow night to get to Kalasa. Though Beersheba is just 20 miles as the crow flies from Tel El Farah, so circuitous and duplicitous is our route that we will cover 70 miles to get there. There is joy among the troopers, and none more so than in the 12th Light Horse Regiment, as witness the words of one of Guy Hayden's mates, Trooper Thomas Hoskerson. The cold-footed light horse, who have been marking time in Palestine according to stay-at-home critics, have at last come into their kingdom. After many dreary, sweating months in the desert, choked by sand and tantalised to the verge of madness by flies, exposed to the burning rays of the sun by day and drenched by night dews on patrol, keeping in touch with the enemy and occasionally handing him out a surprise packet of no mean order, we passed under the shadow of Tel El Farah on the evening of October the 28th. Two of the troopers heading out, Arthur Bennett and Reginald Brown, amuse and distract themselves by working on a banjo-esque poem to describe their task. There was movement at El Favo, for word had gone around that old Bill had ordered saddle up with three days' rations found. Soon all was in readiness to go we knew not where, as we mounted on our chargers, our hearts as light as air. They knew something was doing, their dumb instinct seemed to tell, and before that march was ended, they had done their duty well. Unbeknownst to them, Banjo Patterson himself is only a few miles away and closing fast. In this camp, just five miles from Gaza, William Grant's 4th Brigade of the Australian Light Horse begin a long pull to the east, in staggered starts, with each regiment given a precise time to head off, on what they already know will be a gruelling journey. All of the mounted troopers have been on long journeys before. This time, though, as they take their leave, things are different. Instead of the usual way, moving at dawn after packing up and striking their tents, they are moving at dusk and leave those tents standing with lit lanterns inside. Later, a skeleton crew will go to each tent and light a lot of cooking campfires in front of each pod of tents before extinguishing the lanterns at the usual time, about 9pm. Tomorrow and each day until the Battle of Beersheba begins, not only will they do the same but also new dummy camps of tents will be set up to make it look like a large force is assembling in front of Gaza. 
Just as they had done in Gallipoli, everything is being done to convince the enemy that they are still here in force and offer no clue that, in fact, they are moving en masse many miles away. To any Turkish or German eyes that spy from on high, to any Bedouin in the pay of the same, all the tents will be there, even as small squads of horsemen go back and forth on the banks of Wadi Gaza around Tel El Fara with the specific purpose of raising large clouds of dust. During the day, intense air patrols from the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service have been proceeding back and forth along the entire fortified line to keep the Taubas from getting close enough to observe too closely. From distant hilltops at night, the lights in the tents and the fires outside will give an equal impression of the British being about to besiege Gaza. On this evening, in the middle of the throng travelling in column of route, Four abreast, Lieutenant Guy Hayden is astride midnight as his 12th Regiment keeps pace with their fellow units of the 4th Brigade and the 11th and 4th Regiments. All of them bear three days' rations of bully beef and biscuits for themselves and two nose bags of 19 pounds of grain for their horses hanging from each side of their saddles. Another day's worth of grain for each horse will be carried in brigade wagons which will come along behind. Through the dusk, across the desert ramble and into the night, they keep moving. On both sides and in front, a screen of troopers, who occasionally give their position when the iron horseshoes of their mounts strike sparks from stones, keep pace. If there proves to be any different kinds of Turkish delights hidden in any of the wadis the broad mass of troops is skirting, it will be the screen that takes the immediate hit, not the mass of men now moving through the night. For the moment, mercifully, there is nothing. Under orders, there is no smoking and no talking above a muffled whisper. But the night is filled with the sounds of thousands of horsemen on the move. Behind them comes a supply convoy that extends six miles and includes some 300 four-wheeled vehicles, most pulled by camels, mules and pack horses. For those in the middle of it, it seems extraordinary to think that the Turks in their post just ten miles to the north can't be aware of it, but at least the route soon takes them well away from the fortified line as they embark on their circuitous long haul, and in any case a key part of Allenby's plans has been to habituate the Turks to just such noises in the night over previous weeks. Back in the day, all roads did indeed lead to Rome, but tonight... And for the next few nights, they all lead to Beersheba. Mercifully, the rain has held off, and as Allenby has just dropped a note to his wife, good weather now for fighting. Nearing midnight, Grant's 4th Brigade of the Light Horse make camp in a wadi a mile from Asani to settle down for the rest of the night. No fires. Dawn finds men in place around Asani, a quarter of the way on their journey with the job ahead of remaining hidden in wadis through the day, with most sections taking shelter either in the shade of their horses or beneath blankets strung between four rifles stuck into the desert by their bayonets, and not letting the Turks understand just how many are heading their way. On this fine morning of the 29th of October, Banjo Patterson, experiencing his first dawn at Rafa, awakes to the sound of shells bursting on Gaza. There were six or eight warships working off the land, he will record. Their huge guns, 14 inches they say, used to make the ground shake and there was one continuous roll of firing, like beating a big drum very quickly. Poking his head out from the tent, he can actually see the shells bursting all along the Turkish position and it did seem impossible to believe that any human beings could stand such a fusillade for a moment. Great clouds of earth used to fly up, and it seemed as if nothing could live a moment in such an inferno, but the Turks stuck it out gamely enough. Which is true enough, though it is not to say they are unconcerned, for it is not just the pounding their forward defences are taking— it is also that the British camps have been closely observed in recent days, and there is no doubt that they have six infantry divisions still right here in the Gaza sector, with another over to the east. All signs point to a third battle being about to begin. And yes, 
there has been increased movement around Beersheba, but at Hudge, the commander of the 8th Army, General Kress von Kressenstein, is not concerned, sending Colonel Ismet in Beersheba a cable. The enemy has concentrated one infantry and one cavalry division and the Camel Corps against Beersheba. Beersheba has been reinforced by two regiments. The forces in Beersheba opposed to the above enemy concentration are sufficient and no further reinforcement will be sent. At much the same time, British intelligence is able to secure an enemy communication which is promising and a sign that the Havasak ruse has worked. An outflanking attack on Beersheba with about one infantry and one cavalry division is indicated, but the main attack, as before, must be expected on the Gaza front. For Banjo Patterson and his men, there is no time to tarry. At Rafa, he and his rouseabouts have now been given orders to deliver 186 horses to the forces which will soon be besieging Beersheba, and they must start right away. To the east, those two troopers paying homage to his style of poetry are continuing to live the experience that will give them the lines. Next day we lay in idleness till the sun went down once more. Then another four hours' march we did, as we had done before. Our horses neighed for water, but none for them was found. And our water bottles empty ere another sun went down. For the men of Brigadier General William Grant's 4th Brigade, it is coming time to move once more. Their entire day at Asani has been spent looking after the horses, including getting them what water they can from the canvas troughs and waiting to move again. And now, just gone six o'clock, they depart. Yes, another moonlit night, but now so dusty, for it gets drier the further east they go. You would hardly know. Amidst swirling plumes of grit that blanket them all, the 4th Brigade's 800 men are again part of a massive movement in the moonlight, an eerie cavalcade of dusty phantoms plodding along in an ancient land on paths previously trodden by at least a dozen ancient armies with much the same task. And yet each soldier of the 4th Australian Light Horse Brigade is their equal tonight, for they ride on the track of Alexander, they drink from the well of Moses, they feel the breath of history in the darkness. Are the great ghosts marching with us? And will we be joining them in the hereafter come the battle that awaits? The horses whinny, the stirrups lightly clank, the saddles squeak, but there remains no talking, no smoking, just moving. The beaming moonlight shows it all, however, in General Chevelle's Desert Mounted Corps, they are ten brigades strong now, all on the move. True, they only have to travel ten miles tonight, but this is rough, twisted country to travel through, filled with wadis that must be crossed, sand hills that must be struggled over, and possible patrols which simply must be avoided. It is only ten miles as the crow flies, but they are not riding crows, and so must make their own arrangements. As they continue to the northeast, the moonlight feels brighter still. Reflected as it is by the massive white chalk and sandstone cliffs which form the wadi walls that lie between Asani and Kalasa. The mood is tense but upbeat. After two rounds of defeat at Gaza, followed by months of clashes with the Turks in endless skirmishes and a little trench warfare, this stunt feels like they will soon be getting to grips properly once more. Arriving at Kalasa, which proves to be little more than the scattered ruins of an old village, there is again no chance of a warm meal for the simple reason that there can be no fires, and all they can eat is their cold rations. Far more troubling, however, is the lack of water. The first arrivals had had their share, but by the time the 1st of Brigadier General William Grant's 4th Light Horse Brigade arrives at 10pm, it is all but gone. There is just enough to wet their whistle, but not nearly enough to sate their thirst. With their horses, they settle down the best they can for a troubled night. 9.45am, 30th of October 1917, between Asani and Kalasa. Hun on the run. With the rest of the 12th Light Horse and still sweltering in the camp at Asani, 
as they wait to move off again in the cool and cloak of the early evening, Lieutenant Guy Hayden is among the first to see it. At first, it is no more than a speck in the air coming from the north, but it emerges in all its horror soon enough. It's a German plane, a Rumpler C2. Somehow, likely threading his way through patches of cloud, it has got through the screen of Bristol fighters that had been patrolling to the north of the moving troops to prevent precisely this, and the German pilot has clearly spotted the troops on the ground. For now, he roars back and forth, just above rifle range, his observer no doubt taking photos of the columns of mounted troopers, the infantry, the guns, the supply wagons, the trucks. It is nothing less than a disaster. Within 30 minutes, once the rumpler is back behind its own lines, the jig will be up and all their efforts to confuse the Turks about their true intentions will have come to naught, unless unless the Royal Flying Corps can come to their rescue. For now, a Bristol F-2B fighter from the aerodrome at Deir el Bala suddenly appears. Captain Arthur Hicks Peck and his observer, Captain John Lloyd Williams, have indeed seen the Tauber and come at it from on high. As the troops watch from below, enthralled, a game of aerial cat and mouse is pursued. The Tauber twists and turns, soars and dips, tries to disappear into the same clouds whence it came. But all the while, Peck stays with it, waiting for the right moment. Now, holding down the trigger of his forward-firing Vickers machine gun, a stream of 303 bullets at the rate of eight rounds a second bursts forth and starts to tear into the flimsy fabric fuselage of the Tauber. In short order, smoke starts coming from its engine, even as it loses altitude and the troops below cheer themselves hoarse. Though the Tauber is mortally wounded, the two Germans on board are still capable of fleeing, and no sooner has their plane crash-landed than they are out and heading north, carrying satchels. Mercifully, die beiden Deutschen Piloten are quickly captured, and the satchels are found to contain photographic plates, marked maps and notes. For the moment, the Empire is saved. 30th of October, 1917. Asluj. Night moves. With the enemy so close, it does not do to travel with too much ceremony, for fear of snipers taking shots at the man in the middle. But the Australian troopers already on site at Asluj, preparing for the mass who are about to swarm in, recognise the new arrival soon enough anyway. It is General Chevelle with his Desert Mounted Corps HQ of General Staff Officers, come forward to keep a close eye on proceedings. If he is looking tired, it is for very good reason, as he has been working as hard and as long as he ever has in his life. General Chevelle is a wonderful man. One of the officers on his personal staff will write at this time, as wiry as half a dozen ordinary men. He works from early morning until very late at night, the old general is a great favourite among all with whom he comes into contact. Whatever else is to happen, there will be no repeat of the first attack on Gaza, where someone far removed from the battle gives an insane order to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, certainly not on Chevelle's watch. Chevelle quickly convenes a meeting of his senior officers to make sure all is put in place. The brigade will move out in the wee hours of the morning at around 1am to cover the final 25 miles to their launch position at Ishwewin, some four miles to the east of Beersheba. The six brigades in play must arrive at their position before dawn so that no passing Tauber will see such a force being moved into position. Afternoon, 30th of October 1917. Asluj, wild about Harry. Look alive now and let the dog see the rabbit. Yes, there is enduring resentment among the Australians at the idea of saluting British officers, but there is nothing of the kind for General Chevelle. He is right up the front with them. Visits by top brass have happened before and are referred to by the troops as royal parties. They generally arrive in high ceremony, do a few inspections, grumble a little or a lot, and leave in a cloud of dust. But this is different. Chevelle is one of his men, and at one. 
They are all in this together, and he is not going anywhere but to the front with them. Z Day is tomorrow. For now, General Chevelle, his slight, light form moving through beetle brows lifted in greeting, a smile accompanying each salute, continues his quiet inspection, asking questions, receiving reports, giving orders about the precise placements of the Anzac Mounted Division, who will be leaving from here at Asluj, and the Australian Mounted Division leaving from Kalasa, which is eight miles and three hours back. Yes, there is tension, but Chevelle is comforted by two things. He has the strong feeling that he and his men could have done no more than they have in preparation. And at least for the moment, there is no sign that the Turkish garrison in Beersheba is aware of the threat it faces. 30th of October, 1917. Calm before the storm. At Kam, four miles from El Bakka, Banja Patterson is stunned to find himself in the midst of heavy preparation as a large mass of men of the 20th Corps prepares to get underway. Having left at dawn with his men and horses and orders to get the horses to Beersheba, Patterson and his group have arrived here to find themselves in the midst of a throng so large that it very nearly defies belief. I found countless thousands of troops, tents, camels, motor wagons, traction engines, supply depots, yeomanry, infantry, in fact, a whole army. Countless thousands of mule wagons, motor wagons and camels were loading up with supplies from this place, which was the end of the railway, for Beersheba. At the first hint of the descending darkness, the first infantry of the 20th Corps are on their way in their staggered starts, beginning the 10-hour approach march that will ideally see them in position long enough before dawn that they can get some rest before the action begins. The 60th Division are to attack Beersheba from the south, while the 74th Division will launch from the southwest. It seems like even the moon has disappeared as the dust generated by so many horses and army boots blots everything out, and the horses and soldiers simply follow those in front. Behind the last of the infantry come the 242 guns being pulled by hundreds of weary horses, plus thousands of camels carrying shells and supplies, a caravan of catastrophe to come that stretches an extraordinary six miles, wagons, trucks and animals, all heading into the night. All up, it means the desert stillness is now filled with the ceaseless tramp of feet, the snorting of horses, and the throaty rumble of heavily loaded trucks edging forward. In the middle of the throng, once more, is Major Banjo Patterson with his remaining horses and rouseabouts. I never expect to see such a sight again. He will write to his wife. The road ran over rolling downs like the Cunningham Plains country, and the huge stream of traffic had spread out until it was a mile wide, and this multitude surged along in dust unspeakable. Never have I seen or dreamt of such dust. It will billow upwards, outwards, and into the night. At El Bakka, nine miles to the east, General Chetwood is doing much the same with his own troops of the 20th Corps, and he opens his HQ there at five o'clock. Around and about this outpost, he has over 40,000 soldiers, including artillery crews. It is from here, tomorrow, that he and General Allenby, who is due to shortly arrive, will run the show. For now, Chetwood has his last meetings with his senior officers, going over the maps of Beersheba and its surrounds, and designating precisely where he wants them and at what time. Yes, sir. Saddle up and we go again. It is six o'clock and nearly fully dark in Kalasa when Lieutenant Guy Hayden and his men of the 12th Australian Light Horse are told that they must head out towards Asluj. The plan is to have a brief rest there before setting off again in the wee hours to arrive at a point on the Turks' flank so as to be able to attack Beersheba from the east. With the 1st Light Horse Brigade, the now Lance Corporal Morrie Evans who describes Asluj as a queer little place, ringed in with hills, is told the same. We move out of here tonight and attack Beersheba from the east in the morning, having to circle the place to do it. 
The night is hot, heavy and dusty. The route is the longest of all their night moves, with the Anzac Mounted having 25 miles to cover and the Australian Mounted a further 10 miles on top of that, and extremely dark. We are ordered to hang on to what water and food we have, one trooper records in his diary. The next we get, we are to capture from the Turks. Though the rule of no smoking still applies, in the 4th Light Horse Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Neil Smith manages to get around it by lighting his pipe and puffing away on it under the cover of his greatcoat to keep it smothered, but the poor cigarette smoker had no hope. We moved steadily. At 9pm, the last of the Desert Mounted Corps men are arriving at Asluj. Immediately, there is a problem. Alas, as their intelligence summary will record, no water available to water horses. Simply put, last in, worst served. There are so many other mounted troopers who have already passed through that the wells at Asluj simply had not been able to keep up and have now run all but dry. Such little water as is available must go to replenish the water bottles of the men themselves, and only then can the whalers and camels receive a drop. Will the horses be able to cope with another journey to Beersheba starting in just a few hours without water? There is no choice. They will simply have to. It is a low-lying cloud of dust in the desert moonlight. From on high, it would look benign. In the middle of this, the 20th Corps is on the move more than 40,000 men and 214 guns, of which three-quarters are 18-pounders, while the rest are 4.5-inch howitzers and 60-pounders, converging on its designated spots secreted in wadis to the south and southwest of Beersheba, while the Desert Mounted Corps is to go to similar wadis to the east and southeast. True, for the mounted troopers, it is not ideal to be facing a battle at the end of a 30-mile night march, but that can't be helped. Onwards. The dust is clinging, choking, oppressive, and you cannot see further than 20 yards in any direction. Just follow the man in front of you, and trust that our scouts out the front know what they are doing. The troopers and infantry of the 11th Light Horse Regiment keep moving, trying to take their minds off just what they'd give to be able to take vast swigs of water right now. But they can't, and neither can their horses. Aware of their discomfort, their commanding officer, Colonel John Parsons, tries to help. You fellows should copy my example, he says blithely to a few troopers he approaches. For the past ten miles, I've carried a small pebble in my mouth, and I haven't felt the need for a drink. The troopers left in his wake look at each other. God help us all. He's serious. One trooper simply can't help himself. If the colonel travels ten miles without a drink on a small pebble, how far will he go on a brick? As Parsons is still within earshot, he is, mercifully for the trooper, able to join in the muffled laughter of all. Onwards, in the dusty moonlight... As dawn breaks and the men of the 4th Australian Light Horse Brigade can see each other for the first time since dusk of the previous evening, all they know is two things. They are approaching their destination, a position just beyond a ridge a little to the east of Beersheba, and each and every one of them is completely covered in dust, as are their horses. We looked a strange sight, Lieutenant Smith will recount. Every face was thickly covered with grey dust, making each man look like the next. I addressed Padre Weir, the brigade chaplain, as Bill, taking him for a trooper under all the dust. Quiet conversations take place in the quiet watch of the night. The 4th Light Horse Regiment's Regimental Sergeant Major, Alex Wilson, tells Sergeant Jim French, for no good reason that he cares to expand on, I am sure there is a bullet waiting for me at Beersheba. Maybe, Sergeant Major. There will no doubt be bullets for all of us. The trick is to duck them or shoot the Turk who's about to fire at you first. Wee hours, 31st of October 1917. Usluge bowled over. As ever, Tibby Cotter and his mate Bluey stick tightly together. 
After watering their horses in the wee hours at the canvas troughs by the newly constituted wells, they prepare to move off with the rest of the 4th Brigade. But first things first. Beyond everything else, Cotter, who after his heroics in the Second Battle of Gaza had been promoted to Lance Corporal, only to decide he preferred to be a simple trooper and so reverted to the lower rank, has developed a reputation as one of the best foragers in the AIF. He would come to light with a bottle of champagne in the middle of the desert, his mate Bluey would say, and the lads in the section all looked to him to turn up with something unusual. And on this momentous occasion, Tibby lives up to his reputation, telling Bluey that he has secured a yard of ling, a kind of long, round fish, and that once they get to their destination, he will treat the boys to a stammel fish supper in Beersheba and be damned to the consequences. The boys in question, Troopers Jack Beasley and Rex Colley, grin at the thought. Stammel's is the most famous fish restaurant in Sydney, which comes complete with a wine licence, an elevator for the ladies, private dining rooms and the swishest fare in the whole country. Only Tibby could claim that they only had to take Beersheba and he will whip them up a fish supper and be half believed. Unbeknownst to them, at this very moment, people all over Australia are reading a letter about Tibby's exploits, published in the leading sports paper, Referee, reassuring everyone, from Palm Beach to Perth, from Darwin to the Derwent, that Tibby is doing well and might soon be decorated. I note your remarks in issue of Referee, of 17th instant, re Albert Cotter, a W. Cameron writes, My cousin, Donald Cameron, who is at present commanding the 12th Light Horse, has written me, remarking on the splendid work Cotter has been doing and stating that he had been recommended for decoration. Knowing that I should be much interested in Tibby's welfare and the Freemasonry that exists amongst cricketers generally, he wrote me on the matter, and it gives me much pleasure to enclose the pa in your paper. But half a world away, the splendid Cotter seems uncharacteristically nervous in the serious moonlight as they saddle up their horses before wrapping cloth around every moving thing hanging off those saddles to prevent making any unnecessary noise. Most tightly tied down are the billy cans, which long ago replaced the British Tommy cookers to boil tea. The Australians love them, but they can reverberate like a drum if allowed to move about. For now, just as they tighten the straps and prepare to trek onwards, Tibby picks up a clod of earth and in that oh-so-familiar action swings his arm over, hurtling the clod off into the far darkness in the direction of a dry wadi where no one is camped. Three or four seconds later, they hear the thud of it landing. That's my last bowl, Blue, the great Australian fast bowler says to his mate. Something is going to happen. Well, something is already happening, Tibby, so saddle up, son, and let's get going. In short order, the Anzac Mounted Division are on the move from Usluj, set to travel 17 miles to their designated gathering point, six miles east of Beersheba. The horses, despite their great loads, one trooper will note, were touched with excitement as they always were when marching in large bodies. And despite their exhaustion, the horsemen feel the same. This, the troopers know, is the last long haul before they get to their positions near Beersheba, and as they proceed in the light of the remarkably bright full moon, many feel a curious mix of exhaustion and exhilaration. It is hard to sleep when you know it may be your last, and come the dawn, there are many friends they will surely see for the final time. Battle is near, fate beckons, but so does slumber, and finally, the weary have rest. Chapter 11. Bathsheba Besieged From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds. Shakespeare, Henry V, Act 4, Prologue Since the early April fiasco, the new GOC, General Sir Edmund Allenby, had drawn the wand of a magician over the desert. His stupendous task was now complete and the time ripe for a general advance. The infantry were long since snug in their trenches before Gaza 
and for months shadows were moving up through the darkest nights to our front lines. Trooper J.C. Ryan, 4th Australian Light Horse Regiment, in a letter to his brother recounting the lead-up to the Battle of Beersheba. These Australian countrymen had never in all their riding at home ridden a race like this. All rode for victory and for Australia. Official historian Henry Gullett, the Australian Imperial Force in Sinai and Palestine, 1914-1918. to 5.30am, 31st of October 1917, Beersheba, by the dawn's early fight. Trooper Ion Idris is with his comrades of the 5th Light Horse Regiment of the 2nd Light Horse Brigade, still moving forward after a hard night's riding, and they are just enjoying the first rays of the sun warming them after the freezing darkness. Away went the longing for sleep, Idris will recount. Out came pipes and cigarettes along the column. Mates looked at one another with a half-smile, musingly. The valley grew wider and wider, Bedouin cultivation made its appearance in ever-increasing plots. Then five miles away between the hills, we caught sight of the white mosque and houses of Beersheba. If all goes well, it will soon be theirs, complete with its wells. And now, with pipes and cigarettes popping into every mouth and puffed on, they hear it, the sound of battle. They are faint and far off, but soon to be loud and near. As exhausted as they are, their horses also prick up their ears and whinny, becoming restless. From deep experience, they know that what often comes with that sound is action, and there is every chance they will soon be right in the thick of it. Far, far to the west, the soldiers before Beersheba can see a light's throbbing glow on the horizon, accompanied by a low rumbling. Clearly, on this morning, Gaza is under attack and Jacko must think he has his hands full with the attentions of the 21st Corps. But he has no idea. For now, with the 20th Corps and the Desert Mounted Corps massed around Beersheba, the real battle is about to begin. The first gleams of dawn mean the flashes to the west start to ebb as the sun grows, but it occasions furious activity around the 200 or so 18-pounder 4.5-inch howitzer and 60-pounder guns that have been moved into position before Beersheba overnight, each of them with around 200 rounds to fire. For while it had been one thing to get those guns and howitzers of General Chetwood's 20th Corps into position, the last had arrived at 3.15am. They have always needed light to aim them properly, and such is the case now as the artillery crews get their bearings. Some of the guns are primed with high explosive and shrapnel and aimed at the Turks' forward trenches, while the others are to bring heavy fire on Jacko's artillery batteries in the hope that they can be knocked out before the infantry of the 20th Corps, the soldiers of the 60th and 74th Divisions, launch. The shells, coloured black, are the airburst ones, loaded with shrapnel to kill Jacko, while those that are red are pure high explosive and are designed to wreck Jacko's guns if they can just land among them. By 5.45am, all is ready. The crews are in their places, the shells are stockpiled beside them. At precisely 5.55am, as planned, the orders are given to the artillery crews. Using a loud hailer, the battery commander shouts the settings for range and direction. Range... 2,150 yards, angle 24 degrees, two minutes. The guns are trained accordingly, with the gun layer turning one handle for the right elevation and another for the correct traverse. After the sergeant of each crew checks the settings, it is on to the next step. Another crew member now opens the breech, while a second puts a shell in and the first closes the breech. Number one gun ready. Number two gun, ready. Number three gun, ready, the sergeants call, one by one, to their crews. Everyone turns away and blocks their ears as the man who closed the breach prepares to pull the lanyard that fires it. And fire! The battery commander watches closely to see where the shells land. 
yelling fresh orders instantly to alter the gun's elevation and traverse accordingly, so that the fire will become ever more deadly in its accuracy. In Beersheba, for the populace not in uniform, some 500 residents, this morning starts out just as any morning. From first light, there is movement on the dusty streets, even as the Moisin make the call from the minarets of the mosque for the faithful to attend morning prayers. Those ethereal voices mix and mingle in the ancient pathways of the town, just as they have for centuries past, a sombre tune of faith to Allah. Allah huwa akbar, Allah is most great. Haya alas salah, come to prayer. Suddenly, from the near distance, for the first time, comes the sound of either rolling thunder or an artillery attack. Smoke starts to rise from the trenches that defend the perimeter on the southern and western sides of Beersheba. We are under attack. Colonel Ismet is instantly apprised and does the obvious, giving orders for some of his reserve troops to move to those trenches. For the moment, the colonel is not overly worried. Beersheba is well defended by nearly 5,000 soldiers, 28 artillery pieces, numerous machine guns and two planes. In this war, the heavy advantage is always with the defenders, with a sure supply of water. And it is out of the question that the British could mass much of a force in this desert. The five-man battery crews of the British are now going at it like navvies, all of them spaced in batteries of six or four, each some ten yards apart, and load and fire and ignore the puff of acrid smoke that blows into the gunners' faces every time a breach is opened to eject the shell casing and insert another shell. At this rapid-fire rate of six shells per minute, it is exhausting work, but the gunners never waver. Their focus now is Hill 1070, a mid-sized hill that forms part of the outer Turkish defences, atop which the Turks have an artillery observation post a dugout with a steel roof and trapdoor. Nearby are heavily entrenched artillery batteries and soldiers with machine guns behind rolls of barbed wire that will help protect them against any sudden rushes. The collective roar of the cannon is shaking the dusty dawn to a pulp, echoing and re-echoing in the Judean hills and turning those hills into dust and dirty air, a topography toppled in sheer seconds. With 1,200 shells falling every minute from the 200 guns, the dust plumes are enormous as there is not a single breath of wind to disperse them, and they simply get thicker and higher. In the middle of that smoke, the British artillery crews know flying shrapnel will be cutting the Turks to bloody pieces, and hopefully also cutting some of the rolls of barbed wire in front of them. On the edges, they can already see furious activity with Turkish soldiers and guns on limbers and in carts being rushed forward. But even that vision does not last long. For so big are the guns, so powerful the 60-pound shells, that before long those plumes of smoky dust have become billowing clouds drifting all over Beersheba, and it is no longer possible to see just what effect the barrage is having on the town's defences. Positioned well in front of the artillery crews, the infantry soldiers of the 20th Corps, having crawled as far forward as they can while still retaining at least a little cover, as their ears ring with a crack of bullets and the shrapnel shells bursting all around, together with the soft moans or outright screams of comrades who have already been hit, prepare themselves to launch. One in ten of them has a shiny biscuit tin lid strapped to his back, so that as they lie prone, ready to attack, the rising sun will flash off their backs and allow the observers in aircraft to always know and report back their precise position. Their hearts in their mouths, their rifles in their hands, their stomachs holding something a lot stronger than mere butterflies, they grip their rifles, pray, hold tightly to their bags of bombs and make ready to rush the Turks. Beneath their pounding hearts, Mother Earth continues to tremble and shake with the sheer trauma of the outrages being done to her. Or maybe it is just their own uncontrollable shaking, as massive shells from both sides explode all around. For the moment, 
All they can do is use their bayonets to gouge out small shallows to press their bodies into, to try to escape the Turkish bullets flying overhead, while some place their rifle butts before their heads as further protection. Many of them do not escape, with whole pods of British troops being wiped out as the Turkish artillery takes its toll, and beyond the dozens of dead, many more are wounded. The survivors hold their position, knowing they must wait until their own artillery has weakened the enemy and destroyed the rolls of barbed wire that lie between them and the Turkish trenches. For his part, Lieutenant Guy Hayden and his men of the 12th Regiment have arrived at their designated destination in the dry and dusty Iswewan area, six miles east of Bathsheba. They too are close enough to feel the battle's roar, but a ridge between them and the town means they can see none of it. For now, they must get the saddles off their horses, feed and water them the best they can, with what very little they have left, and secrete themselves in the scattered wadis far enough apart that a single bomb from Matalba will only take out one of them, not several. It is on the same principle that the other regiments of Lieutenant Colonel William Grant's 4th Brigade are scattered in wadis and gullies over a wide area. They are told, to their disgust, that while all of the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Brigades are on standby and will likely soon be thrown into action, they are being kept in reserve. For Christ's sake! It is like being locked in the cellar next to a house having a riotous New Year's Eve party and told there's some chance you might be let out and invited sometime before midnight. They can hear everything and only imagine what's happening, but all they know for certain is that they have been left out. True, under the circumstances, many a man would be content not to be in harm's way, but they are not just men. They are soldiers, troopers of the Australian Light Horse, They have trained to be in battle, want to be in battle, were born to be in the battle, and it is just not right that they are not part of it. Next day we started off again and marched the whole night long till we landed in a wadi at the breaking of the dawn. Then our leader handed round his fags to smoke, he said we may, and peacefully we lay about till four o'clock that day. All they can do for now is have breakfast. What else could it be for the men of William Grant's 4th Brigade but a dry mix of biscuit and bully beef swilled down with a sparing swig from their water bottles while their whinnying whalers look at them questioningly? Where is ours? Coming, hopefully. For the moment, all we can spare as you stand in the morning light, still with your saddles and bridles on, as we might be getting the order to move at any time, is some of the few corn cobs we are carrying with us and so soldier and horse chew ruefully, the latter through their bits. Strange, this complicity between man and beast. After the night they have had together, there is a certain resemblance in their emotions and even appearance. They are exhausted, a little trepidatious as to what lies ahead, but anxious to get on with it, and very, very dusty. In the case of the horses, below the edges of the saddle blankets, the dried sweat was caked, a reddish-grey, and wet hair gleamed under the cloths as heads went down to the feed bags. In the distance, the sound of the battle rolls on, and as they gaze to their west, they can see black clouds of smoke and thick dust mark the bursting of high-explosive shells. The fight. They are missing it. The best they can, they try to get at least a little sleep. At least most do. We had visions of a cup of tea, Captain Cyril Smith of the 4th Light Horse will recount. With a few pieces of deal, we always carried wood if we could get it. I managed to get the quart pot boiling and was one of the few who tasted tea that day. Who knows what lies ahead, but a cup of tea can't hurt. 6.50am, 31st of October 1917, Royal Flying Corps Aerodrome, Welly Sheikh Nuran. Airmail. Quickly now, before getting the briefing out on today's mission, crucial reconnaissance on the key German and Turkish positions at Beersheba, Flight Lieutenant Alaric Bohr just has time to write his parents a quick note, telling them a little of the task before him, providing air support for the troops below. I do hope everything goes all right for me and my observer, 
and I hope the other troops get on as well. Cheerio. Don't worry, I'll be all right. I feel very confident this morning. Your loving son, Alaric. A quick cup of tea, and now it is time for his briefing from his friend and commanding officer, Major Horace Haycock, in his tent just back from the actual dusty airstrip of No. 113 Squadron's base at Weli Sheikh Nuran, just east of Rafa. Your mission is to fly over Beersheba and look for signs of new defensive forces having been moved in, together with freshly dug trenches or newly established barbed wire. Get photos and make a report. Also make sure that you can spy no new Turkish or German forces on their way from the north, coming down the Hebron Road. The young Australian salutes and is on his way, gathering his observer, 2nd Lieutenant John Muller from Yorkshire, who has made his way to the RFC from the Middlesex Regiment. The two have been flying together for the last six weeks, and there is an easy rapport between them. But today both feel nerves and excitement. Said day, and they are part of it. Cease fire! At 7am, the order is given in order for the dust covering Beersheba to drift off with the tiny breeze and allow determinations to be made as to just what effect the barrage had had. It takes a good while, but at least from what can be determined in the still-swirling filth, much of the barbed wire is still intact. What to do? Launch the infantry anyway as planned? or bring down the hammers of hell from the artillery for another hour. In the end, General Chetwood decides to do both and gives orders for his forces to unleash one more ten-minute burst of artillery at 8.20am, after which the mass of soldiers is to advance. After arriving at their plane, an RE-8, Lieutenants Boer and Muller quickly climb aboard and do their pre-flight checks. Fuel, full. Fuel cocks, on. Controls, full, free and correct. Harnesses, fastened. All is in order for Lieutenant Boer to give an order of his own. Contact. The mechanic swings the four-bladed wooden propeller and the engine roars to life. In less than a minute, they are airborne and heading for Beersheba. Their direction set by heading towards the vast plumes of dust rising in the desert ahead, while always keeping an eye out for the enemy. It is an extraordinary thing to be engaged in, a deadly activity right in the middle of beauty unimagined. I have seen many sunrises at whose beauty I marvelled, another Australian pilot will describe it, but never before had I witnessed anything that could come within cooey of the riotous blaze of colour covering the Holy Land, as it were, with a cloth of gold. It seemed impossible to realise, while nature was all aglow, that war was being waged with all its relentless cruelty, that we, who had been privileged to witness the glory of God's handiwork, were scanning the heavens for something in the way of Hun airmen to kill. Onwards, Boer and Muller fly towards Beersheba and the clouds of angry dust billowing from it. Whatever is happening down there, It is vigorous, for neither Boer nor Muller have ever seen plumes like it. The artillery fire must be intense. The engine roaring, the plane buffeted as the desert air heats up and the wind rises, they gaze down earnestly looking for any change from the previous days, any Turkish guns being moved, any significant scrap of intelligence that might make all the difference and allow the gods of war to smile on the attackers on this day. Their eyes can win this battle, and the duo are as concentrated as condensed milk as their craft comes closer to the fray. 8.20am, 31st of October 1917, outskirts of Beersheba, plying pliers for wires. Fire! Again the shattering roar breaks out, even as the ground shakes and the air fills with choking dust. Under the cover of the dust, the British scouts of the 20th Corps crawl forward with goggles on their eyes and scarves around their noses and mouths. For all that, it is their ears that are now most at risk as they crawl ever closer to the concussive blasts just up ahead. In their pockets, pliers, 
They keep crawling forward at speed, and yet it still feels like an eternity before they indeed get to the remaining rolls of barbed wire. In only a short time, and despite the fact that trenches just 50 yards in front of them are being pounded, throwing out flames, stones and even body parts, those rolls of wire are soon mere slivers on the ground. It cannot come soon enough for their comrades behind, who are themselves taking shells from the Turkish artillery, causing a constant stream of grievous wounds as the shrapnel scythes through them. Here an ear, there a jaw, over there still a man gives a light whimper and simply lays his head down, dead, part of a foreign field that is forever England, or close. But now their own artillery stops, and at last they can charge. As one, the infantry of the 60th Division rise, and with a low roar charge into the billowing maelstrom of the dusty dead, dead ahead, their bayonets to the fore, eager to finish the Turks who have survived in the trenches. It does not take long, as they slash, thrust and kill, all with a primal passion that comes from a place perhaps long ago. This battle is at close quarters, ugly and ancient, each man fighting for his life and for the other's death. One British soldier, Corporal John Collins, covers himself in glory in the wider assault by constantly going out under fire and rescuing wounded soldiers before taking up the bayonet and taking down 15 Turks. Just 15 minutes after the barrage had stopped, Hill 1070 has been taken by the 60th Division, as have 90 bloodied, shocked Turkish prisoners. Most importantly, the hill will make an excellent artillery observation post to allow the men of the 20th to ever better direct the fire of the batteries now being dragged forward over the broken ground by straining, heaving horses and set up. By firing from the lee side of that hill, which is just over three miles from the outskirts of Beersheba, they soon start to smash the inner Turkish defensive line, even as their soldiers edge towards the next line of trenches. Yes, the closer they get, the more intense the machine gun fire upon them is, but still their progress is inexorable. It has been a difficult morning for Colonel Ismet, and no doubt about it. With the artillery barrage to the west being followed up with infantry attacks, it is clear that Beersheba is in for a tough time. From his position on a high hill west of the town, but within his own defensive rings, he is still not overly concerned. As near as he and his men can discern, Beersheba is only under attack by one division. And yet, it had to happen, and now it does. Turning back to face Beersheba, he looks well beyond it to the plains on the far side. And what does he see? Cavalry? The whole plain appears to be swarming with it, each speck becoming a dot, each dot becoming a horse with rider atop. Surely they are not intending to attack en masse. No, it must be yet another diversion, a mere demonstration to confuse and distract him. Their aim must be for him to move his own troops from the spot where the British are now attacking to where they merely might attack. A staff officer is sent to try to divine whether the arriving cavalry is there for purpose or for pomp. When that officer does not return, Colonel Ismet reluctantly gives the orders for a battalion of infantry and a machine gun company to bolster the defences at Tel El Saba a second battalion to move to the trenches to the southeast of the town, while also sending a division of cavalry, 1,100 strong, to defend an outer defensive position by the name of Tel El Sakati and the Hebron Road that runs by it. They must make sure that Beersheba cannot be encircled. 9 a.m., 31st of October 1917, above Beersheba, through the glass darkly. There it is. Having skirted the plumes on the southwestern side of Beersheba, Lieutenant Alaric Boer carefully guides his RE-8 on a steady path, flying back and forth. He is sure not to overly concentrate on the eastern and southeastern perimeter of Beersheba, so as not to forewarn the enemy of the intended attack, but those parts are indeed his focus. 
Watching closely from on high, looking out for any Taubers or Fockers, is his fellow Australian, Lieutenant Ross Smith, in his Martinside plane. Thus, with confidence that Smith has his back, Bohr now brings his RE-8 over the besieged town. He and his observer, Lieutenant Muller, note one large mob of Ottoman cavalry with artillery moving north from Beersheba along the Hebron Road towards the hills around Tel el Sakati. And it is equally obvious that the trenches defending the approaches to Beersheba to the south of those tells have also been strengthened. After taking precious aerial photographs, Muller carefully marks down on specially designed paper every variation from what has been seen on previous days. Where the enemy's strength is now, where there appear to be gaps, each fleeting observation now permanently recorded. The most crucial thing is that there is no sign of rolls of barbed wire on the eastern approaches to the town. If any fresh rolls had been put there overnight, it could change everything, as when such rolls remain intact, they are impassable for horse and man alike. But it's all clear. Nor is there any sign of any recently dug horse pits, trenches so wide that no horse could jump them, with a final waggle of the wings to the Australian troops below, who they can see are massing just to the east of the town, Alaric nudges the joystick and their plane completes a graceful turn, heading back towards General Chetwood's 20th Corps HQ at El Bucca. Send them in. The order comes from Chevelle at 9am to Major General Chater of the Anzac Mounted Division. It is time to commence the attacks on Tel El Saba and Tel El Sakati. Subduing Tel El Saba will be particularly difficult as much of the ground approaching it is swept by the fire of numerous machine guns and field guns concealed in the town and on the strongly entrenched hill. How to advance against such withering fire? carefully. As ever, the view of the Desert Mounted Corps is that their job is not to die for their country, but to make the Turks die for theirs. With the support of fire from the Royal Horse Artillery coming from 3,000 yards back, the New Zealand Mounted Rifles Brigade endeavours to attack Tel El Saba from the north. The Canterbury's go in on the right, the Aucklanders on the left, only to be placed under such ferocious fire that it is only the Aucklanders who manage to make much headway, storming to within 1,800 yards and taking immediate cover in the Wadi Saba. It is at least a place to regroup and to position their Vickers machine guns to lay down some suppressive fire as they make their next advance without their horses, because riding a horse into that storm of fire would simply be to kill it and then themselves in turn. From high in the sky, at last, Alaric sees it. There it is, Johnny. It is with no little relief that Flight Lieutenant Alaric Boer and Flight Lieutenant Johnny Muller fly over the newly acquired position at El Bucca Ridge, now Chetwood's HQ. It is not that they are low on petrol, but in a desert where discernible features are no more plentiful than landing spots, the sight of British-held territory is always welcome. The Western Australian pushes the joystick forward, pulls back on the throttle and brings the RE-8 down low over the Desert Mounted Corps HQ so they can drop the report, all of it wrapped in cloth with a spanner for ballast and a streamer for visibility to those officers who eagerly await the news below. Once their precious cargo is dropped, Flight Lieutenant Bohr pulls back the joystick to gain altitude for the flight back to the number 113 squadron's current base at Weli Sheikh Nuran, to the southwest, only to take pause and some alarm. The plane is not reacting to the controls. He tries again. Still no reaction, at least not to him. For now, as if by an unseen hand, the plane, while at an altitude of 300 feet and just half a mile from the El Bucca airfield, is starting to spin out of control. They are losing altitude. There is no time for panic. Training and instinct now act as one for Alaric. Furiously, he hauls on the joystick and stamps on the rudders, trying to bring the nose up and back on an even keel. 
but nothing works. The engine shrieks like a banshee. The ground spins and comes closer. Both men roar as the air rushes past them, each wildly searching for the notion that will free them from this fall and... blackness. It is just before 9.30am, and many of the soldiers defending the El Baca HQ have been watching, appalled, as the plane simply spirals out of the sky. It has landed with a shattering crash just beyond yonder ridge, and smoke is already rising from it. Christ. The RE-8s, those damn finicky planes, are notorious, and when something goes wrong, they drop from the sky like a shot duck. It is a nightmare the men have seen before, but only action may wake them from it. With a quick shout for stretcher bearers, they race towards the point of impact, praying that the pilot and observer might still be alive. A crash in the desert may be survived, has been survived. It all depends on the luck of forced landing. Running up one sand dune, they gasp in horror, for now they see what awaits them on the next. The plane has hit the only thing it could hit in these parts, a sand dune, and come to rest, burning ferociously with its tail in the air. Beating back the flames the best they can, they manage to get both men out of the wreck. The observer is dead, but the pilot is alive. He's very badly injured and unconscious, and they know the odds of survival from here, but at least there is still a chance. Alaric is put on the stretcher and raced back to the HQ in the hope of saving his life. Quickly now. The stretcher bearers taking the body of Muller may take their sombre time. His maps and notations are searched for now intelligence from a dead man that may yet save hundreds of Australians, Kiwis and British today. In the meantime, the least that can be said is that the French woman who had told Alaric two years before that vous aurez de la chance, he will have good luck, merely for having seen the Virgin Mary tilting atop the cathedral at Albert, has been proved definitively wrong, though the fact he is still just alive is something. It is a strange case of slow and methodical meeting, wild and woolly. The progress of the Aucklanders in attacking Tel El Saba is planned and painstaking. The method is mad bursts of 25 yards at a time, while the machine gunners send swarms of angry bullets at the Turkish defenders. It is daring and literally dashing, finding whatever cover they can behind rocky outcrops. By 10am, they are within 700 yards of Tel El Saba. To support them, at 10am, Chater sends in the 2nd and 3rd Light Horse Regiments to attack the enemy stronghold from the south so that the defenders will be getting fire from two flanks at once, while also ordering the Inverness Battery to bring its own fire on them. Progress towards Tel El Saba will be made by flinging the kitchen sink at it, military style. As ever, among the Australians of the light horse, as they move forward, there is disgruntlement in every section over the same issue. On this day, I was put in charge of our section's horses, which rather peeved me. Trooper Humphrey Kemp will recount. Although one was always scared, to some degree or other, in the front line, particularly with machine guns, as they drew fire from all arms and were cheerfully known as suicide sections, It usually seemed better to be out in front in action rather than to suffer the boredom and inaction of comparative safety. At least on this day, it looks like there will be plenty of action for everyone. Attacks on the Turks are coming from all quarters, and they will surely crack this nut. But there remains a need for speed. Sunset will call an end to all battle, and they must take Beersheba before the darkness falls. General Chevelle has established Desert Mounted Corps HQ on the highest hill in the area, Kashemzana, positioned some five miles southeast of Beersheba and three miles south of Tel El Saba. Passing by at this time, one trooper from the 3rd Australian Light Horse, who has the wind up with all the shooting, takes comfort to see Chevelle and his entourage there. I recall about this time... Seeing just off the side of the road, General Sir Harry Chevelle with one or two of his staff at breakfast, and quite a calming effect on the mind it was to see this quiet, domestic, homely occasion. They had a trestle table, which in the circumstances was an unusual sight, and the scene looked most engaging, not to say inviting. 
The breakfast does not last long, as Chevelle and his officers are afforded a dress circle view of the show. And what a show it is. From the moment Chevelle and his most senior officers, including Major General Hodgson of the Australian Mounted Division, arrive atop the hill at mid-morning and bring their field glasses to bear, they are relieved to see Chetwood's soldiers of the 20th Corps already advancing. Having taken Hill 1070, they are now closing in on enemy trenches 500 yards ahead. It is with even more satisfaction that Chevelle sees the artillery batteries of the 20th Corps being dragged forward to their new positions just below the crest of the ridge and soon furiously firing on the defences that lie on the town's perimeter. Close by, General Chater is keeping his own glasses tightly trained on his men of the Anzac Mounted Brigade and is satisfied to see one particular group is making rapid headway. With one look, he can see that Brigadier General Granville Ryrie's men of the 2nd Brigade are already moving at all speed on Tel el Sakati. And a good thing too, as Ryrie himself had spotted a convoy of ten wagons leaving Beersheba and heading out on the Hebron Road, he has been quick to send his best officer, Lieutenant Colonel George MacArthur Onslow, to cut the road before they can escape. At a brisk trot for the moment, MacArthur Onslow is leading his men in artillery formation, which quickly proves wise as shells start to land among them. With a the signal to gallop, the extended arm going round three or four times, as in the action of a bowler, MacArthur Onslow does precisely that, and now two regiments of Australians are charging forth as the Turkish artillery crews in the high ground north of the Hebron Road try to get a bead on them. Amazingly, though the shells continue to fall, they are all short, long or wide, and they do not cause a single casualty among his men. Not necessarily the same can be said of the large camp of Bedouins the 7th Light Horse Regiment now charges through, as chooks, sheep, donkeys, camels and angry Bedouins scatter to be left in their angry wake. Men were shouting, women wailing, kids howling, shells bursting... Ryrie records of the situation in the Bedouin settlement when he passes through just a minute later. It is not until the 7th Regiment skirts Tel el Sakati to reach the Hebron Road that MacArthur Onslow calls a halt, and they are just in time to capture the convoy, pulled by eight horses and two mules on their way out of Beersheba. They have barely had a chance to look up, but when they do they are surprised to see a battery of Turks with machine guns and rifles equally surprised above them on the heights. The Australians have moved so fast that the Turks, who were supposed to be lying in wait, have to scramble for their weapons, giving the Australians just enough time to follow that most general of orders. Scatter, you bastards! Cutting the Hebron Road has been the Australians' first objective, and getting the convoy and that many prisoners is a real bonus. Taking the high ground right by the road will be more problematic, as the 7th Light Horse Regiment now come under heavy fire from the Turkish troops dug into the hills just to the north of Tel el Sakati, as well as the latest arrivals upon it. MacArthur Onslow orders his men to take cover in the wadis and gullies that mercifully abound. It's here that one of MacArthur Onslow's best men, Corporal Eddie Picton, leads three troopers in an action to capture 39 Turkish soldiers. The 7th will be able to keep the Hebron Road covered, but once reinforcements arrive, MacArthur Onslow will have to work out how to subdue the enemy in the hills above Tel el Sakati. At least those reinforcements are on the way, as Ion Idris's 5th Light Horse Regiment has just received its own orders. Advance on Sakati at once to support the 7th Light Horse Regiment. At last, cantering forth, the battlefield unfolded like a panorama, a four-mile wide open plain, the low hills fronting Beersheba, and running away to our right, the white Beersheba-Hebron road between frowning hills. For the most part, Beersheba is still buried in billowing clouds of dust that have steadfastly refused to obey orders to stand down though from the base of those clouds, the Australians can at least see motor lorries with massed troops on the back racing forth to outlying fortifications, clearly including Tel el Sakati. On their own side, Idris notes that, as far as the eye could see, 
were our own troops pouring from the hills onto the plain until they were moving regiment after regiment, brigade after brigade, in dust cloud after dust cloud, all moving steadily forwards. Again, Idris is thrilled, as he is sure all of them are, with the terrible intoxication of war when the movement is rapid. Yes, he is scared too, most particularly when the first shells start landing among them, but that fear is countered by something that comes from deep within, something savage that arises in armed men galloping towards their quarry. And now they see ahead the 7th Light Horse Regiment hunkering down in their wadi, bullets splattering the dust up merrily all up around and bringing fire on Tel el Sakati. Idris and the 5th Light Horse Regiment are quick to join their fellows. Rifle and machine gun fire grew into a steady roar. The air was one continuous whistling hissing, as if thick with vicious serpents. The ground spurted dust and flying pebbles and splintered bullets. Amid the shattering cacophony of chattering guns and endless explosions, more than a few of the thirsty Australians can't help but think of water. Beersheba has plenty. They now have next to none. Come to think of it, the Bible's famous Psalm 22 was probably written in these very parts. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. And the British infantry are in exactly the same position. We were suffering very badly, one of the soldiers will recount. Most of us had swollen tongues and lips and were hardly able to speak, but the company humorist at Cockney was able to mutter, Don't it make you mad to think of the times you left the bath tap running? Sparingly, they sip on their canteens while their horses whinny plaintively. The morning rolled on, bringing its heat, its hot rifle bolts, its thirst. Longingly, we thought of the cool wells at Beersheba. And by Jove, I experienced a choking feeling of the senses on remembering that we must take these wells, Idris notes. Amid all the firing, the small advances made, when they secure a small high point, Idris is able to get a bow peep to the south and sees something that thrills him. It is the first light horse brigade of Brigadier General Fighting Charlie Cox, now charging across the plain to attack Tel El Saba from the south in support of the awesome Aucklanders, followed by the artillery. The Somerset Battery came galloping with the sun shining upon their spinning wheels. They wheeled in splendid order, and almost instantly the guns were flaming through the clouds of dust, actually within close rifle range of the Turkish redoubts. The battlefield is ablaze, Beersheba beckons, and all the Australians now are in the fire. In the makeshift hospital casualty clearing station at El Imara, a large tent with a red cross upon it, Alaric Boer is fighting for life. The blood from his body is diluted by the sweat of the doctors joining him in the fray. So young, so much promise, so much life left to live. There is a pulse still, but it is weakening. The military medical men work faster now, doing everything they can to turn the spark of life still left in him into at least an ember that they can work with. Alas, alas, even as the sun goes higher, so does his mortal light fade. One last weak sigh is the last breath that Boer takes. And now all is still. He has, as his commanding officer will write to his parents, entered the great silence. What has caused this dreadful accident? It will never be certain. Whether his controls jammed or not, it is impossible to say, Major Haycock writes. But knowing his ability as a pilot, I cannot help believing something went wrong with the machine. But whether it was that or a slight error of judgment, we shall never know. He had flown the same machine all the time he had been out here, and he spoke warmly of her, both of the machine's rigging and engine. It is fate, and Alaric is a fatality. He will be buried when there is time and where there is peace, neither of which are present on this day. Beersheba beckons and must be taken. For Alaric and for all those who gambled their lives on this day and lost, we must win before darkness falls. The news is good for the 20th Corps. The ongoing artillery barrage appears to have reduced the barbed wire before the inner Turkish trenches to smithereens, 
while also destroying several redoubts. And now is the hour for General Philip Chetwood. Just after midday, he gives his orders, or rather one order, attack. With superb discipline, the three brigades of the 60th Division charge forth. I was in the front of the first assaulting wave as platoon runner, one British soldier, Private Blunt of the London Regiment, will recount. We were in a little wadi behind a ridge. It was necessary to get over the ridge and off the skyline as quickly as possible. Once over the ridge, it was a rush down the valley and a charge up the opposite ridge where the Turkish trenches were at the top. When we got to the Turkish trenches, we jumped straight in and shot or bayoneted or took prisoner all that were there. We advanced about 300 yards beyond the trenches where we worked like hell with our entrenching tools digging ourselves in. Just 30 minutes later, the last of the Turkish inner ring defences west of Beersheba also fall to the swarming infantry of Chetwood's 20th Corps, meaning that again the artillery batteries can be brought forward. Both defensive rings around Beersheba, on their southwestern side, are now in the possession of the 20th Corps, and in the process they have captured 419 prisoners, six enemy artillery pieces and many machine guns, at a cost to themselves of over a hundred men killed and a thousand more wounded. But these battles will be for naught unless Beersheba itself falls before the sun does. Atop Kashemzana, Major General Chevel, together with the commanding officers of the Anzac and Australian Mounted Divisions, is pleased with the news, though the fact that Tel El Saba is still holding out is a real worry, particularly for Major General Chater, whose responsibility it is. Napoleon once observed that an army marches on its stomach, but so too must army commanders eat while merely contemplating. For now, Chevel, Hodgson and Chater, with their senior staff officers, settle down for a quick lunch behind a long trestle table as, with regular pauses for using their field glasses and pens, they mark off the newly captured positions on the maps, together with the positions of their most advanced forces and where the reserves lie. The last does not take long, as there are now precious few reserves left, little more than the 4th Light Horse Brigade and the 5th Yeomanry. And yet there is a problem, first determined by the most senior gunnery officers of the two divisions. For just as they have their field glasses on the enemy batteries still firing furiously from the north bank of the Wadi Saba and Tel El Saba itself, they suddenly realise that so too do the Turkish and German officers by the enemy batteries have their field glasses on this hill, that the guns are swivelling towards them. And that can only mean... Take cover! A sudden whistling, accompanied by their own sudden intake of breath, presages the inevitable, and while everyone from Chevelle himself to the lowest-ranking orderlies dives for cover, high-velocity shells land all over the hill, scattering maps, field glasses and staff officers like chaff before the wind. It is a miracle no one is badly hurt, but as good an indication as any that Beersheba still has a lot of fight left in it. Oh, and that the enemy's artillery capabilities seem to be stronger than first thought. Eon Idris can see that Chevelle and company have another problem. Taubers were roaring all over the fortifications, the plain, the wadi and the ridges, their heavy bombs exploding in series of smashing roars. Through the glasses, we watched them bombing Chevelle's and Chater's headquarters four miles away, where the generals directed the battle. I wondered what their thoughts were for all the operations apart from the dust were spread plain before them. One thing that is plain enough, despite the dust, with the aid of the directed artillery, the New Zealand mounted rifles have now fought their way to within 400 yards of Tel El Saba. Which is one thing. It is quite another thing entirely to work out how to close that last gap, as the only path is not only swept by fire from the stronghold they are seeking to subdue, but also taking heavy punishment from the Turkish flanks. The hill ahead is steep and rugged and overlooks the bed of the wadi for some 400 yards to the east, where it makes a sharp bend. What now? And how? The first answer, at least, is for General Chater to order increased artillery fire from the Anzac Mounted Division on the Turkish defenders, 
while Brigadier General Fighting Charlie Cox dispatches the 3rd Australian Light Horse Regiment to attack Tel El Saba from the south, which is soon followed by the 1st Australian Light Horse Regiment with orders to attack on their left. A progress report is sent to the ever more worried General Allenby, who is now at the 20th Corps HQ at El Baka. Attack on Tel El Saba still held up. Will be attacked again with reinforcements. At two o'clock, the breakthrough comes at last. As the 2nd Australian Light Horse Regiment has fought its way to get close enough to bring heavy fire on Tel El Saba from its southern flanks, it means the fire coming from Tel El Saba, in turn, is both distracted and diminished, allowing the New Zealanders the slackening they need to round the bend, charge along the wadi floor and up the lower reaches of the hill on which Tel El Saba is perched. Hand-to-hand fighting through the rocks and ruins proceeds forthwith. Among the men of the 4th Australian Light Horse Brigade, positioned out beyond Ishwagan, frustration grows as the temperature rises. And they are not the only ones. Equally annoyed at being left in reserve are the soldiers of Brigadier General Percy Fitzgerald's 5th Mounted Brigade, positioned just a mile to the east. The battle of their lives is going on just over yonder ridge, and their only involvement so far is to be left on the bench in reserve dodging bombs dropped from planes on high. It is unconscionable. All around it is clear that a battle for the ages is underway. In the intense heat, the rolling thunder of the artillery shells and endless chatter of the machine guns coming from Tel El Saba and surrounds is an indication that the ferocity of the battle is only intensifying. And now look, the men of the 4th Brigade gasp at the sheer audacity of it. One of the brigades is ignoring the furious fire coming from Tel El Saba and galloping straight for its base. The guns were on them as they swept along, one trooper will recount, squadron by squadron. Behind them, riderless horses and horseless men ran around with seeming aimlessness. One wondered why those who lay still did not get up. Still, the red dust cloud rolls on, getting closer. The pattering of hooves spread far into the distance and came back, soft and continuous, like the sound of running water. It is a panorama of action that no eye can turn from. Gun teams passed at a laboured gallop between hill and hill. Little gun teams dragging toy guns and ridden by little men crouched with arms as they plied the flaying whips. Little ammunition limbers followed them nimbly, rolling and bounding with shells bursting in their path. In the midst of the throng, things are grim and getting grimmer. With machine guns and artillery, the Turks were depleting our ranks, one soldier will recount, so that less than half of us were still marching on at 500 yards range. But now one of the soldiers, a cockney, starts lustily singing the refrain from a song they'd all loved at their last concert party. I've never heard of anybody dying from kissing, have you? As one... They all take it up, bellowing it out. I've never heard of anybody dying from kissing, have you? They march on. Men were killed singing that song. They march on. And now, below the crests of the ridges, the Australians can see the guns being worked into action, even as the horses that drag the guns forward are themselves dragged back. From the muzzles of the guns, tongues of flame, half seen in the bright sunshine, shot out and back. Little men toiled beside the breech blocks. It is not, however, as if the Turks are visibly wilting, as they are clearly giving as much as they are taking, as both the attacking gun crews and troopers are now engulfed in artillery fire, with the resultant plumes of dust only moving forward sparingly, if at all, and making matters worse. Taubers are swooping in just a little higher than rifle range to drop bombs on them. This is extraordinary. The little men lay down among the rocks and bushes. Beneath them, the earth was being thrashed by a shrill hail of iron. All the hilltops were spouting earth and flame as the shells found their billets. Against all odds and overwhelming force, the brave Turkish defenders of Tel El Saba are indeed holding on, and all the attackers can do is slog their way forward by a series of desperate rushes on foot, 
that lose both time and men, time used by the Turks to shepherd their reserves into open trenches to the east. A trench captured is like a moat crossed, only for the attackers to see a sea of Turks waiting, and it is waiting that is their most potent weapon. All know that if night falls with Beersheba held, the British, Australians and Kiwis will have to retreat for water. It is not enough to dominate a skirmish. The whole game of chess must be won before the sun is gone. The 1st Light Horse Brigade has dismounted now, near Tel El Sabah, but they wait feverishly to ride once more. With enormous courage, the New Zealand Mounted Rifles Brigade are continuing to attack Tel El Sabah, despite the intense fire coming from its blazing bunkers on the hill. To get close enough to bring their own heavy fire, there is mercifully a meandering wadi which gives a good measure of cover and provides the added bonus of having several deep pools of water which allow the men and their horses to have their fill. Just 800 yards from the enemy, the horses of the 11th are retired, and the key tactic from now on is for the men of the three squadrons to run like scalded hares bitten by a snake, zigzagging and hoping not to get shot. It is time-consuming, a tripart attack that starts and finishes in startled fits, and it is deadly, as each man must hold his nerve and keep up his pace, fire and faith, whatever happens. Your comrades may fall, but the plan is working. Progress is steady, but as they all know, the time is coming when steady progress will no longer do. And now the commander of the most forward regiment, the Auckland Mounted Rifles, Lieutenant Colonel James McCarroll, tries something never before done in the history of warfare. After confirming that his signaller is in direct contact with the commander of the Somerset Battery, positioned slightly southeast of Tel El Sabah, at a range of 3,000 yards, he starts focusing on where the shells are landing and gives orders accordingly. Up 50. Behind him comes the sound of the signaller furiously working his flags. The directions are acknowledged as having been received by the Somerset Battery signaller. And sure enough, the next shells move forward roughly 50 yards, and yet they are still a little off target. Right 20. Another flag flurry in a hurry is the result, the dust lightly swirling and eddying at the signaller's feet as he does so, and now the shrapnel shells start exploding even closer to the designated Turkish machine gun nests atop Tel El Sabah, destroying one of them. That's the stuff to give them, Lieutenant Colonel McCarroll exults. No sooner has he said it than the signaller faithfully sends back those precise words to the Somerset Battery. Later, the commander of that battery will be asked what he made of said message. I could not find it in my book of signals, he replied graciously. But I would like to say that we understood it perfectly, don't you know? It was uh, rather novel for the service. It is to be preserved in the record of the battery as a memory of you fellows. On to the next target. Up 20, right 20. McCarroll, meanwhile, makes his way forward as far as he can, investigating the best route. To go up out of the wadi was difficult open ground, and the banks were about 20 feet high. It looked to me, by keeping close to the north bank, the men could get up in single file. Then the bend in the wadi gave us some cover. At 11am, the Inverness battery is also brought into play, and while they keep heavy fire upon Tel El Sabah, the Somerset battery is able to close up to within 1,300 yards, at which point its own fire starts to become even more accurate. There remains a lot of work to do, but little by little, the fire on the Turkish stronghold becomes ever stronger, and the New Zealanders are able to work closer still. To give them even more help, Major General Chater orders Brigadier General Cox to have his 1st Light Horse Brigade attack from the south to protect the left flank of the Kiwis. Their progress comes at a brutal cost, but at least they are eventually able to bring their Hotchkiss machine gun and rifle fire to bear on the enemy's trenches and machine gun positions on Tel El Sabah to set things up for a final rush. Just after noon, a breathless runner appears, come to Colonel Ismet from Essard Bay, 
commanding the 3rd Cavalry Division, begging to report that there are two to three cavalry divisions to east and south. The Turkish commander is shocked. From the east? In all their deliberations, it had never occurred to any of them that the enemy would be so mad as to advance across open ground where there was nothing to protect them from chattering machine guns and volleys of artillery, ground overseen by heavily fortified trenches and redoubts. And yet it had been because of that very lack of anticipation that they now have very few guns pointed in that general direction. Colonel Ismet sends more reserves and artillery crew to the east before sending a cable to General Kress von Kressenstein in Hulikat, north of Huj. On the south front, an infantry division has penetrated the front of the 67th Regiment. On the east, at least two cavalry divisions are pressing forward. In reserve are two companies which are insufficient to re-establish the southern front. What are your orders? Kress von Kressenstein trusts his own intelligence over the intelligence of the Turks on sight and expects reality to conform to it accordingly, replying thus, No, they are only two cavalry brigades. Colonel Ismet considers, with this many troops attacking them, if it might be wiser to get out now, so they can, you know, survive and keep their forces intact. But Kress von Kressenstein will not hear of it, telegraphing in reply, Beersheba will be held. The battle will be continued. They agree on the latter point. For his part, Kress von Kressenstein remains confident of the outcome. After all, the situation in the first battle of Gaza had been much worse than this, only for the British to suddenly abandon the whole fight. Regardless of where they attack, the trenches and guns of Beersheba will hold the British out till their water is out. His monocle glints with optimism and the full faith of having got on his side. The day will be theirs by nightfall. Fight on! Good news at last. At 1pm, Chevelle receives word from Chetwood. Though suffering over a thousand casualties, the 20th Corps have taken and held the two rings of defences on the southwest of the town, and the enemy has retired into the town. The first part of Allenby's plan is now complete, and just as had always been planned, the 20th paused their attack, their task accomplished. Even if they did keep going, it would be too slow, as the 20th are still two miles from Beersheba, the enemy would have time to blow up the wells. Can the Desert Mounted Corps execute the second part of the plan and finish the job by successfully attacking Beersheba from the east, with such a rush The wells will be preserved? Well, as Chevelle well knows, that cannot even be contemplated until one key obstacle is overcome. Tel El Saba must fall. Meanwhile, the 4th Light Horse Brigade are doing nothing. Feelings, one trooper will record, were tense, for there is nothing worse than inaction when alongside the foe. With the sun now blazing, the ground is radiating heat and the stones that poke their heads through the desert floor are hot to the touch. The sun beats down and they pass the pebbles as they take shelter in the shade of the horses above who whinny mournfully. Few are more frustrated than Guy Hayden. They have been here all day, did he mention, with little food left for themselves and their horses and just about no water in the blazing heat aware that a battle royale is going on without them. The hours have crawled by. They have a thirst that ten pebbles could not sate, a desire for action that is overwhelming, and all that will soon be left them will be a long night march back to Asluj in pursuit of mere survival. The only thing that lifts them up? Our brigade was in reserve, Hayden will recount, and we knew that if any hot job happened along, we would get it. Others are less confident, with one, Private Walter Keddy, also of the 12th Light Horse Regiment, recording that we began to talk among ourselves, saying Beersheba will be taken and us not doing anything. All they can do for the moment is wait and hope. Tel El Saba refuses to be broken. Yes, Chevelle could throw in the last of his reserves, but his finely honed instinct tells him to hold back for the moment. If there was one lesson more than another I had learned at Magdeba and Rafa, 
Chevelle will recount, it was patience and not to expect things to happen too quickly. At Beersheba, although progress was slow, there was never that deadly pause which is so disconcerting to a commander. Still, amid the endless roar of taubers overhead, the stuttering staccato of their own guns firing back at the planes, the regular explosion of bombs landing all around, General Chevelle can't help but alternate between looking through his field glasses at the battle all before him and looking down at his watch, even as he goes through the relevant chronology of this battle to date. Thirty-six hours. That's how long many of the horses of Desert Mounted Corps have been without water after they had run out at Asluj the night before. Twelve hours. That's how long a ride it will be to the next possibility of water. Twenty-four hours. How long before they can be certain of getting water. One hour and a bit. How much daylight is left before Beersheba enters darkness, at which point it would be impossible. The sun is due to set at ten to five. The Turks would be firing from protected positions onto their own unprotected flashes in the deep twilight, and it would be a turkey shoot, with the Turks as the Turks and the Australians as the Turkeys. Things are coming to a head, one way or another, and Chevelle is not the only one who thinks so. For now, Chevelle is unsurprised to receive an inquiry from General Allenby at Chetwood's 20th Corps HQ at El Bakr, asking if he believes the panting horses may be watered in Wadi Mala. Allenby is sceptical they will take Beersheba by nightfall. Chevelle replies via telegram. Water situation is not hopeful, and if Commander-in-Chief approves, it is proposed to send back all troops which have not watered. If Beersheba is not in our possession by nightfall, Watching through his glasses from atop a hill near the wadi where the 5th Australian Light Horse Regiment is stalled, Ion Idris leans forward. What he can see now is worrying. Planes roaring overhead, roaring German machine guns from atop the redoubt, firing right on the Kiwis from well-entrenched positions as they keep chattering all the same. How can the Kiwis possibly make headway against that? For five full hours they have attacked and been held off. Tel El Saba stands, and if Tel El Saba doesn't fall, there is no way that Beersheba can fall. What must it be like in the middle of that? The bullets whiz and bite, the shrapnel shrieks and slices. They say the eye of the hurricane is the calmest part. Well, that does not apply to this bloody battle. When will it end? Now. For the men of the New Zealand Mounted Rifles rush that bloody enemy outpost that has been tormenting them just 400 yards to the east of Tel El Saba. With a yell louder than any shell, the NZs storm its ramparts with shocking speed and race for the summit. Sixty Turks throw up their arms in surrender. The Auckland Mounted Rifles grab the Turks' four machine guns intact and turn them on Tel El Saba in an instant. Onwards, the machine gun pauses only to let the New Zealanders race en masse to Tel El Saba. The Turks atop it must make their own calculation quickly. They can see the wave of death is about to break over them. The choice, sacrifice their lives or fall back to Beersheba and fight anew. The latter course seems more sensible, but do they still have any choice? For now, with one last frantic rush under the cover of fire from the Australians of the 1st Brigade, the Auckland Mounted Rifles Regiment make their move, racing across the remaining ground so quickly that the rocky hill seems to rise before them, their speed and pluck combines with luck to let them capture the last yards in a flowing motion that is literally irresistible. In moments, the NZs are atop the plateau to capture 130 stunned Turkish troops who are now instantly transformed into prisoners with raised hands. Tel El Saba is ours. It's ours. Beersheba awaits. Another Turkish machine gun is captured as well and quickly turned to fire on those soldiers fleeing back to Beersheba. Sporting? Well, this is a war, not a game. Guns don't surrender, they kill people, and the Turks have the indignity of knowing that the rattle of fire bursting behind them is theirs. 
Through his field glasses, a delighted Chevelle can see more and more NZs, and the Australians of the Anzac Mounted Division now swarming all over the summit, and every Turk has his hands in the air. Tel El Sabah is theirs. It has just gone 3pm, and the blazing sun of the middle hours of the day is well gone. It is time. Gather the commanders. At Beersheba, the fall of Tel El Saba is a bitter blow, and yet still there is no wild alarm. It is not as if there will be any further attack from the east. We did not believe, one German officer said, that the charge would be pushed home. That seemed an impossible intention. But I have heard a great deal of the fighting qualities of the Australian soldiers. They are not soldiers at all. They are madmen. You summoned us, General Chevelle? Yes, he has, to tell them what they already know. A choice is to be made between the two commanding officers of the only forces he has kept in reserve, the 4th Brigade of the Australian Light Horse and the 5th Yeomanry Brigade. Brigadier General William Grant or Percy Fitzgerald must win or lose the day from here. We are going to have to throw one of your brigades into the fray to take Bathsheba from the east. Even as Chevelle continues to speak, Grant's mind starts to race. Maybe his men of the 4th Brigade should do exactly that. Race. Charge. Yes, a full cavalry charge. Instead of the horses delivering them to the battle and fighting their way forward from there, why not just keep going, straight at the Turks? It would be a shock tactic a tactic from the 10th century unleashed on the 20th. But if it worked, why, it would give them the best chance of getting into the town so fast the Turks would not have time to blow up the wells, as they surely would with a conventional fight. By the time the Australians arrived on foot, those wells would be exploding into uselessness. The most important factor of all is the fading light. It is going to take at least 30 minutes to get the men gathered and formed up in three waves to move. By that time, there will be no time at all to attack in the traditional manner. The only option left is the extraordinary. Grant is certain it is the best course of action. A full cavalry charge straight across open ground, damn the guns, leap the trenches, neck or nothing. And so it is Brigadier General Grant now speaks freely. The 4th Brigade, he says, can take it if it is left to me to have a free hand. How do you propose to do it? Chevelle asks. Let us act as cavalry and not mounted infantry. And Grant outlines his reasoning, trying to remain calm and sell the incredible. Chevelle muses as Grant's words race. It would be bold, fast, and it would be unexpected, to say the least. In the face of the oncoming charge, the Turks would expect the Australians to dismount a thousand yards away and work their way forward, just as is their usual practice, but not this time. It might just work. But can any cavalry charge work facing artillery, machine guns and rifles with planes dropping bombs overhead? A scenario not faced before by the light horse in this war. Opinions, gentlemen? Chevelle will be getting no argument from Hodgson, who has been a strong advocate for these kind of charges in this kind of country. Grant pointedly follows up with the observation that his brigade is positioned nearby and could be assembled within the hour. Brigadier General Fitzgerald, in the rather pompous manner that has always grated on Chevelle since he first met him 20 years earlier, demurs. If anyone is going to do this, it should be us. We are assembled much closer to this HQ and can get going much more quickly. Plus, as a British unit, we have actual swords which are going to be of much use when we get to grips with the Turks than mere bayonets. And for God's sake, General, we are trained cavalry. These men know how to cut, thrust and parry. Grant cannot bear it. But General... My men have both rifles and bayonets, and as General Hodgson has pointed out, bayonets held above our heads, while not as good as swords, can still do the trick. We are the obvious choice for this, and we can get the job done. 
And though the 5th Yeomanry are positioned closer to this HQ, my brigade is positioned closer to Beersheba and can be in position more quickly. Both brigadiers make excellent cases, the tension rising a little with their reasoning. Chevelle, as impassive and cool as ever, almost remote, weighs each word. On such decisions do men live and die. Entire family trees suddenly have whole branches lopped off. The time is ticking away, but so important is the decision. Chevelle wants one last look before making it and asks for the precious aerial photographs to be brought to him once more while Grant and Fitzgerald leave him momentarily to ponder. Gazing ever more closely at the photographs with just Hodgson by his side, Chevelle is more convinced that this is the only way. While the defences around most of the town are obvious, from barbed wire entanglements to deep pits impossible for a horse to get through or over, the approach from the southeast does appear to be relatively clear. It is not to say that there aren't defences that are not obvious from the air, but they will have to take that chance. A decision must be made, and Chevelle is the man to make it. This has to be done and it has to be done now. The fact that he does not like Fitzgerald and never has since the days he commanded the local military force in Victoria is neither here nor there. Much. He follows his instinct, guided by military logic. Mostly. Putting his finger at the spot on the aerial photograph, which he thinks is viable, Chevelle gives the order to Hodgson to be passed on. Put Grant straight at it, Chevelle says. Hodgson, delighted, finally a major charge, tarries now and immediately leaves the tent to give Chevelle's decision to Grant and Fitzgerald. Go right in, Hodgson tells Grant, and take the town before dark. Fitzgerald blanches, but where did he go? Grant is already on the move, and only moments later there is the sound of thundering hooves receding in the distance as the brigadier, accompanied by his senior officers, rushes back to his own HQ. If I did ever favour the light horse, Chevelle will later acknowledge, it was at Beersheba when, in giving the lead to Grant, I was perhaps influenced by a desire to give a chance to the 4th and 12th regiments, which up to then had seen very little serious fighting. The Australian has picked the Australians to charge, and there is nothing the British can do about it. It is an extraordinary outcome and thrilling, though as Charles Bean will comment, Australians had never ridden any race like this. With the fall of Tel El Sabah, Colonel Ismet has seen enough. Bathsheba may fall. Whatever General Kress von Kressenstein's orders of over an hour ago, Ismet has no interest in spending the rest of the war as a prisoner of the British Empire, or worse, killed. Thus, he gathers his two most senior officers and with a strongly armed escort of 20 infantrymen, prepares to leave on foot to the north, heading for the HQ of the 143rd Regiment, which he knows to be six miles away. Before departure, he orders that the remaining reserves be rushed forth to defend the eastern perimeter. His final order is that all the wells in Bathsheba, which have been wired with dynamite and are connected to one central control panel, be blown up if the enemy breaches the perimeter. As fate has it, the German engineer assigned to do the wiring has been away on leave in Jerusalem, but his offsiders are instructed to finish the job immediately. Remaining troops must equally ensure before evacuating that all the trip wires with booby traps are activated. We must deny the British any succour whatsoever from taking over the town. With things now in train, Chevelle again takes up his field glasses only to suddenly receive another cable bearing an official order from Allenby. The chief orders you to capture Beersheba today in order to secure water and take prisoners. Well, yes. What on earth does Allenby think they are doing? It seems that the chief has misunderstood the telegram from Chevelle advising on what will happen water-wise if Beersheba does not fall. By return cable... General Allenby is assured things are already well in hand and his troops are now preparing to take Bathsheba by cavalry charge. What will the chief make of that? Chevelle will carefully avoid receiving telegrams for the next while. 
If they don't capture the town soon, one of the more wizened troopers says mournfully to the youngest among them, Harry Wickham, all of 16 years old, we're well and truly stuffed. It would seem so. In fact, Harry Bell, for that is his real name, has come a long way from Walpiup, from joining up at Mildura just six months ago, training at the Seymour camp and arriving here in the Sinai, as one of the re just six weeks ago. Much of it had been exciting and new. A lot of it had been hideously hot and uncomfortable, but nothing has been quite as terrifying as this. Around him, other troopers are desperate to get into the action. Harry is not so sure. Yes, it has been a very slow day, but still everything is happening so fast. And now what? A rider, a sergeant with a message from HQ, is trotting their way. All pack horses, excepting Hotchkiss rifle packs, the sergeant calls out with that habitual volume that helps make up for lack of serious rank, fall out and remain behind. What? What is going on? We're going to charge Beersheba, mate. Bloody hell! And just as the word quickly spreads among the troopers, it's on and we're going to charge Cobber, so too does it seem that the whalers sense that there is action afoot as snorting and whinnying breaks out across the lines. Saddles are thrown on, straps are tightened. Troopers swing up and on. Some of these horses have not had water for as long as 30 hours and are all in. But the best reckoning is they likely have one last charge left in them, most particularly if there is water at the other end of it. And there is. For his part, Lieutenant Guy Hayden is beyond thrilled with the order that comes through to his own waddy. After a hot, frustrating day spent impotently listening to the sounds of battle in the distance, some troopers of the 12th Regiment had more or less given up, one saying, it's getting too late now to do anything. But first comes a barked command, stand by your horses, and now the glorious specifics. The 12th and 4th Light Horse Regiments will charge Beersheba on horseback. The town is to be taken at all costs. We are going to attack. Chapter 12. Straight at them. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honour the charge they made. Alfred Lord Tennyson, The Charge of the Light Brigade. The light horsemen knew well that the fate of the battle, and probably the campaign, depended on this charge at Beersheba. They also realised that for the first time Australian cavalry were actually to charge. For this time the light horse were to act purely as cavalry, although with only their bayonets as shock weapons. Charles Bean, Anzac to Amiens. It was a great day. Thirty years' life was crammed into it. Trooper C.S. Roxburgh, 12th Australian Light Horse Regiment. 31st of October 1917, four miles east of Beersheba. Sound trumpets, let our bloody colours wave. The word spreads. A full cavalry charge. No dismounting half a mile out and fighting our way forward in short rushes. We charge to the trenches and then dismount and get into them. Yet more shouts break out across the line, with the squadron leaders of the 4th and 12th Regiments barking orders. A squadron, mount! B squadron, mount! All pack horses to the rear. Remainder, prepare for action. See that all equipment is secured tightly to your saddles. C squadron, mount! And in a moment, the regiments are now mounted squadrons, their lines extended, all at the ready, and the readiness is all. Stand to! Then came the order with nerves all highly strung. Once again into the saddle our weary legs we slung. Most of the troopers are delighted. Not only is it action, which is always welcome, but it is action which, if successful, will get them what they prize most of all right now, water. The alternative would be a slow and dogged march back through the whole night ahead to get to the water at Asluj. Among some... There is exultation. In the 12th Light Horse, Trooper Colin Bull, a bookmaker's clerk from Sydney, offers a bet to a corporal that I will beat you in the gallop for Beersheba. Beside him, one of the most popular troopers in the 12th Light Horse, Ernie Craggs, 
is equally exuberant, laughing and joking as usual and full of spirit, just as he always is, but this time barely able to contain himself for the joy of being about to make a charge. Walking with purpose, Brigadier General Grant now takes the commanding officers of the 4th and 12th Regiments, Lieutenant Colonel Boucher and Lieutenant Colonel Donald Cameron, together with their two ICs, and walks them up to the crest of the ridge so they can all get a good look at both their destination and the ground they must cover to get to it. There it is, gentlemen. For a few seconds, no one speaks as they take it all in the distant ancient town now glowing in the light of the late afternoon. It is just half an hour before dusk, and the town lies on the other side of what is first a long and gentle slope, followed by another rise, all of it about three and a half miles away, the minaret of the town's mosque providing a central aiming point. Those of vast military experience like Grant, Boucher and Cameron recognise just how useful it will be that whatever defenders they meet will be silhouetted against that light, while we Australians will be coming from a much darker backdrop of our billowing dust. As pleasing to the eye as that golden shimmer is, however, their eyes are soon drawn to the ground that lies between this ridge and the outskirts of the town, looking for obstacles, wire, horse pits, waddies. Boucher, a straight-speaking grazier from Victoria's Murray Valley, asks three quick questions of Brigadier Grant. Has there been any close reconnaissance of just where the enemy is situated? No. Is anything known of the approaches? Very little. Are there any barbed wire entanglements in front of the Turks? Not positive, but we don't think so. And there is no time to find out anything further, men. There is only one course of action open to us. We charge and let the devil take the hindmost. Taking the foremost will be Lieutenant Colonel Donald Cameron, commanding officer of the 12th Australian Light Horse Regiment. Cameron is usually a smiling nugget of a man. Right now, however, his face is as hard and taut as a diamond, gleaming with sheer intensity of purpose. Now, see there? The track between Ishwewin and Beersheba... W track, which descends from the ridge line right to the town, will serve as a useful axis for both of your regiments. The 12th will keep to the left of it, the 4th to its right. And now look more closely through your field glasses. You will note that such trenches as we can see of the Turks, about half a mile out from the town, seem to lie in the way of the 4th regiment, while the 12th should have a clearer go of it. Speaking quickly, because there is so little time, Grant gives tight orders. Once formed up, we will slowly ride our horses to the top of the ridge, and the first wave will keep going at that walking pace until all three lines are over. Now, be aware, as soon as we are visible, en masse, on their side of the crest, we will likely come under artillery fire. The first of the targeted machine gun fire will get to us at 2,000 yards, and the rifle fire at 1,000 yards, unless there are hidden nests out in front of what we can see. The scouts out front should be able to help us spot them, if that is the case. And bear in mind, once they smell it, your horses will be so keen to get to the water in the wells of Beersheba, they will gallop faster than ever. It is inevitable that we are going to suffer casualties, and possibly even severe casualties, but we cannot alter our course. The key is going to be sustainable speed to cover the ground as quickly as possible while making sure that the horses can cover the final burst at full gallop to maximise their chances of not being hit and getting there in sufficient numbers that they can overwhelm Johnny Turk. So it doesn't matter how many men we lose. The important thing is to keep going because they can't possibly get all of us. And the more resolute we are, the more likely it is that the defenders will break and run. One last thing. It is not realistic to think our blokes will be able to accurately fire their rifles while at full gallop. This will be hand-to-hand -hand stuff in the trenches. So have them sling their rifles around their backs while holding their bayonets up. Once they arrive, they can jump off and get stuck in. Grant now clarifies the formation he wants. The first two lines are to be A Squadron followed by B Squadron, charging in line formation, 
spread out in a single line abreast. The third line, C Squadron, are to be in column formation, with troops lined behind each other, with the usual distance of between 300 and 500 yards between following lines. Each regiment must have a scout out front by 50 yards. The meeting is quickly over, but Shakespeare is in the wind. Hark, the shrill trumpet sounds, to horse away, my soul's in arms and eager for the fray. While the squadron leaders now race off to brief and bring forward their men, Grant and his senior officers work out in which wadi to assemble them and the exact lines each regiment will take. Meantime, at Desert Mounted Corps HQ atop Kashim Zana, Chevelle's staff advises the Knotts Battery, which is attached to the Australian Mounted Division, what is afoot and what will be required of them to support the charge. In response, the battery of four horse-drawn 13-pounder guns moves as far forward as it can, right behind where the 12th and 4th regiments are forming up and keep observation on Turkish defences, ready to bring fire on all artillery batteries and machine gun nests that are bringing fire on them. With the specifics of Grant's orders barked on down the line, the cry goes up from the officers of both regiments. Form squadron, column from line. Imagine a line of hills broken by gullies in which we were hiding a corporal of the 4th Light Horse will write to his sister explaining the situation, and then a grassy flat of about two miles to a town. Well, we filed down out of the gullies and formed a long thin line with about four yards between horsemen. All up, it takes nearly 20 minutes for all squadrons of both regiments to be in position on the lee side of the crest, and it is 4.25pm before all 800 troopers are astride their mounts, turning their attention to their commanding officers out the front. In this last minute, there is just time for a few last-minute orders. The commanding officer of the 4th Regiment's A Squadron, Major James Lawson, a portly Victorian hotelier before the war, tells his two scouts, none other than Tom O'Leary and Alfred Healy, just what to do. It can be easily summed up. Go like the clappers. O'Leary up front, Healy just behind. Signal whatever you can, when you can. You two will set the pace, and our lead elements will be 70 yards behind you. It is unspoken, but all three know that like a dog getting from one side of the minefield to another without being blown up, the scouts and their path, as long as they survive, will make clear what is clear of waddies, unseen culverts, hidden machine gun nests and horse pits. They are not canaries in a coal mine. That is a bloody easy job. They are two men, just two, who are going to charge the Turks. If you were a betting man and asked to gamble who among us 800 is most likely to be dead 10 minutes from now, most of the money would go down on these two. But both accept the task cheerfully enough. Death or glory? No, more likely both. Gotcha, sir. Damn the odds. Tom O'Leary, whose passion for drinking and fighting is only narrowly outdone by his passion for gambling, is happy to back himself. His penny to your pound says he can outrace death, even if hung over. This day, O'Leary, fined and admonished only days ago for being absent at parade while drunk, will be very present indeed and lead right at the pointy end of the spear. Godspeed, Tom. To the rear... The 11th Light Horse Regiment is also forming up, followed by the troopers from the far from gruntled 5th Mounted Brigade and their commander, Brigadier General Percy Fitzgerald, together with the 5th and 7th Mechanised Battalions, who will be hauling the artillery forward, the pack horses carrying the Hotchkisses and rounds of 303 ammunition and the stretcher bearer units bringing up the rear. Among those grim angels, Tibby Cotter is doing some hard thinking. He has been in battle against England at Lords, against the Turks at Gallipoli, and now he is merely carrying a stretcher for this, the biggest battle of the year, or perhaps on guard duty with a truck. We are about to make a cavalry charge on the Turks, steaming in from the Paddington End, and I am not going to be part of it. 
It is not right. It is against nature. Why not make a swap, get one of the blokes looking a bit nervous to take his turn at stretcher bearing, while I take part in the charge? They can court-martial me later. I'm going to fight today. It not only makes sense to Cotter, but also to the bloke he approaches to make the swap, and in short order, Tibby takes his place astride a snorting steed right in the heart of the 4th Brigade, 12th Regiment, with his mate Bluey, and right beside two other close mates, Troopers Jack Beasley and Rex Colley. We're not quite the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but we'll do. We ride together, we guard each other's flanks and back. Any bastard that tries to get us gets it back. A charge, a real charge. Over to Tibby's far right, among the hard men of the 4th Light Horse Regiment, a boy stirs restlessly. For Trooper Harry Wickham, this is a long way from Mildura. Yes, it is what he has signed up for, and yes, it was always going to be dangerous. But still, he has the wind up more than a little. Just four years ago, he was at Walpiup Public Primary School, trying to memorise his times table. Seven-eighths of fifty-six... And now here he is, about to charge straight at Turkish guns. Wickham's horse picks up on his nervousness, whinnies and stamps her feet. Harry, as he has ever done, leans down and strokes her to calm her. Whatever the task, whatever the risks, it must be done. They have to get in formation. Around and about him, troopers are steadying their own horses, shaking hands, sneaking quick glances at small photos in lockets and wallets of family and sweethearts. The mood is grim, but purposeful. This is what they want, to have at the Turks straight on. No more feints, moves, insane retreats, straight at them. From their west, north and south comes the chattering of machine guns and the endless shattering roar of the shells. Up front, O'Leary trots forward to just beneath the crest of the slope, while the forward elements of both regiments now look to Brigadier General Grant, positioned high on the slope himself between the two regiments. To Grant's right, Lieutenant Colonel Boucher is at the head of the 4th Light Horse Regiment, while to his left, Lieutenant Colonel Cameron is equally to the four of the men of the 12th Light Horse Regiment. Grant pauses. Now is the moment.